everybody to the Crowd Create Crypto and Blockchain Global Conference. Everyone is talking about crypto. Now you can hear about it from the top thought leaders in the industry. The goal of these events are to support one another through what we call the wisdom of crowds. Crowd Create runs, more, runs one of the largest networks in the crypto industry. We carefully curated a well-rounded panel of some of the most successful investors, founders, and thought leaders across the industry from DeFi project developers and celebrity launched NFTs to early VC investors and founders bringing new use cases to blockchain. It'll be a jam packed all day event and we don't want you to miss a single event. Insight. We encourage everyone to post in the Zoom chat as well as join the conversation on Twitter using hashtag CrowdCreate. So let's kick it off, Evan. All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining from all parts of the world today. We're really, really excited to have Mark Yusko. Mark Yusko is going to be opening our keynote to our uh, event today. So Mark, just to kick things off, I know everybody knows who you are. <laughs> but that's Not sure great. about that, but uh, maybe a few, <laughs> maybe a few. Just a quick intro from you and uh, yeah, let's dive into those topics. I know you wrote some ideas to us, but excited to unpack those together. Yeah, here. look, uh, okay. So I am, it's, it's Mark Yusko. I am the founder, CEO and CIO of Morgan Creek Capital Management. Founded that 17 years ago. I came out of the endowment space. I ran the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hills Endowment and then formed Morgan Creek to bring the endowment model of investing to, to others. And our big byline is, is two things. One, alternative thinking about investments. Uh, there's this whole idea that there are alternative investments. There's no such thing. There are stocks, there are bonds, there are currencies, and there are commodities. That's it. Everything else is a derivative of that. Uh, but you want to integrate alternative strategies, alternative ways of thinking about investing into a portfolio. And the second is that innovation is an asset class. And those who overweight innovation are the most successful investors, bar none. And it's my pinned tweet on Twitter, at Mark Yusko, if you care. Uh, you know, the greatest wealth is created by investing in something that you believe in before others even understand. And, uh, you know, God rest his soul, David Swenson passed away, uh, no relation, uh, a couple weeks ago. And, you know, he was the father of the endowment model and, and a big person who believed in this innovation as an asset class. Over 22% of his portfolio was in venture capital. And so it's something that we've always done. Overweighted venture, overweighted new ideas, overweighted innovation as an asset class. Because uh, ultimately, without innovation, you don't have stocks, bonds, currencies, or commodities to invest in. And uh, that's how I got so excited about this space. Uh, four years ago, launched Morgan Creek Digital, operating subsidiary of Morgan Creek Capital, and have launched two venture funds. Uh, we're just starting our third fund, uh, just about to close, do first close on that at the end of this month. Uh, and that's to back early stage projects in the ecosystem around blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. And then we also invest about 30% of those funds in cryptocurrencies themselves into the tokens themselves. We also have a risk managed Bitcoin fund, fund designed to truncate the volatility. One of the things that keeps people out of these assets is too much vol. We came up with a strategy to truncate some of that downside vol because upside vol you'll want. In fact, I have a shirt over on, on the credenza there. It says embrace volatility. Volatility is your friend in investing. You get paid for taking intelligent risk and you get paid in the form of volatility. You want high volatility. You just want, don't want downside volatility. And I use this example all the time. So Bitcoin uh, has the exact same volatility as Amazon. Okay, over 21 years, Amazon.com has had 80, 80% volatility, same number as Bitcoin. Bitcoin has compounded 223% per year for a decade. And uh, Amazon has done about half of that over their 21 years. And what's crazy about it is Amazon has a double digit drawdown every single year, including this year. The average drawdown is 31%, five times more than 50%, twice more than 90%. How many people bought Amazon at, on the IPO 21 years ago and hold it today? There are four, Jeff, his mom, his dad, and now his ex-wife. And when was the right time to sell Amazon? That would be never. And the same is true of, of a lot of these projects, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, some of the DeFi stuff we'll talk about. Uh, you want to own these assets literally forever. 
and uh, I just posted a clip from, I was on uh, CNBC in 2019. And I think Bitcoin had crashed, quote unquote, from like 10,000 to 8,000 or something that, that morning. And I came on there like, oh, what should we do? Like, buy it. Like, what do you mean buy it? Like, buy it today, buy it tomorrow, buy it next week, buy it the week after. And uh, you should accumulate ownership of these networks. The most important thing for investors today is to own the networks because the networks grow not linearly, but parabolically, exponentially. And the average person is just sucky, it's a technical term, at math, right? If I say what's two times two, everybody on the call, four, no problem. If I say what's 17 times 23, I'll wait. Average person can't do that, right? In their head, they need a calculator. So if I say, how are you at nonlinear logarithmic regression? Not good. But that's the way networks grow, according to Metcalf's law. And I use the example just to simpl simplify it. If I take 20 linear steps across the office, I get the other side. If I take 20 exponential steps, I go around the world twice. So I get to pass some of the people on the phone from Singapore and Sweden and, and all the rest. So um, that's a lot for the intro, but we can start there and go wherever you want. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for those insights. And yeah, I didn't think of it that way, but yeah, you cross a lot of those people on this call, <laughs> but Give yeah, my high five invest as I go by. <laughs> but investing into the networks and absolutely, uh, I agree with you hundred um, percent. And also kind of the big uh, point to make during this keynote is, you know, why, and how is this disrupting finance? Why is decentralized finance like disrupting everything? And I know you've mentioned on previous uh, interviews that you've had, yeah. but like, how is Wall Street looking at this? Like, what is what is that big picture with fear, that you're with seeing? Fear, with gigantic, <laughs> huge eyes uh, and fear. Look, blockchain technology is going to do to finance the same thing that the internet did to uh, media and information and commerce. And this is an innovation in technology. It's an evolution of technology that's been going on for decades. This is not new, this is not you know, scary or, or something that you know, came out of the blue. This is a simple evolution of an operating system. So computing started back in the 50s, we had these things called you know, government computers and uh, suddenly the mainframe computer was created in 1954. You had a chance if you invested in some crazy companies like IBM or DEC or my favorite Wang and uh, you could invest in those companies and make a ton of money. And people could finally get a computer. And then 14 years later, you had an innovation called the microchip. And suddenly you could have smaller computers. It wouldn't take this whole building. It could be just the size of this, this room. And that was pretty good. And Sun and uh, a few others came along and started building mini computers. And then 14 years later, Interestingly enough, it's always 14 years. Why is that? I think it has to do with the creative class and all innovation really comes from young people because uh, they don't know what they don't know. And so they try new things. And uh, I grew up in Seattle. So a bunch of my friends don't work anymore. They were smart enough to go to work for that little company called Microsoft. If you ever seen the original picture of the Microsoft 11, you'd cut me some slack because they were a little rough. Now we were all rough looking in the 70s, but they were rougher than others. Google that tonight. Look up the original Microsoft 11. They're all super rich and they're all very interesting people, but, but I didn't go work there. Now, Steve Ballmer's mom famously quipped, honey, why would you work there? No one's ever gonna want a computer in their house. He has 18 billion reasons he was right, mom was wrong. So 14 years later, the internet. And at the beginning I was saying, no, what is crypto? I was kind of doing the Bryant Gumbel from uh, the Today Show in 1996. What is internet? What is that little at symbol? And Paul Krugman famously quipped, it'll never be more important than the fax machine. Maybe it's more important than the fax machine, maybe. And so 14 years later, we had uh, the mobile net and the mobile net was big, right? The internet was big and it basically totally transformed commerce. And I use a simple example of, of email, right? In the old days, I wanted to write a letter to my girlfriend. I wrote a letter, put a stamp on it, I sent it out, took three days to get there. She thought about it, wrote back, put a letter in them. Seven days later, I get an answer. 
I joke, my wife can't wait seven seconds to get a response to a text. Seven days? Are you kidding me? No way. Now, what if I want to send multiple letters to multiple girlfriends? Well, I had to find a Xerox machine, a bunch of dimes, and make copies of the letter and find a bunch of stamps and put them in. Okay, it's hard. But what if I want to say something different to each girl? Well, then I had to cut and paste and make different letters and send them out. You know, email came along. I could do that instantaneously with the push of a button to millions of people. Um, now, if you think about what happened over the course of the next 14 year cycle between the internet and the mobile net, I remember being back in Seattle, Craig McCaw's house uh, for a, a venture capital event. And I asked his family office guy, do you think the mobile net is going to be as big as the internet? He's like, Mark, are you kidding me? Ask me if they want a computer. Like, no, nah, not really. Ask people if I want a cell phone. They're like, I already have two. I don't need another one. All right. So yeah, the mobile net is bigger. There are 10 billion of these supercomputers. They call it a phone. Why? We don't use it to talk, but it's, it's a computer. This is 100 times more powerful than the first computer I bought from Michael Dell's dorm room, which I should have saved as a collector's item, but I actually bought it from his dorm room at University of Texas. Wow. And yeah, called PCs Limited. That would and, have been an awesome NFT by now. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, that's a good point. I should, I should have done that. But I, I wonder if I could go back and find the original receipt. That's a good point. Um, so what's amazing about that is this totally disrupted all of information exchange, all of media, all of commerce. And Amazon is a perfect example, right? Amazon was a joke. I remember cover story, 2005, Business Week. Jeff, go mine the store because he was starting this little thing called AWS and people didn't get it. He believed in something before others understood and it's become worth many, many billions of dollars. First trillion dollar company. Now, what's interesting is Bitcoin got to a trillion dollars faster than Jeff. Took Jeff 20 years, took Bitcoin only 10. So that's pretty cool. But the point is that 1996 to 2010 was big because we started to go at the knee of the curve. Again, linear math, is different than exponential math. If you think about an exponential curve, x, y axis, the parabola on the left hand northwest quadrant, the area under the curve to the left is web 1.0. Okay, the area under that curve parallel to the x axis, it's kind of big, but not really that big. But that's Cisco and Intel and Microsoft It's pretty real wealth. Then you get to the knee of the curve, that's web 2.0. And that is Alibaba and Amazon and Netflix. More wealth, first trillion dollar companies. Now we're going to the area under the curve where we go parabolic to the y axis. That's Web 3.0. Big, first multi trillion dollar companies, first trillionaire are going to come from Web 3, from the internet of value or the trust net, as I call it. So 2010 was the mobile net, 2024, still three years from now, is the trust net. That is the internet of value and money over internet protocol, value over internet protocol is the biggest innovation I'll see in my lifetime. I plan to be here a long time, but it is the biggest innovation. And this right now, what we are living in is the greatest wealth creation opportunity bar none of this century. It is going to create so much opportunity and so much wealth and so much value by allowing us to take every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every business, every collectible car, every bottle of wine, every everything, 750 trillion, okay, trillion. Somebody, one of you guys just shudder a little bit when I use the T word, a trillion, one trillion. We'd have to sit here together for 31,710 years, which I promise would be most unpleasant and spend a dollar every second for 31,000 years, that's 1 trillion. I'm talking 750 of those babies. All of it is going to be digitized, tokenized, trade 24 seven, fractional ownership, and the exponential growth that will come from that boggles the mind. So and Mark, this person has no exposure. That's, that's amazing. And just to, just to put everyone into their context, that's a massive number. And you almost have to think about where we're going, but also what are we, what are we leaving behind? Like, what are those what are those systems and legacy systems that we're stepping out of? Oh, yeah. And Cobol, like, Fortran. Yeah. Think about this. The legacy financial system today, a whole bunch of it runs on Cobol and Fortran. There aren't even programmers that can fix the legacy systems. It takes 30 days 
to settle a bank loan. 30 uh -huh. days? Are you kidding me? It's because there are seven legacy systems that all have to talk to one another and settle. Like we invested in this, in this cool project called Provenance Blockchain, Figure Technologies, and Hash Token. And here's the thing, DTCC, okay? Every day we use DTCC. If you wanna trade a stock, a bond, there are, this is crazy. There are physical pieces of paper in Dallas, Texas, physical stock certificates that sit in file drawers. And if I have one, and, and here's the crazy thing, we actually don't own all these assets that we think we do. So I have a stock, right? No, I don't. I have an IOU from my UBS broker. The stock, the certificate sits in DTCC in broker street name, UBS's name, and I trade it to you, Ivan, and it goes to the Merrill Lynch account, mm -hmm. okay? So they pick it up out of the drawer and put it over in this drawer, and you and I trade a QSIP, electronic QSIP. That needs to be totally redone digitally, and that's what provenance is, and that's what the hash token does. It will take this $1.8 trillion a year transaction platform that is analog and electronic and move it to the digital age. And everything in the world is going from analog to electronic to digital. And as we make that transition, what gets left behind are these legacy systems, these middleman systems or middle person, I guess, since it's middleman and middle women, but middle person systems that will be disrupted. And it's all because of a very simple concept of triple entry accounting. And that triple entry accounting construct and taking a computing network, the largest, most secure computing network in the world, in the history of mankind, Bitcoin, 1,500 times more secure and more powerful than the CERN supercomputer. We've never seen a computing system of this order of magnitude ever in history. And it is creating the base layer for trust and truth. And all of it is superior to the system we have now, which requires a middleman, right? If I wanna send Jeffrey money, he has to have a bank account, I have to have a bank account and the bank takes a fee. And if we take it across international borders, like to some of the people on the call, then the Rothschilds have to get paid because they own the two banks, which using a 400 year old treaty still get paid every time money goes across an international border. What? How is that possible? Okay. If I have a Bitcoin, I can send it anywhere in the world immediately for free. Now it's not necessarily free and free is the wrong number. By the way, we need to have payments, payment rails that, that take money. But, you know, whether it's Strike that we're an investor in or whether it's something different that ultimately we're, we're going to move capital around the world in a way that's superior to the way we do today, which nobody has money. Right? We have ones and zeros. We have electronic entries in banks, trusted middle people. And we use payment rails like Visa and MasterCard, which are really just fancy spreadsheets. I mean, what does Visa actually do? They take my transactions over the course of the month and they settle up once a month. It's just batch processing. But it's convenient and I like it and I use it and I don't carry money. Um, but in the future, all of it will sit here and actually won't even sit here. Here's Imagine this feature. You're sitting in the back of your autonomous vehicle, right? We won't actually drive. And by the way, Elon promised us a million robo taxis last year. I'm calling <laughs> bullshit. He promised us a million this year. I'm calling bullshit. He will never make money selling cars, not ever. The only way he makes money is by trading Bitcoin. So to trash Bitcoin, all he's doing is trying to buy it cheaper. I mean, this is the age old trick in the book, right? If you want to buy a big block of something, you go out publicly and say it sucks. So the price goes down so you can buy it. So anyone selling to him is a dork. <laughs> but the key is that, um, I even lost my train of thought. I got so upset about Elon. Um, <laughs> you know you know what you're saying about these uh, like legacy systems? And I know you mentioned uh, Amazon. And um, I, I would even say, you know, it applies to not just payments, but like healthcare. You know, there's, yeah. there's oh, a yeah. lot of traditional yeah. tech that's going to be leapfrogged because of this. Yep. Look, blockchain technology... Um, no, so, just one quick guess. Blockchain right. technology is simply the operating system for the trust net, where we trust a single source of truth, a single public ledger for everything. I'll give you a perfect example, real life example, real time example. So I said, my mom, a whole family got COVID over Christmas, including my parents, 81 and 83. And the doctors were so freaked out that these, these older people had COVID. 
that they missed that my mom actually did something wrong. You know, she said, I had pain. I pain. Oh, that's just COVID. That's just COVID. No, it wasn't COVID. It had nothing to do with COVID. They had left a stone in her bile duct when they took out her gallbladder. And so the doctor comes in and says, you know, if, if this keeps up, we might have to have your gallbladder. She's like, are you freaking kidding me? I had it out three months ago. That's why I have the problem. Because I don't know if you didn't read the file or if they had a bad file, but that should never happen. And that can all be fixed with blockchain technology. So all of the applications from healthcare to finance, to payments, to voting, oh my God, voting. We should know the moment the election's <clears throat> over precisely who won to the, to the, to the single, you know, one tenth of 1% or one one hundredth of a percent. It's just silly, but legacy systems don't go away easily. They like getting paid, right? And so everybody says, well, why, why are the banks fighting so hard? Why is Warren Buffett say it's rat poison or you know, Charlie Munger one ups him. Oh, it's like trading newly harvested, newly harvested dead baby brains. WTF, Charlie, seriously, that's what you're going to say about Bitcoin. It's like trading newly harvested dead baby brains. Why does he say that? Because well, one, he spent no time on it. So he doesn't understand it, but two, because the more hyperbolic you are, the longer you can try to protect your legacy system. And Berkshire owns 46% legacy financial institutions. They don't want them to go away, but they're going away. Nothing they can do about it. Wow. Mark, it, it, you know, we preface this with this is, a, you know, nothing here is to be a, a consumer investment advice piece. So the greatest investment is something you believe in before everyone else does. What are some of those networks uh, that you see being built up currently that is going to be the future? Of well, blockchain? I mean, look, it, it, the easiest is, is the, the protocol. So, what people need to understand about Web3 and about the, the future of finance is that what we're doing is we're, we're creating this new thing, the trust net, the same way we created the internet. So when the internet started in the 60s and 70s, it was a government project and there were 80 protocols. And from that 80, today we have five, right? We have TCP IP, which we're using right now to, to talk. Then we have SMTP for email. We have HTTP for websites. We have uh, FTP for file transfers, and we have www. that kind of pulls everything together in World Wide Web. So we have all these protocols, and they're all fighting for, for space. And today we have Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is the base layer like TCP IP. It won. How does it win? It won because of the law of increasing returns. The law of increasing returns, Paul Romer won the Nobel Prize two years ago for this, says it's not the best technology that wins. It doesn't have to be the best. It's the one that gets the network effect the fastest. So once you get to critical mass, you're unassailable. And in an open source world, you're even more unassailable because you can just copy paste anything to improve your chain. So Bitcoin wins TCP IP. Ethereum, absolutely www. It is the toolkit of the Web 3.0, of the <laughs> internet of value. So great. So then FTP, Filecoin probably makes sense. Then on the second two, I can make an argument for Polkadot. I can make an argument for Cosmos and Tendermint. I can even make an argument made for Solana, but you know, we're gonna end up with five protocols. Then on top of that, we're gonna build second layer stuff. Like Lightning's gonna come on top of Bitcoin and we're gonna use that as a payment rail. And then there'll be applications built on top of that protocol stack, the same way that applications are built on the top of the protocol stack in the internet. The problem with the internet was Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the internet, didn't get rich, right? He invented the freaking internet, not Al Gore, <laughs> Tim Berners-Lee. Now, Tim's doing fine. He's a professor at MIT, and he's got a cool new company that may make him super rich, but he didn't get rich. Why? Because TCPI, you couldn't own it. So who got rich? Zuck. How does Zuck get rich? He gave you all a product. The told it was free. By the way, if the product's free, you are the product. Right? There is no free. You are the product. And so they take your steal, your information, and then they sell it. It's like people who do the DNA thing, right? I tried the DNA thing because I have a last name, Yusko. It's a weird name. I want to know where it came from. So I paid the money and got it. The, and they told me I was from Eastern Europe. I'm like, really? I knew that. I want to know where in Eastern Europe. And then I realized they sold my DNA to Merck for a thousand bucks. Well, why didn't I sell my DNA to Merck for a thousand bucks? That would have been a better deal. So the key is that um, that protocol stack, or no, that, that ownership of TCP IP, you couldn't own. So you had to own the uh, applications. In Web3, we can actually own the protocols, right? Bitcoin 
is a late stage venture investment. Ethereum is a late stage venture investment. Polkadot is a late stage, actually a little earlier stage venture investment. It's like owning venture stage companies in a liquid public market. That's why I get so excited. And that's why I went from spending none of my time on this eight years ago to almost all my time today. And people say, Mark, you're a freaking idiot. Why would you give up a regular real business to go hang out with the crypto kids? Like one, I'm having more fun today than I've had in 20 years. I love hanging out with people like you guys that are passionate about something that get other people involved. Two, it is world-changing opportunity. And to be part of that is really cool. And three, I get finance, right? I've lived finance my whole life and I can see the writing on the wall that if we don't adjust, right? I could be the street sweeper, right? You guys probably don't know and listeners probably don't know why stoops in downtown New York are nine feet above street level. So if you go downtown in the, the Wall Street district, the stoops, the doors are nine feet above street level. That makes no sense. Well, yes, it does because of horseshit. Because when you had horse-drawn carriages, you pushed the poop to the side and it stacked four feet high and the ladies didn't like their dresses dragging in the poop. So they built walkways nine feet high, which were kind of a bitch if you got drunk at night and fell off into the poop, but you walked nine feet above street level. So the cars would be on the street with, uh, I mean, not the cars, the, the horse-drawn carriages. So when the horseless carriage came out, what did the street sweepers do? They passed out pamphlets saying, if you get in a car, you'll die. No, right? They spread FUD, the original FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. (laughs) It's like like when my father-in-law left the safe job at the train. I mean, my grandfather-in-law left the safe job at the train to go work for that upstart American Airlines. And his parents were all apoplectic. Like, why would you do that? And so uh, the reality is that the train companies passed out pamphlets saying, if you got on an airplane, your body would cave in on itself once you went past a certain miles per hour. Ridiculous, FUD. So what I love about this is only twice in my life, in the 90s, in the mid 90s, and now, have I seen a migration of talent. The people on this call, you guys, the quality of talent that is migrating from real businesses, consultants, investment banks, technology companies, law firms, going into, back then it was the internet, right? Where you were stupid to go. Now it's crypto where you're stupid to go, but you're not stupid. You're brilliant. In fact, I gave it right before the lockdown happened. Uh, I gave a keynote in uh, New York at a crypto conference. And this guy comes up to me after and says, oh, could you call my mom? I'm like, sure. Why? He's like, cause she thinks I'm an idiot. I left this job at the law firm. I'm working for this crypto company. Like, yeah, I'll call your mom. And I'll tell her that, yeah, you are doing the really smart thing because this is the future. And if you want to be part of the future, you have to leave the past. The problem for most people is they can't give up what they're anchored to in order to pursue the new. And I'll give you a perfect example. So when I was growing up, you guys won't remember this. No one on this call remember this. Uh, there was a show called Happy Days. And it was this silly show on Tuesday nights. And I would run home. So I was sitting at my TV tray at eight o'clock on Tuesday night so I could watch Happy Days. And ABC owned my eyeballs. They owned my lifestyle. I moved my life around to be where, and they gave, and they lost it all. They had all the market cap. They owned all the content. They owned my eyeballs. And now Netflix has that. How? Wow. Because they wouldn't give up the ad-based revenue model to go to subscription. So Mark, I love that. I love that story. will always lose and they'll always be disrupted because they don't want to give up what they have in order to create something better. I like that. Mark, those are some great insights and thank you for sharing those stories. I learned a lot. We're going to, everyone, thank you so much, Mark. There's a lot of comments and questions in the chat. So feel free to stick around. People are asking everything from what is that treaty you're talking about? Mark, what is one last closing insight note? That was extremely uh, just energetic and actually got me motivated for what the future is. No, look, uh, I, I think... The most, the most important thing is to, to act, right? I mean, there's a lot of people who talk. There are a lot of people who you know, think big thoughts and have good ideas, but the most important thing is to act and to, to live life outside the comfort zone. Yeah. Look, I'm a biology guy. I studied biology and chemistry in school and, and in biology, there are only two states, growth and death. Mm-hmm. Prefer the former, don't like the latter. 
but growth requires pain. Think about working out, right? Your muscles, if you're not, if you're not in pain, then you're not working out very hard. So in life, if you stay where it's comfortable, if you stay in the middle of the herd, eh, you'll just get mediocre results. If you go outside the comfort zone, if you make an investment and you feel good about it, you will lose money. And if you feel really good about it, you'll lose a lot of money. If you make an investment and you feel a little sick to your stomach, you make a lot of money. And if you feel really sick to your stomach, like <laughs> buying Bitcoin or Ethereum right this second, you make a lot of money because that's where the magic happens outside the comfort zone when you're growing, when you're feeling that pain. So anyway, that's my last well, word. Mark, that's a good segue to our next uh, panelist who is a TED speaker about uh, uh, healthcare and uh, how thank it's you, Mark. Uh, being worked in a blockchain. Right, thanks guys. Well, Mark, thank you. All right, I'll hang out a little bit, but uh, good to be with you. Okay. Right, thank you, Mark. All right, so let's welcome our next speaker onto the stage. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your time. All right, let's nominate up. So our next speaker, uh, he's from, his name is Dr. Gunjun Barvaj, and he will be presenting. It's actually a TED speaker and actually wrote a book um, from called Inside the Cockpit. But excited to hear from him and what project he's working on. Let me know if you're able to bring him. Okay, here he is. Or right, Dr. Gunjun, let me know if you're ready to go. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. So we're running a little bit late from that keynote, but you got the floor. I'll give you a reminder at the end of, we have about 10 minutes um, and I'll give you an alert as you get closer to that time, but looking forward to hearing from you. Wonderful. So we have talked about um, a lot of things where blockchain can be truly the disruptive technology that we have today. We talk predominantly about decentralized finance, the trust net, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm here to talk about an application that is truly going to disrupt the drug discovery and development industry. And not just that, it's also going to light the lamp of hope for patients because they are the ones who ultimately wait for these drugs to come out. I sometimes say medicine is like religion as it was 200 years ago. The priests were the only ones who were able to speak the language of the gods. So all normal people had to reach out to these priests to communicate with these gods. In medicine, these priests are the physicians, the biotechs and the big farmers, and the poor people who do not understand and speak the language of medicine and have to completely depend on these priests are regulators, investors, and worse, the patients. Cancer Coin is a project that decentralizes drug discovery, leveraging AI. Cancer is a death warrant for too many people. And you can look at various cancer types, say pancreatic cancer, which is very emotive, given so many celebrities, important people, thought leaders have succumbed to it, including Steve Jobs, Patrick Swayze, and some of the other important people. The five-year survival rate is under 3%. There has been zero progress till 19, since 1971. And if you're diagnosed with cancer, it's more often than not, not about surviving, it's about how long I have to live. At the same time, the real world data that patients can provide, their own clinical data, tumor sequencing data, et cetera, can be the missing link in training the AI to drive change, to come out with therapies at an accelerated pace for the same patients who can provide this data. Some years back, when I was working in consulting, I worked in Germany all my life. I'm a German citizen, but I came in 
uh, from India. That's where I grew up, went to the tech school called IIT, IIT Bombay. And when I came here, my, my first boss was also my best friend and my family, the only family I had in Germany. Every second weekend I was at his place. And one evening he called me to tell me that he has been diagnosed with cancer. That was the first moment in my life when I truly felt hopeless and helpless. When you see the family of someone you look up to, like uh, an older brother, like a friend, like a mentor, and you feel helpless about doing anything to support him, that feeling is the worst feeling, at least in my life, I ever have experienced. It happened nine years back, and since then it has happened a number of times. And I'm sure all of you, or many of you have been in such a situation. Three questions that I had when my friend was diagnosed with cancer, in most of my experiences since then of friends calling me for support, help, they have been the same. What are the treatment options for my specific kind of cancer? Are there alternatives? If I'm in the US, are there drugs that have been approved outside US, in Japan, in Europe? If I'm in Europe, are there drugs that have been approved in the US that are not available here? Are there off-label drugs that have not been approved but still work for a specific um, cancer or cancer state, disease state that I have? What are the clinical studies taking place with innovative therapies where I could participate? Dr. Where Dr. my Dinton, we have two minutes left. Uh, where my um, patient characteristics fit really well, and who are the real experts for this specific kind of cancer where I could avail a second opinion. We launched a patient app called Curia last year in August, and today it is the largest cancer community in Europe with over 100,000 cancer patients. They get answers to the three questions I alluded to and a lot more. And as I mentioned, we already have proven with AI, we can improve the likelihood of success for identified therapies up to four times. And not only that, we can come out with enormous efficiencies in drug discovery and development process. And we could do the same thing like target identification and validation for specific assets in specific diseases at taking 20% of the total time that conventional industry players would take. Now combine with this AI, the real world data, you can get access to clinical data, tumor sequencing data of these patients who can willingly provide, license this data to you for a specific discovery project. The likelihood of success can go can be more than double, can be 10 times higher. We combine Curia with its real world data, with the AI that we have in CancerCoin, creating a democratic ecosystem, driving empowerment for patients, and at the same time, drug discovery. Patients get answers and are empowered to participate with access to tailored options, clinical trials that fit them, access to second opinion from experts in their specific cancer type and disease state. And at the same time, industry players can, can, help, can be helped with a faster recruitment for clinical studies. They can run virtual trials, market studies, and surveys. At the same time, use this real world data to power drug discovery using AI. We also have our own project fo focusing on pancreatic cancer treatment, wherein patients provide um, license out their clinical data against cancer coin, and we leverage this data together with our AI and publicly available data ocean 
to predict the next generation therapies. And we collaborate with our partners to bring these therapies at the fastest pace out for our patients. Cancer coin is a token to facilitate the patient ecosystem. It's a utility token. We are launching it in July 2021 to retail investors through an initial exchange offer. Pharma, CROs, and other stakeholders can purchase and will purchase cancer coins to engage with this community. And all token hold holders can convert these tokens on a secondary exchange. Dr. Kunshan, thank you so much for your time. Our, we have to wrap up to the next one, but um, appreciate you and thank you for sharing. You know the the combination of AI and blockchain here is phenomenal. You're solving a a big problem here, so thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Gunjun. Um, so the next speaker we have um, we have the co-founder at Tap Project, Hanif Knight, returning speaker. All right, let's invite him to the stage. It's great to see you again. Hello. Hello, hello. How are you guys doing? We're doing great. So let's jump right in. I apologize, we're running a little late, but um, we'll give you an extra one to two minutes at the end of the 10 minutes uh, at, at the end. So it's gonna go a little bit over, but go ahead, take it away. Awesome. Well, I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll share my screen here for you guys to make sure it's, it's good, but I appreciate you guys uh, providing this opportunity here. Um, and allowing, you know, everyone to talk about blockchain and cryptocurrency and kind of where everything is moving today. Um, so hopefully you guys can see my screen. Um, I'm sharing and I'll be able to kind of go through some of these things with you guys. So again, I just want to thank everyone for, um, for, you know, tuning into this, con uh, to this conference today. It's, uh, it's amazing to see kind of all the technologies that we're going to be talking about today um, and going through it. And I obviously want to thank CrowdCreate for putting on this convention. Um, throughout the next few minutes, I'd, I'd just really like to ask the question um, to those who are listening today. Um, would you like to live in a world in which your money could not be moved? a world in which you deposited money into a bank and everything that you had earned, everything that you, you know, dreamed of your worldly possessions were just locked away inside that bank. A world in which you bought a home, purchased a large amount of assets, items, um, sold your house and all your items and assets remained inside locked away. You weren't compensated for any of your possessions for selling a furnished home. Everything that you had worked for was gone. All your time, money locked away. You might be thinking that there's no, there's no such place like this that exists. Um, and if I did have a bank like this, you know, I should be probably getting a new bank or a new realtor. But what if I told you a world like this does exist? What if I told you that a world like this affects 2.9 billion people? This is a world of a gamer. I want to introduce myself. I'm, I'm a huge gamer and you know, I played um, you know, from growing up playing NES and Sega to organizing tier one esports tournaments. I've always been involved in gaming my whole life. I played hundreds, if not thousands of games and you know, <laughs> hoarding all these currencies, if not millions of, of, of currencies from mobile games to PC games. Currently, all my time and experience are forever locked away in the games that I've played and the games that I'm currently going to be playing. But not anymore. This is the mission of the TAP project. Our mission is to make this dream and this vision a reality. And we are actually making great steps in doing so. Since 2018, we've built a framework and foundation that we've been able to sustain this very idea of allowing gamers to convert their in-game currencies from one game to the next. 
we have built Unity 3D and Unreal SDKs that allow our own layer two transfer systems for currencies to be imported and exported out of games. We've met with hundreds of developers. And in doing so, we've realized that our solution for gamers also solved a problem that developers were seeing. Developers were having issues around creative ways to monetize their games and bring in innovative ways for development and user engagement. They were forced to lower their game experience by focusing on microtransactions, advertising, and pay-to-play models. Not only with that and the recent changes with mobile gaming iOS policies and advertising, this will prove to be even more difficult for developers as they seek to gain revenue. It's not fair. It's not fair to developers. It's not fair to gamers. This has no way to push the gaming industry to places that it should be, stepping outside that box. We have created the way for all parties to find success. We found ourselves bridging the gap between traditional games and blockchain innovation. We are sitting right in the middle of a user experience and offering a hybrid approach to playing, which is where we truly believe the mainstream spot for cryptocurrency, blockchain, and NFTs are. We believe that we are the forefront of new gaming discovery, one in which gaming assets and are connected via items and game currencies, and we've positioned ourselves right in the middle. Throughout our journey of solving this issue, we found ourselves bridging the gap between traditional technologies and blockchain concepts. As blockchain innovators all around the world seek to find problems, they are actually creating, uh, seek to solve problems, they're actually creating new problems of their own. And furthering the gap, not only between different games, but different blockchains, and actually making it harder for consumers to get into blockchain technology themselves which is why we've helped push the space in a direction with the release of NFT Anywhere. It's a simple NFT transportation system that allows NFTs to be transferred across one blockchain to the next. Built for consumers who simply want to just transfer their NFTs to different marketplaces on different blockchains, or built for projects who want to build the connection between NFT packaging systems and direct to marketplaces. This is the solution for you, all built around the TAP project. We're gonna be putting on a pretty big event uh, this summer that's gonna be combining a lot of multi-chain aspects called the Great NFT Hunt. It's a multi-chain collectible hunt that pits users against each other across multiple blockchains. And it's quite simple. First to collect it all, win it all. First to collect all the cards will win a $10,000 decayed prize. And this brings gamified and collecting in a new way that we haven't seen on, on multiple chains. Whether it's points, scores, gems, or NFTs, we are offering a new and innovative way to make them all connected. So some of you might ask, what's next for us? We're committed to bridging the gap between traditional games and blockchain technologies, as I've mentioned, making it simple for the user and the developer with a set of tools that makes it easy to onboard sometimes into a confusing industry of its own. Over the next few months, we'll be introducing the following multi-chain NFT gaming, where NFTs will have a limited supply across multiple blockchains as users play a game to obtain that one NFT. So imagine this, you're in Call of Duty across multiple platforms, both mobile, PC, and console. You have one achievement to get, first to get 20 kills wins this NFT. That's not only across multiple platforms, but now across multiple blockchains. Once that NFT is obtained, it's gone. And then final minute, you're doing great. Final minute, perfect. Uh, we're going to be introducing multi-chain backpacking, which will allow assets currency to, to be traverse multiple blockchains as users play a widening experience. We'll be introducing NFT game vendors, which will allow developers to sell NFTs within directly in their game through a vendor or NPC. We are hitting gamers, collectors, and those who just want to get involved with holding by allowing users to receive revenues from holding tap coins from transactions on a platform. Combining this multi-chain approach, we are truly bridging the gap. Join us as we break the barriers of blockchain that were never supposed to be put up. Join the hunt, teleport NFTs, collect, earn, and win, and level up to new gaming levels with the tap coin. Thank you. 
And if thank you as always, a great presentation. And you're getting a lot of questions in the Zoom chat, so make sure you stick around and answer them. Perfect. Thank you, thank you very much. Project. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Hanif. Presenting Tap Project. Up next, we have Peter Saddington. You might have seen him, heard of him. Um, he's the co founder, CTO at Emirate. It's good to see you again, Peter. Good to see you. It's always great to be here and share with the Crowd Create group. Awesome. Well, I'll let you take it away. Um, you have the floor for 10 minutes, and I'll give you a warning at the one minute uh, mark. But excited to hear and learn more about what you're working on. No worries. Again, thanks so much, Ivan and Jeffrey, for inviting us here to this conference. We are excited to tell you about our product. But in reality, what I really want to give you guys is an opportunity to learn. You see, you only need two things for this presentation, sticky notes or a notepad and a pen. The first thing I'd love for you guys to write down is emrit.io, E-M-R-I-T dot I-O. I'm sure for many of you guys who are joining us, you can check out the chat and they're going to be dropping it right there. Our product is really simple. You go to emrit.io, you get our product for free. You mine tokens for free and in the future, you will be able to have access to future financial services and staking that we will provide to you for free. It sounds too good to be true. Don't take my word for it. Make sure that you check out emirate.io. But here's what I really want to give you guys, especially for so many of you guys who are operators and entrepreneurs in the cryptocurrency space. You see, we here at Emirate.io love giving away free product. We love giving away free crypto. We love changing the lives of the people that are engaging not only in our community, but also with our product. Now, what is so fascinating is that we are growing small businesses inside of our company. We have regional deployment partners. People are helping deploy our product all over the world and making great gains and great income from it. Here's the problem. As much as it is easy to say, hey, get our product for free, earn tokens for free, and future financial service for, for free, you know what? Sometimes, just sometimes, it's still hard to sell it. And so I want to give you guys three tips today, especially if you're an operator or entrepreneur, on how to sell your products even better. It's three things, and that's why you'll need sticky notes and a pen. Let me tell you a story two versions of the same story. And you tell me which one is exciting. Here we go. I woke up in the morning. I knew that there was something that I was supposed to do today, but I really couldn't figure it out. So I went to the bathroom, brushed my teeth, sat on the toilet, and then finally took a shower. When I was in the shower, the idea came to me and I executed upon it. Yeah, that's pretty boring. Let's try another one. I woke up in the morning. My heart was beating fast. I could not figure out what I needed to do, but I knew it was going to be important. I rushed over to the sink. I know I needed to brush my teeth and sit on the toilet and get that done. And finally, I jumped into the shower and boom, it came to me. I needed to present today at the Crowd Create Conference, and I was super excited to talk about my product. You see, what did I inject into this equation? I injected an amazing thing. It's called dopamine. Dopamine plays a powerful role in how we feel pleasure. What it does mentally is it creates an expectation of some sort of reward. And what we want to do as operators and entrepreneurs, when you're selling your product, is you want to connect the activities in the brain of what they're seeing and what they're experiencing to pleasure. You've probably heard the quote before, facts don't care about your feelings. I'm going to flip that script. When it comes to selling your product and doing a better job at the messaging and narrative of who you are and why your product is valuable, you know what? Feelings are greater than facts. Let's, do, let's talk about those three things. First and foremost, if you're an operator or entrepreneur and you want to be better at communicating your message, your narrative of who you are and what your value is to the world, you, number one, have to focus on the central message of what you're trying to convey. It needs to be a call to action. What do you want your crowd? What do you want your audience? What do you want the people listening to you to feel? Write it down. That is going to be your guiding star for your message in that video. Write it down. 
What do I want them to feel? What do I want them to do? That is the central point that you want to get across and get those people involved and engaged in your message. So number one, hone in on that central message. Number two, personal experiences. I told you a story. One of them was fact-based, really boring, and one was emotional-based. The great thing about storytelling is that you already know the story. You already know the end. You already know how it works out. And you can speak to the nuances, the aesthetics, and the idiosyncrasies of how you were feeling through that experience as you share that with your audience. Go deep. Explain those feelings. Extract the emotionality of the moment and really get people into it. So number one, find your central message. What do you want to communicate to the audience? Number two, Talk about your personal experiences. I have lots of great personal experiences here at Emirate. We are helping people change their lives by giving them our product for free. They can earn tokens for free. And many now are creating small businesses around what we're doing. And we're supplying them all the product and all the support for free. You know what? That personal experience has grown our community from just five months ago from zero to over 10,000 people. We love it. And in many ways, we are helping them create their own narratives, their own stories of how our product is helping change their lives so that they can communicate the value of our, our product to their network. Number three, tap into the imagination of your audience. Get them visualizing, get them hoping and dreaming. What is this guy going to give me? What is the, the value proposition? What am I going to get out of this free content? What am I going to receive at the tail end of this story? Get them visualizing the narrative. Get them visualized and engaged in what you're talking about. And I promise you, you will get them into, let's be intellectually honest, an emotional state. And you know what? People make purchase decisions when they're highly emotional. Get them in tune with what you're doing. Help them see the purpose and the value of why you're doing it. Tell that story with gusto. Tell that story with passion. People want to be with people who are passionate. People want to engage with people who are great communicators about the narrative and the messaging and the stories of life change and experiences. That is how you become not only a better operator and entrepreneur, but that is how you open up doors and pathways from other people out there in the world who want to be part of what you're doing. But now that you've excited them, you've called them to action, and they're going to do something different now. Mainly, they're probably going to go to emirate.io and check it out. So that are the, those are my three tips for all the entrepreneurs and operators out there who are building amazing cryptocurrencies and blockchain startups. I wanted to give you guys a little taste of what we're doing to help our customers and our hosts at our company here at Emirate.io be better and grow small businesses based off of our core product and our core technology. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Jeffrey and Ivan, for giving me this time to tell this story and give a, a couple tips. I'll be hanging out in the kind of the, the waiting room in the chat area for any questions. I didn't, I, I didn't want to take too much time here, but that's it, guys. You're awesome, Peter. You're a legend. And I did drop links to your YouTube channel and your original CNBC article from 2018 oh. where you bought a Bitcoin Lamborghini. So you know what? You're a legend uh, in the space. Buying, buying Lamborghinis uh, with Bitcoin uh, is also a good, uh, a good idea as well, if you can afford it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank you, Peter. All right, moving on to the next uh, item on the agenda. So we have our upcoming and first uh, mastermind panelist. It's going to be top. The topic is rise of the taxes. We have three established and really well-known uh, thought leaders to join us on this conversation, we have Simon from YF Dai Finance. We have Miko Matsumura, uh, general partner at Gumi Ventures. Miko, we meet again. And Nicholas Alman, CEO at Finance Vote. So, welcome everyone. Great to chat with you. Uh, we'll be sharing their bio in the Zoom chat. And excited to kick it off. We're just waiting on Nicholas. Let's see if he can join in. How's everybody doing? Doing, doing just well, fine. thank you. Thanks. I'm great, guys. 
Doing well. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Ivan, for uh, putting this on. It's, it's a great event. And uh, good to see you again, Miko, as well. Been a little bit. Yep. Yeah. It's awesome. So Mark Yusko gave a great keynote, Decentralized Finance. And um, the three of you are brought on really as thought leaders. And so let's uh, kick it off. Yeah, so we can actually start with Miko. I know you're itching to talk. <laughs> we have a lot, a lot of things we covered, but yeah, and just I know I just quickly introduce you, but we can dive right in. I know there's a lot of things on people's mind, like you know, hey, Uniswap, you know, version three. We got Dex aggregations. We have liquidity uh, mining. So let's dive right in, Miko. Where do you want to start? Yeah, uh, I just wrote a blog piece on the gumi-cryptos.com website about DEX aggregation, and in particular, uh, about our investment in one inch. So, you know, we're very excited about this kind of middleware layer and the formation of this. You know, we do think that uh, they're, they're working on like a limit order protocol, which we think is pretty exciting. And obviously, they're a very prolific team in terms of developing in the area of DEX aggregation. I think you were kind of pointing at Uniswap v3, which of course is super exciting. And that kind of in a way brings up this kind of amazing distinction between kind of the limit order book style of exchange, which is typically centralized, you know, and then we have the AMM style of exchange, right? And one of the things that's so amazing about watching the Uniswap v3 is looking at how these price ranging kind of effects start to approximate or a take a half, half step towards the limit order book uh, style, right? So it's a very interesting thing. It increases efficiency. It moves passive capital towards dynamic capital, right? So I think Uniswap V3 is excellent to watch. I would also be watching another one of our Gumi portfolio companies, Vega Protocol, which actually does some really amazing things uh, with, with a protocol that produces fair ordering in a decentralized network. So, you know, the fair ordering concept is one where you can actually have central limit order books in a decentralized uh, uh, style. So this, this will create a completely novel form of exchange that takes the efficiency of a FTX, Binance type of exchange, and it, it moves it into a completely decentralized model. So I think those are, those are things to watch, I think, with the evolution of DEX. You know, and and uh, I would say the last thing I want to throw in is another kind of portfolio company, Hashflow. So Hashflow is doing some really amazing work where they're doing basically a, almost like a Costco of uh, DEX, which is they're going straight to uh, really epic market makers and they're just offering wholesale prices to the market, right? So that's very exciting because it just means that uh, people can just go direct to market makers to get the best prices, you know, and I think that that's, that's an exciting pattern. So, you know, obviously, uh, you know, just, just, uh, I'm mostly trying to focus on things that I know really well. And, you know, obviously a lot of it is in portfolio, but, you know, I think the evolution of DEX is really exciting because it's moving towards a lot more capital efficiency. I like that. The Costco, the Costco uh, comparison is pretty interesting there. Nicholas, Simon, what, what do you, what do you think about that? What uh, Nico just mentioned there? Yeah, I, I agree with the, there's a few interesting points in there. I think fair ordering is going to be a big thing. Um, I think the kind of dark forest layer of DEXs has created this kind of um, a, a layer of competition that um, it's sort of in, in one sense, it's, it's finding a new crypto, crypto economic layer to the space, but in another sense, it's kind of, it isn't fair if you're not able to leverage it. <laughs> so I think there's fair ordering of, of orders on DEXs is going to be big. And I, I agree with that point. I think the, the, the introduction of V3 is, is going to significantly change the space. I mean, it, overall, I think the introduction of DEXs has done more for crypto more for the crypto space than any other innovation in the last like three to five years um, because it's a it's starting to eliminate centralized venues from the ability to per permissionless, per permissionlessly trade um, so it's starting to bring the decentralized sort of vision into practice that that hasn't existed before so i think i think dexes are an absolutely crucial point of it i think they're likely to come under attack um, I think we're likely to be challenged on the need for KYC on them in the very near future because they are such a, a threat to, to economic power. 
Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's going to be an interesting time over the next few months. Yeah. Yeah. To, to add to that and uh, take a little, something a little different uh, approach to it. I, yeah, I think it's be really interesting to see um, the new AMMs they're, they're coming out and the, um, the, you know, the way the system, everything's going to be evolving together. Uh, one of the pieces of my company, um, you know, that I work for COO wife die uh, finance um, is that we're looking to have uh, increased, uh, you know, governance in terms of uh, DAO governance and more and more on the voting protocols and everything else and how that all ties into everything. So having, thinking about DEXs, which we have our own as well, safe swap, uh, where we're going to be actually migrating that to the Polygon or Matic network, um, you know, because of fees and, and other, other things. And um, thinking about that in conjunction with, um, with liquidity on DEXs and, and, um, and utilizing, actually, we're going to have a two token model, so utilizing the same token for governance and voting, I think that's going to really expand the world of DEXs and DAOs and how everything's going to be in, in, interoperable with one another and thought of uh, from one another. I think it also provides um, a great challenge to uh, regula regulatory bodies, right, and, and governments and things, trying to figure out, okay, who's who in the, in the world of DEXs and how do we monitor, how do we take our share of, of taxes and everything else um, is something that, you know, here in the United States, um, right, that we're, we're looking at that as well um, as, you know, in, in, from a market in general uh, perspective. And I think it's, um, I think that's going to be the, the next, one of the biggest challenges that right now the um, regulating bodies are looking at coming after and, um, you know, tech, taking the tax dollars and identifying who's a part of um, centralized exchanges. And uh, I think the DEX, uh, DEX is going to be the next great challenge, which um, I don't know uh, what will happen in that, but um, I think, it's going to be interesting five years, especially with uh, everything going on with, with the privacy corn sector as well. So um, a lot to think about, but I think it's, um, you know, DEX is a great place, you know, a great place to be. And um, I think it, it provides, you know, the truest form of decentralization, decentralization. And it's something that we've all been talking about, you know, in the space since like 2017, 18, even, and it hasn't really come to prominence until, you know, the last 18 months, I'd say, or even, 12 months, really, the rise of the DEXs. And it's making some big, yeah, hitting the, the news. Everyone's kind of, their ears are pe peeking up to it. So Simon, actually, I know for a lot of the people joining this uh, conference may or may not be familiar with the concept of DEX. So if you could just do a quick, uh, like, you know, like quick spark notes. I don't know if you remember spark notes, but the quick spark notes of what is a, what is a DEX? Like, let's help these people just joining us now. Yeah, so a DEX, you know, stands for decentralized exchange. Uh, there's no central governing authority to it, so there's like no, you know, counterparty risk, and you basically are, you know, just like in the world of DeFi, decentralized finance and in peer-to-peer -peer transactions, you're having, um, you know, there. Obviously, there's a much deeper level uh, that I'm saying, but you're, um, you're, you're being matched up um, typically with automated market maker. Uh, through a DEX with an order book of, of someone else that wants to place a, a trade uh, opposite of you without any centralized governing authority of, of things. And, um, you know, these tokens on DEXs, just like centralized exchanges also, you know, can provide their own liquidity and then, you know, but it's a lot harder to think about market making on, on DEXs and things and others. So it's, it's a, you know, to sum it up, it's a decentralized exchange. It's, it's a way for us to um, to work and to transact um, without a centralized uh, governing authority, and um, which places the like the privacy matters and and the wallet and everything in, in your own control, and you're you're connecting you know basically your own tokens, your own uh, digital currencies, um, you know directly in, in um, into um, directly into a, a medium of exchange um, that is not yeah you know, has that does not have a centralized governing body. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Actually, so Miko, I know you've talked about this before, but like what, what does it change, especially on the regulatory side, you know, as you're transitioning from central to decentralized? And I know you mentioned KYC, like where, where is this going? Like what is this end result as people are moving more, especially with these launch pads? Like people are just watching these decentralized exchanges more and more. Uh, I would say the following, right? Which is, I think there's two very orthogonal 
topics in the regulatory space, right? I would say that obviously touching what Nicholas alluded to with the KYC topic, you know, I do think that that is an existential topic. And I think obviously Simon also mentioned it in the context of privacy coins, right? So I think that the AML topic is an existential topic. And if you actually look in the United States, obviously internationally, it's FATF, but in the United States, it's FinCEN, you know, and DOJ. And if you look at that combination, those are the agents that show up with guns, right? Like it's, you know, this, we're talking about anti-terrorist financing. We're talking about like very, very serious stuff, right? So in a sense that is existential. And I think Nicholas said it very well, which is that that's the like idea of total privacy, uh, I think is not, uh, congruent with uh, the rights that are enshrined in the Constitution, at least in the United States. You know, there is a right to uh, protection from unreasonable search and seizure, right? That's what's enshrined. So, like, you know, the idea that things can be searched and seized reasonably is is a very is is enshrined. So, I think that that's going to be an existential fight, and I think it'll come to the space. So I think pure anonymity will probably not survive uh, the the upcoming regulatory regime. That's just my prediction, because it's you know the the darkness hides a lot of of malfeasance, uh, criminal activity, and things that in the long run will be unwelcome in the space anyway. I know that that puts me against lots of libertarian actors, but you know I think we just want to have a better fairer system you know and i for everyone and i I think uh that's what that has to include i think the other side of the coin though is more like what you alluded to which is the kind of willy-nilly registration of so-called ido or initial dex offering where people are just taking random tokens and throwing them up and random people are buying them that fits much more into the bailiwick of the sec you know, as to whether these are securities and whether these securities uh, are being uh, unregistered, unlicensed, and, you know, whether they're being bought and sold by, you know, inappropriate people and whether sufficient investor protections are in place. I think that's really less uh, kind of an existential topic. Uh, I think that the current SEC uh, chairman Gensler has said that, you know, Similar to uh, Jay Clayton, the previous, that most of the things that he sees seem to be securities. So, you know, I think they're taking a pretty broad view of their regulatory purview. You know, so I I do think regulators are coming. uh, But I think one of the big proposals on the table, thanks to uh, crypto mom Hester Peirce, is the idea of a regulatory sandbox. So, you know, we're, we're I think we're all super favorable towards that. I don't think a sandbox will apply to, you know, things like Uniswap. You know, I, I think things like AML are too existential for there to be a sandbox. And and furthermore, they've had years to implement this. So, you know, I think I think that's going to be the heavy one. Nicholas, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Being that you know, yeah. Simon, your launch pad with why I've died, Nicholas. Yeah, let's. So mm-hmm. we're Thank we're designing you. a launch pad as well. Um, so we, we're in this sort of. I mean. If you if you look back over the last maybe eighteen months, it's been about fifty thousand new cryptocurrencies. I mean, it, it's getting towards being unregulatable just because of the noise. I mean, there's, there's seven to twelve IDOs a day, you know, and and some of them, you know, most of them are you know flat out scams. And you know, so where the regulation comes in on that front, and but there it is a necessary function to to create systems that allow people to permission them permissionlessly create digital economies in my view it's it's a way of it's a it's an innovation frontier that is not going to be easily stopped and and there's if if we sort of wind back to sort of 2017 18 the kind of the 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 specter of of sec uh challenge is what put a lot of people off um but the gatekeeping of the centralized exchanges kind of uh, like made that a more difficult job. Now we've got DEXs, now we've got IDO platforms. I, d- I just don't see it as being entirely possible to um, to stop these things. They're gonna happen from now on, whatever happens. So I kind of, a lot of what we're working on is building a kind of governance system around this to sort of curate these tokens. So to support people in not buying the, the scams. So allowing people to vote on which are the good ones and letting sort of consensus drive the good ones to the top. I think the IDO game has been just turned into a complete 
pump and dumps like game where people are intentionally using narrow depth and AMMs to, to spike the price up like 50, 100 X. Um, and that is absolutely damaging retail traders and VCs are just as guilty of this as anyone else. Um, and so I, th I think there's there's a need for the sort of space to self heal itself. I don't think we can wait for regulators to, to sort this out for us. We've got to we've got to do it ourselves. So we've got to find systems that sort this out and provide the knowledge and skills for users to interact with the space to 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 focus on the good assets and the innovative stuff. Um, so I think we we can't wait around for regulators. We've got to do it ourselves. Great, Nick. I very Simon. much. Sorry, I, I just want to I just want to applaud, uh, you know, especially the metric of things like uh, depth. Right. So I think there's too many games of thinly traded uh, tokens. Right. I can I can I can spend 25 cents and make my token worth a, a billion dollars, you know, with a th with a thin enough trading volume. So, you know, just just watch, watch out. Uh, so, sorry. Go ahead, Simon. <laughs> there you go. No, it's true. No, this is a fascinating conversation. Um, I. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons, one of the things that really attracted me to uh, to working in capacity I am and helping run operations with Wide Eye Finance is their focus on trust, transparency, and security, and um, that you know starts and ends with you know that starts with but doesn't end with their launch pads. So like every single project that uh, is brought on, um, there's an actual KYC process that is in place. You know your customer who the team is behind it. Um, there's like a pre-sale token locks that, that happen and they're strict. Um, every contract is audited also by, um, one of our, you know, one of a, a few audit partners, smart contract audit partners of ours, uh, including blockchain concilium is, is really the main one. And, um, there's really this mandatory vetting in place. So I, I bring all that up because I think, um, self-regulation is, is big, right. And I think regulatory authorities are going to be looking at okay, who are the ones that are trying their best um, of any kind of project, especially the ones that are the biggest, right? Who are the big fish in any kind of space, uh, whether it's in DeFi, DAP, or infrastructure, or anything else? What are they doing today, you know, that you can, you know, vet out publicly uh, in terms of, you know, trying to regulate and trying to do things the right way, trying to protect the people that are participating in the token launches. Also, what are they doing to disincentivize or, or discourage or, or outright ban, um, you know, different users, from you know jurisdictions that are questionable on uh, not allowing them to participate in token sales and things like that. So we uh, we take uh, measures in place to make sure that we we notify people, anyone that's trying to come in, even like VPN wise or anything from the United States or Singapore or other places that um, you know please abide by your regulatory authorities in, in your jurisdictions um, before taking part in, in anything. And um, and obviously our token launches, that we do um, are on on a, on a launch pad that's you know tied that whenever that TGE takes place, it is listed on you know decentralized exchanges only, right? And then from there, these tokens can go onto the centralized exchanges. But we do everything possible to make sure that um, you know the safety and security, and then you know people are adhering to the regulations of their own. Like I, you know, as a U.S. citizen, I can't even participate in my own <laughs> token launches. Of sorts, so I, I think that's um, it's really important the self-regulation uh, aspect of it, in, in conjunction with thinking about you know what's going to you know kind of the rise of re regulations around here and who who's doing the things the right way and who's obviously not because um, I do think um, IDOs and the launch pads that the launch pads that um, and in the in the dexes that do allow um, these coins that you know can go to zero that have nothing behind them those are the ones that, you know, the regulatory authorities will be like going after first, especially ones that have raised the most amount, you know, you think back to the ICO days, right? Think back what happened and the celebrities now are also uh, pumping different meme coins, things like that. So it's almost like a, the next iteration of, you know, 2017 uh, in a sense in that way. What have we learned from that 2018 ICO craze? I wonder, is it repeating itself? And it, uh, you know, to that extent, is the learning lesson going to be just the correction? You know, like what's the bigger message that we can all support and collaborate and work together to kind of move in that hopefully positive direction forward? I, I, would, I would say at the moment, absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> I, I, th I think, you know, we 
top form and tokens of last month, all these dog Ponzi schemes. I mean, it, it's the, the people, you can't expect the market to learn lessons. Like, I mean, what's, what's tangibly changed is there's been less gigantic ICOs, like, because people are trying to stay under the raise, li- you know, the, the sort of limits of raises that attract serious regulatory attention. And people have learned that for now. I'm still expecting that phase to sort of hit towards the tail end of the cycle. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, if anything, the permissionlessness that DEXs have created have just kind of taken the brakes off everything, right? And, and now you don't need an exchange. Um, you need permission from an exchange to list these things. So we've got, I think there was, you know, 700 rug pulls yesterday on Binance Smart Chain. So wow. it's, it's, it's like, and you know, like one a minute, it's, it's like, it's insane. So the, we've, the, the space like has moved on in the sense that the people doing large platform tier um, crowd raises are doing it through very regulated venues, but it's kind of pushed everything into much smaller, noisier sort of environments. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a bit disappointing at times to see um, us repeat the same mistakes. And that's what's going to, I, but I do have faith that the space is way more mature than it was last, last time. And, you know, we've got DeFi now, which there's a lot of protective qualities around the ability to, to move assets into stables and even take short positions in downturns. Um, but yes, particularly the kind of IDO game is, is, is kind of troubles me a lot in terms of um, the kind of washout effect of new retail falling into these, um, these sort of bad tokens and just getting ripped off relentlessly. So I, I hope we can, within this cycle, learn our lessons, but I'm, I'm not seeing too much evidence of it so yeah. far. I, I just oh, want to say... Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Mika, I was going to chime in real quick. I think one advantage uh, that... Well, one, one thing to think think about of like when newbies and novices, where they start, is really um, centralized exchanges over DEXs, right? So I think mm-hmm. it's like the uh, the players in the game that are more veteran to crypto are really the ones that are still getting burnt by these rug pulls and everything else. And one of the missions why YFDI Finance was launched, actually the company I'm with is um, is to be like the anti-rug pull, you know, DeFi ecosystem. So I totally hear you on that. But um, luckily I think 80, 90% of people probably start as centralized exchanges before they move into DEXs and everything else because there's still that UI UX, um, you know, discrepancy between, between the two as well. And sorry, go ahead, Miko. Uh, I mean, I, I would say with respect to kind of 2017, like, you know, one of the things that I think is is kind of nice is that the market seems to be kind of experiencing sort of some degree of self-correction, you know, whether you attribute that to things like U.S. tax day, which I think is a relevant factor. You know, there are other kind of like relevant factors that I think contribute, uh, you know, so I, I think that's an important thing, uh, you know, but I think from the perspective of, uh, you know, what I see happening in the market, you know, maybe this correction will help people who kind of are pursuing short time preference, right? Because I think that that's a big issue, which is a lot of the new people coming in are kind of trying to get rich quick, you know, and I think that that it's, uh, you know, Bitcoin is about don't get poor slowly, you know, and I think that getting rich quick is is kind of a, I mean, it's like it's just like buying the lottery ticket. There's not like a hundred million articles written about every single person who lost. Oh yeah, Mark Jones of Arizona lost the lottery. He bought a seven dollar ticket and he didn't win. You know, like this big long article about his life and how he lost the lottery. It's like there aren't a million of those articles. There's only these stupid articles about someone who like randomly won, uh, you know, by investing in Doge coins. So like, you know, I think people need to reason about this a little bit better because we're in a multi-decade phenomenon and uh you know i think people with a long time horizon time preference so one of the things i see in the correction is i see that the longer time preference can reassert so I, that that i feel like you know correct away like that's a that kind of correction is like being corrected by a teacher you know it's not the kind of correction where it's just like you know anything else because when you look at who's selling it's the week. It's sort of very. It's new wallets are. It's kind of a shame, but the new wallets are selling. The old ones are not selling. There's some old wallets selling, honestly, but like, you know, the stronger hands are still in. 
we just want to go around closing thoughts, you know, Simon, Miko, Nicholas, just uh, in general, these decentralized exchanges, any like insights you want to provide for the general audience and how can we even help you? There's a lot of people um, here that just want to support the ecosystem and bring those projects that are bringing true innovation uh, forward. Um, yeah, so, I, uh, yeah. Uh, go on. I, I'll, um, so I'll just a quick round up. I, I think for me, the next frontier in this game is is better decentralization through governance. So a lot of what we're, so as a finance.vote, we're about building voting systems, largely vote on, on using quadratic voting, building civil resistant ways to reach consensus. Um, and particularly on DEXs, we've just launched a product called yield.vote, which is about um, decentralized liquidity management. If you look back through the DeFi boom, it started with Compound doing liquidity mining and it kind of went off from there. And it was the, the re-emergence of utility tokens as incentives. And I think the next frontier is being able to manage that with appropriate governance and, and just generally DAOs starting to take over from, from centralized, um, centralized sort of systems. So I, I think we're, we're about to move into yet another frontier of decentralization and, and it will be driven by um, governance. Simon. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree with Nicholas more. And I think we're both on, uh, we're sponsors of the DeFi Summit as well in next month in June. So right. that's exciting as well. Hopefully Miko, you're probably, I'm sure you're on there as well, uh, which is great, consensus coming up. So yeah, I mean, my, uh, my big thing uh, and one of my kind of go forward like purposes of being in the space is just to like help people to realize it's beyond just banking them banked and everything else. Like I really do feel, um, you know, DeFi in general is, uh, you know, a catalyst for broader adoption of, of, of crypto and the tools that, uh, and, and the value that it provides and everything else. And, and obviously DeFi does, you know, go hand in hand in a way with, with DEXs and everything else. Um, and, um, and it's, it's about having, you know, not only veterans in the space, but also novices come in and be able to operate in a really safe, protected way and trusted way, understanding, not only teaching them, educating them what they're doing, but um, allowing them to, you know, bear the fruit of their own labor and participating in, you know, exciting products like lending and borrowing, which we have coming up, going to be have coming online in a bit that you can already see at obviously Compound and uh, Ave and Celsius and others. And so, um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's about, you know, just adoption. You know, I think we did a good job with uh, institutions. Everyone's coming on board, but uh, I want to see more adoption from, you know, just, you know, novices and people in the space and giving them comfortability to move away from, you know, centralized exchanges in, into DEXs, but also, you know, make sure they know what they're doing and how to look out for uh, the rug pulls and things. It's still, you know, it's still a nuance. There's still people coming in the Telegram group saying, hey, share with me your private keys and I'll send you this price pool of 100,000 life die. And people are losing money like that every single week, you know, sometimes daily for these, um, you know, spoof websites, you know, have Ethereum on loop talking at DEF CON 5 saying, hey, if you send in two Ethereum, you'll get four back and people are still falling for that. So we need to regulate you know, that piece out. And I think with, with the crew that we have here and thanks for uh, hosting us, both Miko and Nicholas and everything, love to uh, chat more with you guys and see how we can help um, each other's ecosystems out because we want to, for finance that vote, for, uh, for example, we do want to expand our governance to, uh, to be really truly uh, more of a truly you know, DAO system and actually, the next launchpad that we're launching, launching is called DAO One, becoming a, a DAO from day one from their t token generation event. So it all Amazing, works man. in for the greater goal. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Simon. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we're coming up on time, and so um, you know, really, the purpose of these events is to bring together the community. Miko, Simon, Nicholas, we'll be sure to connect uh, afterwards. And um, thank you. Sorry, for sharing sorry to cut you off, Miko. <laughs> <laughs> ah, no problem. Just follow me at Miko.com. You can get my socials there. And uh, you know, great, great to see you all. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks so much. It's been great. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, so let's welcome our next panel. Jeff, you want to make the introductions? Yes. Our next two panelists, we have Ave. Uh, we're going to have Andrew, one of the developers, and also Jeremy from Balancer. And to kick it off, 
Jeremy and Andrew would love to give you first uh, uh, or first share a high level um, explanation of what is an automated market maker. And then we can get into the more juicy specific topics to discuss. Sure. Nice to meet you guys. Um, I can go first. Um, so an automated market maker is um, an exchange that uh, kind of runs on a new model that um, you know, was never possible in um, centralized finance before. Um, and if you're new to DeFi, I think, you know, one way you could kind of understand an AMM is um, by uh, comparing its differences from like a centralized order book, uh, which is what you would use, like when you're buying and selling stocks, or even when you're using like a centralized crypto exchange like Coinbase, where uh, each time a transaction is made, uh, whether you, you're buying or selling a stock, there's another person on the other side of that transaction who's matched together with you to make this transaction takes pla take place. So every transaction is between two parties. Um, in an AMM or an automated market maker, um, every transaction is, be is between you and a liquidity pool. And a liquidity pool is like a stockpile of tokens that belongs to a decentralized uh, network of people who uh, for whatever reason, usually because they're earning a yield or, or because you know, they might be using a platform like Balancer to keep their uh, portfolio in balance based on certain percentages between different assets, they have deposited their uh, assets into this pool. And each time you make a trade, uh, you're actually um, you know, depositing or, or swapping your token into a pool and withdrawing the uh, counter asset out of that pool. And uh, the reason why this model exists is because it provides sort of uh, constant liquidity uh, without having the need for like professional market making firms, which are usually, you know, the entities that make sure that centralized markets stay liquid. They're, they're basically, uh, you know, financial institutions, firms that have uh, tons of money and they're constantly um, selling a little above market price and they're constantly buying a little uh, below market price to make sure that there's always uh, market liquidity available. In an AMM, you can uh, basically achieve that effect with a, with a lot less capital and actually with zero capital from sort of the team itself that's building that protocol, it's all sort of crowdsourced capital, so to speak. Yeah, kind of how I like to describe like DeFi in general sort of applies to what an AMM is. Uh, and it's sort of um, like open and immediate access to financial services. Um, and so it's kind of easy to understand from the perspective of a decentralized exchange um, where you can put money in and get money out immediately because, you know, that liquidity exists. Uh, and that's sort of like participating like in this, that swap. Um, and sort of the AMM is the other side of that equation. It is facilitating those swaps. Uh, and sort of what's so powerful about DeFi is that no one has special privileges um, in these pools. Like no one gets a bigger cut of the share. Um, it's all just based off of you know, what you put into the equation. Um, so when you provide liquidity to one of these pools, basically what you're doing is you are putting your assets available uh, and then making them available for someone else to use. Um, in the case of an AMM, it's for using and swapping. Uh, and the use case that I'm most familiar with at Aave, uh, it's for borrowing. Uh, and it's sort of the same principle across all of DeFi. And it's just sort of just this open access to capital and services that, uh, you know, otherwise you might not be able to. Um, and so I guess like kind of going off of this, like, Kind of the topics that I think we wanted to discuss today are sort of, you know, how sort of the cutting edge in DeFi um, is really enabling people to take control of their assets in ways that they weren't otherwise able to. Um, and sort of, you know, we, we sort of have experienced this layer one already of, you know, people are able to contribute liquidity and then they get paid for doing so. But now, you know, as these DeFi projects are sort of maturing, uh, we're coming up with more and more complicated ways uh, to sort of compensate people for these actions and incentivize actions that, you know, otherwise you wouldn't be able to do. Uh, I kind of want to segue this into sort of like Balancer V2 and like the different ways that, um, you know, Balancer is incentivizing people to provide liquidity and sort of the rewards for doing so. 
Sure. Yeah, I can uh, pick that up. Um, <clears throat> and thanks for that great segue. Um, yeah, I think uh, so. Right now on Balancer, there are two really, really interesting things going on where um, you could say kind of both sides of the markets are receiving are receiving some incentive, which is just kind of spurring the growth of the, of the platform. Um, as Andrew mentioned, on the uh, liquidity providing side, um, we you know, Balancer is running a liquidity mining um, program. Them for introducing. Did I just lose audio? You guys hear me? Okay. Just for a second there, but you're back. My computer is just going crazy right now. Um, oh, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to see if I can get this. How are we doing? You're good now. We're good now? Okay. Yeah. AirPods back. Yes, we All right. Good. Um, yeah, so liquidity mining. Um, essentially, as other platforms have uh, done, and, and actually Ave is currently doing, and uh, I don't know if, if Ave's ever done this before. It's is it the first time? Uh, we our first one was uh, on Polygon, so encouraging people to move over there. Uh, but the our, the one that we implemented like a few weeks ago, uh, that's the first time that we've done it on mainnet, and also the first time we've done it with the Ave token. Nice. Yeah, and so um, liquidity mining is a way for the users that are bringing value to the protocol to uh, capture some value as well and to sort of share in the success of the platform and to become part of the uh, active governance of the platform. As a decentralized network, it's crucial to um, sort of distribute tokens widely to a decentralized base, but you also want to uh, like target the right people, you, you want to give that to people who actually um, would be advocates for the long-term success of the platform, who understand it and use it. So um, today, being a liquidity provider on Balancer um, can be, you know, very, uh, uh, let's say, rewarding because uh, not only uh, can you earn sort of yield and grow your portfolio through uh, swap fees that, that you earn as a liquidity provider, uh, but you also, depending on which pool you're invested in, can be receiving uh, BAL uh, incentives as well. So a uh, new BAL that is being, um, you know, distributed from the treasury uh, to you. Yeah, so part of what's really cool about um, AMMs is that, you know, they have sort of a deterministic input output. So like, uh, I like to think of it like a digital vending machine. So if you put in a certain amount of this token, you're guaranteed to get out a certain amount of this token. Um, and what this does is that it sort of removes the counterparty risk. Um, so if you are providing your liquidity to these platforms, you, know, you don't have to worry about what is happening on the other side because it's guaranteed to execute the same way every single time. Um, and you know what makes this really powerful is that you can sort of take control of the way that you're earning um, in ways that you otherwise wouldn't be able to, um, because sort of this, this concept of open access to DeFi um, extends not only to users, but at the smart contract level too. So you can take sort of the output from one DeFi project and plug it directly into another output uh, or plug it in as an input to something else. Um, and that's sort of what we've done at Aave is uh, with the AMM market um, is so whenever you deposit liquidity into an AMM, you'll get sort of a tokenized representation of that, which says, hey, this is my claim on these assets. And anytime I can redeem those tokens uh, and receive back the liquidity that I provided. Um, and you can actually use this sort of IOU, this token that represents that liquidity you provided um, to do other services. Uh, and so specifically in the Aave AMM market, um, you can deposit these IOU tokens, these LP tokens as they're called, um, and you can deposit them as collateral and borrow against them. Um, and you know this is extremely powerful and it's not something that really is comparable to anything in the traditional finance world. You know, not only the ability to sort of provide this liquidity and earn money by putting your assets to work, um, but also then use that uh, as a 
as an input to something else uh, and facilitate, you know, potentially more earnings on top of that. Uh, and it's just one example of sort of the composability of DeFi, you know, how open access um, can provide you with access to, you know, more sources of yield uh, and also just more opportunities to really put your assets to work. Um, and sort of like why, you know, borrowing against your assets might be a good idea uh, is because, you know, really DeFi is all about ownership. It's all about having custody of your assets, owning part of something. Um, that's sort of where the liquidity mining comes from is you, you're getting part of the ownership of the protocol itself. You can actually govern how it's changed. Uh, and sort of by using your assets as collateral, um, effectively what you're doing is not selling them. You're keeping them in your possession uh, and then using them to gain access to collateral, which you could use for anything. Um, you could use it to gain more leverage. You could use it to open a short position. You could use it to pay bills, absolutely anything. Um, and all it's doing is leveraging sort of the utility that you already have, the value that you've already put to work somewhere else. Um, and Ave is saying, hey, we value that um, sort of this collateral has value in these other systems. Uh, and we're willing to extend you a, a permissionless line of credit based off of that. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of this sort of synergy actually works even further than this, where not just depositing the LP tokens, uh, but I guess, Jeremy, do you want to talk about sort of like the balancer synergy uh, that you guys have with sort of your asset managers? Yeah, totally. <clears throat> I mean, and balancer and Ave have uh, been collaborating more and more in, in really amazing ways. Um, and, and it's really awesome. And, and one of the uh, one of the ways that that our two protocols uh, are being integrated right now is through um, these, this new feature in Balancer V2 called Asset Managers. And what that is, is um, when, you, when liquidity is provided into an AMM um, and there is sort of regular trading activity occurring on that AMM, the majority of those tokens that are in the liquidity pool are actually uh, at most at all times the majority of that liquidity is sitting dormant is not actively being used in order to fulfill trading demand um, there's sort of a uh, a chunk a percentage that is needed to sort of fulfill that activity and then there's a percentage that is just kind of there and so the idea with asset managers um, which, you know, I feel, I feel like I can praise this idea because it was not my idea. Um, it's, it's like such an interesting, innovative concept is to enable a liquidity pool to authorize a smart contract that acts as the uh, manager of those assets. And that uh, smart contract can thus allocate uh, liquidity from within a pool the unused liquidity from within a pool into other productive uses. And uh, so, you know, one of the ways to do that is to uh, use that, use those tokens for lending. And through this integration between Balancer and Aave, Aave is uh, building the very first asset manager on Balancer so that uh, unused tokens from liquidity pools on Balancer can be um, using the Aave protocol. And, and what that means is really um, maximum benefit to liquidity providers. Not only are you benefiting from everything that you would have normally been getting from, the, from you know, being a liquidity provider in that pool, uh, generating the yield from, from trading fees. And if there's any liquidity mining in that pool, you're receiving that as well. And on top of that, you're also uh, earning additional yield through um, that, the use of that uh, asset on the Aave uh, platform. Well, I just love listening to the two of you guys go back and forth because you're literally on the, the cutting edge. Um, and it's so interesting because a lot of these communities talk about, you know, automated market makers or yield. Every feature you come out with is is like people are now chatting about it because it's, it's actually giving opportunities to investors, to people providing this liquidity. Yeah, I think what's actually super cool about the, the Balancer V2 Asset Manager um, is that because Balancer is taking these unused funds and depositing them in Aave, um, sort of Aave is a system of lending and borrowing. So you have an interest rate that you earn for lending your assets and you have an interest rate that you pay for borrowing assets. 
Um, and it's all based off of supply and demand. So the based off of the amount of assets that are stored and the amount that are lent out, you know, that's what determines the interest rates. Um, and so by Balancer lending those unused funds to the Aave market, effectively what they're doing is making it cheaper for liquidity providers to then borrow money against their liquidity positions. Um, and so, I mean, this synergy can kind of just go in circles like this, where then if, if you're making it cheaper for these people to borrow against their liquidity positions, then they borrow more, it raises the deposit rates and then makes it even more lucrative for the liquidity providers. Um, and, you know, I think this is just what's so cool about DeFi is that you can sort of have these feedback loops like this, um, where it's sort of just a win-win for both of these protocols. Um, and, you know, this is true, not just of protocols in different sectors, like Aave is in sort of the lending borrowing market and Balancer is in the AMM market. Um, but, you know, really like it, it, within the same market, sort of these synergies can exist too. Uh, and it just goes to show that like DeFi is non-competitive. Like this is finance for everyone controlled by no one. Uh, and really, you know, our goal here is to sort of make the lives of everybody better, like give people access to this system of finance that just didn't exist before. Uh, and that's, you know, why I personally think it's just so cool to be building and also just involved in this space. And anyone else have any thoughts about, uh, you know, just like what it means to be involved in DeFi for you? That's great. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. literally our business is called crowd create for the reason that like empowering people, uh, you know, through new technologies, community, a lot of these insights that are being shared. Um, that's great. Uh, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, another that. topic that we want to touch on is, um, you know, uh, why are startup teams choosing IDOs to distribute their tokens? So you can talk about like these new projects that are actually being, um, spun up in general. And I know that's a hot topic right now in this space. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, you know, IDOs are becoming a more and more common choice for startup teams that are kind of distributing a new token to the market. Um, and you know, I think there are a few reasons why this is happening and why this trend is taking place. Like before IDOs, you know, we had IEOs and before that we had ICOs. Um, you know, IEOs, which are like a token offering that occurs on, on a centralized exchange, they, they offered a lot of value. I mean, they still do offer a lot of value because uh, they give these teams access, direct access to a very liquid market and uh, they, they can, you know, provide a lot of visibility. Um, but on the uh, kind of downside, um, they're very expensive. You know, they, they tend to take a huge cut of the uh, tokens that are sold. Um, and uh, sometimes they claim that they don't because they just kind of like call things by different names. Like there's no, you know, they'll say they're like, no, there, there's, there's no uh, fee or whatever. But then like, there's this other thing that they do they do which essentially means like you have to give us like a lot of your tokens uh and then the other thing is is like you know just unfortunately centralized exchanges are not accessible to everyone because they're limited to certain jurisdictions and um you know if you're a token project that's you know about to launch your token to your community you really want to maximize the ability for your entire community to participate and you want everyone who's been supporting you from the early days to be able to you know invest at this early point and to you know ride the this like future success together with you and to play an active role in that so um ideos offer sort of uh more of a uh fair launch mechanism and you know one of the most popular if not the, the most popular uh mechanism for that lately has been um liquidity bootstrapping pools on balancer lbps for short um, and LBPs offer some really interesting uh, benefits where, you know, just to kind of like keep it concise, um, they lead to uh, well-distributed uh, tokens, like a lot better than sort of 
other mechanisms that have been used uh, more commonly, where at the end of your sale, it's not a few whales that bought up all the tokens. It's like, it's really well distributed throughout sort of a diverse community. And you can see, you know, when you look at the number of wallets that participated and the amount that each one holds, it's like really, you know, it's, it's really favorable to the team to have that outcome. And then it's also, um, you know, resistant to, front running and bots that might sort of, you know, run pump and dumps by like getting in first and then, you know, uh, pumping up the price and, and selling. And, you know, there've been like really, um, you know, un sub optimal outcomes for teams that have used sort of other mechanisms like bonding curves to um, sell their tokens. But, you know, in, in today's market, there's a lot of interest in, in IDOs and there are more and more solutions that have, uh, are being kind of launched to give teams more and more options for how to how to do that. Jeremy, what was that option called again? You said LVP? LBP, liquidity oh, LBP. bootstrapping pools. Oh, interesting. Andrew, do you have any insights on that? Uh, I do not. I am I'm not super familiar with sort of like the I like any of the ICO, IEO, IDO. Um, you know, I'm very research focused, like, uh, and sort of going off of like something that was talked about in like the last pitch uh, is that, you know, when you give people the power to create any of these pools, you know, you're going to see just the number of projects explode and maybe not necessarily the quality of those projects keep up with that. Uh, and, you know, and one extremely important point about DeFi is that not all DeFi is created equal. <laughs> like just because uh, some, you um, just because some DeFi offers sort of this trustlessness, this transparency, this security, uh, it does not mean that it comes for free. Like you actually have to put in the work uh, in the code to make it that way. Uh, and, you know, I think one thing that, you know, we've sort of noticed in sort of this stage of the market uh, is that we really, you know, when you give people this power, you're also putting the burden on them to sort of do this research on their own and, you know, figure out, you know, which projects coming out of these incubation phases, uh, you know, are really worth putting your time into. Um, and so I think that that's something that DeFi as a whole, you know, really needs to work on uh, is educating people about not only what DeFi is, uh, but what DeFi isn't. <laughs> so being able to recognize the signs of projects that have vulnerabilities, um, you know, not just from the sense of being able to read smart contract code, because obviously, you know, not everybody is going to have that skill set, uh, but everybody can have the skill set of being able to do the proper research uh, into the teams, into the protocols, into how these things are implemented. Um, two websites that I'll throw out that I personally just like to look at if when I'm trying to investigate new projects uh, is a uh, defisafety.com and defiscore.io. Um, and these are basically just two projects that um, sort of aggregate info uh, that look through, you know, top to bottom, all of the different things that could be involved, um, you know, with assessing a project's security. Uh, and then the next part uh, that I'll talk about is sort of the yield aspect. You know, so much of these projects nowadays, you know, the research that people will do is just, they see an APR next to a deposit button. Uh, and because of, you know, the open accessibility of DeFi, all you have to do is click that button and you have access to that quote unquote rate. Uh, but it's also really important to understand where that rate is coming from. Um, you know, a lot of times these super high rates are tied to asset valuations, uh, and they're also tied to asset emissions, you know, assuming that this asset will be emitted at this rate, you know, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and so it's not only important for people to understand, you know, what the projects are they are investing in, but also, you know, where their sources of yield are coming from, like where they're actually earning this money from. Um, and, you know, I think those are just two aspects, uh, sort of like of initial offerings, especially, uh, that are really important for people to consider. That's great, Andrew. Really, uh, yeah, in terms of the research side, so what are you most excited about going forward and just kind of closing uh, insights from the, both of you to end this panel? I would say for me, uh, definitely the most exciting part uh, is that, you know, as these DeFi projects have gained this massive, you know, uptick in adoption, um, you know, the protocols have generated a lot of revenue and most of these protocols are completely open source. And a lot of this revenue gets diverted right back into the community in the form of like grants. Uh, there is so much money up for grabs right now for people 
just to fork open source repositories and build anything. Like DeFi is a sandbox for finance that, you know, is, was completely unimaginable, you know, a number of years ago. Uh, and now, you know, pretty much anything that you can think of, you have the power to create. Uh, and you can sort of stand on the shoulders of these giants uh, of DeFi that have just these millions and billions of dollars of funds that they are willing to pay out to you to fork their code or to build on top of their code and you know just create and so such cool ideas i think the coolest ideas in DeFi are yet to come uh and they're going to be built by you know people that are inspired by sort of these bigger projects that's awesome andrew Jeremy. yeah um yeah I, I definitely i think um you know DeFi is is like a booming industry right now where there's so many opportunities as andrew mentioned um there are grant funds like the, such as the balancer ecosystem fund and and various other protocols that are um you know hungry for contributions from the community whether that's like developing um some valuable like software or building something on top of you know patent balancer or or you know any other protocol um there are you know very significant grant funds available uh, for developers and also for individuals who can contribute in other ways you know crypto protocols need so many different types of um, contributions and services from different people with different skills and specialties. So like whatever it is that you do, you know, there's probably an opportunity for you um, in DeFi somewhere, which I think is so exciting, especially where, you know, we find ourselves in like a macroeconomic environment where, you know, um, wages have been stagnant. Um, jobs are, you know, unemployment is high. It's, uh, you know, harder than ever to, sort of make a good living. Um, but at the same time, there's sort of this incredible flourishing new industry with like endless opportunities to uh, do something meaningful and fulfilling and, and, and to like be compensated well. Um, another thing that like, just like a specific thing that I'm very excited about, cause like, you know, there's so much to be excited about is um, Dow, to, Dow to Dow relations. Um, which I think is a, is a new frontier that's uh, really going to grow in the future. And it's actually one of the ways that Balancer is being leveraged where um, your Balancer pools is kind of like a new experiment that's just, just in its infancy, but um, DAOs can use a Balancer pool to represent a financially, a mutual financial uh, interest or relationship between their two teams, where for example, you can have a 50-50 liquidity pool that contains the tokens from two projects and, and everyone who, you know, owns the pool tokens, as Andrew was explaining earlier in that pool is an owner in both of those projects and therefore has a, a, a mutual interest in the success of both projects. And when those two projects enter this relationship together, or whether it's, you know, certain people from those teams that enter this relationship together, they're basically committing to succeed together, to collaborate together, not to compete and to kind of, uh, create uh, more, you know, through the sum of their parts than, than you know, replicating work or, or, or trying to kind of solve the same problem simultaneously separately. I think that's can be like a huge kind of um, boon for like societal progress. Jeremy, Andrew, you know, when you, you go on Twitter and you read the news about these like competing tokens, just your collaboration and your innovation with each other is exactly what this ecosystem needs. And, and that's really what the movement's about. But want to thank the two of you. And um, I've got a lot of uh, reading material to go through now and visit DeFi Safety, DeFi Score. But uh, we're huge fans of everything that you're doing. Um, everybody will be putting links to their projects. Please follow them. They're exactly the type of innovation and people you want to be following in this space to uh, push the industry forward. So thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you both for joining. All right. Moving on to the next item in the agenda, we have Michael Wagner, the CEO at Star Atlas. Michael, welcome. Uh, he'll be presenting what he's working on. Oh, Okay. Yes. My, Michael, you look a little different today. <laughs> I tweeted him last night. I said, what avatar is Michael who going to be showing up to our conference today? <laughs> Too good, Michael. Oh, no, he's muted. 
I wonder if his voice is like. Uh, oh, there we go. Sorry, no, I do not have the uh, voice modifier at this time. But uh, <laughs> by by uh, special request, I'm here as the Ooster General from the Star Atlas Metaverse. So, it, um, you know, sincerely appreciate you guys having me on. You, you, you've uh, brought me on um, it, through a couple of opportunities now, so it's it's always great to spend some time with you. But um, yeah, since sincerely appreciate you having me on. I thought today. Okay. Um, just given the things we've spoken about in the past about Star Atlas, I might uh, take this opportunity to uh, present a little bit more about what we're doing um, across the gaming space, but really highlighting how we're introducing transformative, innovative, cutting edge features like augmented reality and virtual reality into um, the gaming uh, um, environment. And so, you know, this this filter that I'm using right now is um, it's kind of a, a fun little thing that we're doing. It's from Hey there, Ash. I saw uh, I saw him uh, message there. A uh, great fan and follower of ours. But um, yeah, I thought I would take today just to kind of highlight some of the uh, augmented reality experiential immersive uh, um, uh, experiences that we're delivering to people. So um, you know, first and foremost, let me I guess share my screen uh, just as a as a quick recap of what we're doing at Star Atlas. Uh, we are focused on. Um, creating a, a transformative experience around um, AAA gaming. So in our case, we're building out a space-themed, massively multiplayer online game and metaverse concept. Uh, we're developing this out to the highest quality standards, uh, you know, across things like storyline, content, and graphical fidelity. Um, where we see ourselves as really uh, being differentiated is uh, we are taking the AAA gaming experience and then we're enhancing that through the implementation of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And so again, just, just very high level here. Um, the game is uh, a space exploration themed, territory control, political domination, and it's all wrapped into grand strategy. But the idea is that uh, through building this on Unreal Engine uh, 4 currently and Unreal Engine 5 in the future, you will get the sense when you're exploring the stars and you're navigating this metaverse that you are legitimately there. Um, and so, you know, your avatar is just an extension of yourself. It's an alternative virtual reality that you can persist within. It. And that's, you know, that's what we care a lot about. Um, now we're able to enhance that uh, through the implementation of blockchain, uh, giving true asset ownership to players uh, by selling and distributing all assets as non-fungible tokens in the game. So everything from your uh, ships to your crew, uh, components, land that you buy, buildings and structures that you place on that land. These are all items that can be truly owned by the player and they live 100% on chain. Um, and then we further uh, um, enhance that by providing players, gamers, and uh, Atlassians, as we call them, citizens of the metaverse, uh, the ability to actually transact with one another through our NFT marketplace. And I'm going to show you all uh, just the first iteration of that marketplace in a moment here. Um, but beyond the NFTs, we also have two crypto native assets that allow for governance and, um, and Atlas, which is our in-game transactional currency. This actually is effectively the in-game gold uh, that people earn for playing. But where it is superior is there is no gatekeeping uh, from removing that currency from the game. In fact, we actually uh, uh, fully support that. And so people will be able to earn Atlas in-game uh, and then liquidate that through decentralized exchanges, centralized exchanges, convert to alternative digital currencies like Bitcoin or USDC, and have a legitimate opportunity to uh, monetize the time and energy that they commit to spending inside the metaverse. Um, yeah, and then the final piece is we also have um, a number of DeFi components that are going to be integrated across the game user interface. So things like participating in liquidity pools, uh, participating in AMMs or contributing to lending pools and otherwise optionality to um, leverage assets that you've earned to earn uh, to further earn um, uh, superior yields than you would get in any of the legacy financial system. So I think that's one of the most attractive components of DeFi today is not only is it the gamification of DeFi, but a uh, 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 finance rather, but um, the yields right now, because it is so innovative and cutting edge, are far, far superior to what you could get um, in, in a traditional bank account. So with that said, um, just wanted to jump into our NFT marketplace and, and the initial experience that people are able to engage uh, Star Atlas in. 
And so this is an application, it's a decentralized application that we've built um, on Solana and it uses Serum decentralized exchange as the core infrastructure component for us to be able to sell a digital product. Um, and in this case, the digital product is what we call a meta poster. Now these are multimedia experiences, um, which means we actually incorporate first and foremost, augmented reality onto every single poster. Once again, giving you that three-dimensional depth, the immersiveness, the sense of actually being there in the moment um, as you view the poster. And we actually couple that with audio soundscapes. Now in the first four posters, which are available now, uh, we've partnered with Blondish, we've partnered with the Bass Jackers, and we've partnered with Steve James. From, uh, he's, he's pretty popular on Audius platform. And, um, and then on top of that, we've enhanced several of the posters with a voice overlay by Jason Silva, who's a well-known futurist. Um, I would love to walk through this process with all of you. Um, given the amount of people that are probably on the call, it might be a little complicated. So um, I'm also going to just share one of the experiences, but what we've done here is, is um, really give people the first look into the Star Atlas uh, metaverse uh, through this 14 poster sale, which takes place over 14 weeks. People are able to one, capture a moment in time, a, a uh, kind of a historical reference to the innovation that we're all participating in right now through these digital marketplaces, through NFTs, through true asset ownership. Um, and then, you know, again, just innovation and in how the content is delivered to the user. Um, so I have a video for poster four, which was quite popular on social media recently. I'm just going to pull that up and share it quickly. And then I'll walk you through how you can view all of these yourself. Let's see. I don't think you'll be able to hear the sound, but what you know, uh, what I want to capture here is the images start as a still image. You go through a process of scanning a QR code, which allows you to pull this up in either Facebook or Instagram. Currently, uh, it is important that you have both of those applications updated if you're going to uh, uh, be able to access the experience. But I'll just show you. This is actually somebody else in our community that that uh, um, posted this online. So that's just a, a quick sense of what we're capable of delivering here. We have, you know, we're, we're actually tying a lot of this back into the real world as well. If you're going to be in Miami for the Miami Bitcoin conference, we have life-size uh, augmented reality experiences that people will be viewing um, and, and able to interact with, take videos of, um, uh, take pictures with, and hopefully create some virality. So if you wanna check any of this out yourself, you can go to play.staratlas.com you can get a sense of what our economic model is behind the poster release. Um, and uh, if you have a digital wallet, again, we're built on Solana. If you have an integrated digital wallet, then you're actually able to purchase these purely on chain, see all of the transaction history um, on the Solana blockchain. Michael, thank you for sharing all of this. And every time, every time we chat, you can see, you know, you're getting closer and closer to building that metaverse. Um, one of the comments that, uh, from Kyle making ready player one, a real deal. Awesome. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, uh, we hear that a lot. Uh, <clears throat> that's part of the goal with the exception of we're not, uh, interested in a dystopian future. We actually want to, you know, create a better future where people continue to interact with reality, but yes, I mean, in many ways, creating kind of the economic governance and social, uh, systems that allow people to live in a virtual world. That is, uh, that is kind of the vision. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for sharing with the community here. Um, and uh, if everybody has any questions, definitely check it out at staratlas.com. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Always appreciate right. you having me on. Yep. All right. All right. Up next, we have uh, Mark Palomba, uh, founder at Delta Core Capital, presenting. So let's welcome Mark to the stage. You have 10 minutes to present your project. Excited to see what you're going to share or what you're working on. Mark, welcome. 
Welcome. Thank you for uh, having me. Yep. Yep. So you have uh, 10 minutes. I'll let you know at the one minute mark, but you can go ahead and share the screen and make your introduction, share what you're working on with everybody here. Okay. Yeah. In short, my name is Mark Palomba. I'm the chief investment officer and founder for Delta Core Capital. We are a hedge fund uh, focused solely in digital assets. Um, been personally in finance for well over a decade, as far as in crypto since uh, 2017. And let's see if uh, I can go ahead and share my screen. So as far as with uh, Delta Core Capital, you know, our, uh, our mission statement was to be able to create life-changing financial opportunities and take the unaccredited and credited. And what of a, you know, this is an incredible opportunity that's happening with crypto um, and just the technology that's just changing the way that we, uh, we do finance, we interact um, on a global state. And, um, you know, our goal was to really um, be able to help facilitate that and facilitate that for uh, some of the people that might not uh, know how to. Uh, or have the time to, or the skill or the knowledge. You know, we're in a market that is open 24-7 uh, and uh, one of the most um, volatile as well. And so uh, be able to also offer uh, the ability of true hedging um, and take off, uh, you know, some of that risk. So as far as with um, crypto and blockchain, as most of you guys already know, um, you know, this market has pretty much outperformed any other asset class uh, for well over the past five to seven years um, and just creating new and new opportunities. And even with, um, you know, revolving around the, the four year cycle of the having, um, you know, we're entering a year that is opportunities are just um, exponentially growing and not to mention throwing on the t what's happening with uh, the, the federal balance sheet of them just printing more money. Um, so a lot of people are looking for another place for a store of value, uh, other assets um, outside of uh, outside of gold, outside of stocks, and um, per, you know compared to everything else, um, you know, crypto is finding yourself more and more to be that uh, that, that solution for that. As far as um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, you know this recent pullback within Bitcoin and everything like that, um, and for the people that aren't familiar with the stock to flow model, this is a, a graph representing it. That uh, as far as with stock to flow. Basically, it's a, a financial model that's used to correlate between um, the supply of an asset and the uh, demand price for an asset. And so when uh, comparing using that on Bitcoin, it's actually found an incredibly uh, high correlation to it, in which case um, we're still continually uh, showing that um, this is only just the beginning of this year's bull run. And so as far as with Delta Core, you know, we wanted to be able to offer that opportunity to be able to not only have um, people that are working full times that don't have uh, the knowledge or full research team to be able to invest in this space and still feel comfortable that they have a full time team uh, being able to manage that. You know, as far as um, our investment strategies, we're running about eight different investment strategies, not all at the same time, but they all kind of serve their own purpose. And a lot of them kind of uh, complement each other, especially when it comes down to risk management. Um, ideally, we're not trying to shoot the moon as a fund. Uh, we're trying to capture as much of this bull run with the least amount of risk along the way. And that's led us to, um, we've act led us to outperforming the overall market, the overall um, growth of Bitcoin. Um, we've actually received multiple awards for not only Barclays hedge for our performance, but also have ranked, um, gotten accolades for our uh, overall rankings uh, and performance for the past 12 months as well. Um, in short, I mean, I'm here to help, you know, um, our, our value bring is really, um, to be able to bring this market to everyday and, you know, normal investor and mature this market in a way that it's not, um, it's not, it's becoming less volatile. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. You're getting a lot of compliments on that background you got there. Thanks. So, um, we, uh, our, our, our entire office is kind of this theme. So it kind of gives a nice little, uh, touch to everything. So you see things from a really, you know, unique perspective. Um, yeah. Are there any insights that you like to share that, you know, you, you might see with all your, you know, strategies and 
Um, what are you seeing on, on the market in the coming you know, few months to a year? I mean, overall, we're going to end up seeing this market um, continue a bull run um, into next year, probably. You know, the market pullback that we actually just got uh, was well overdue. And it was actually, if you line it up with every previous cycle, uh, should have actually happened um, about a couple months ago. And so that's just proving that every market cycle adds about another 90 to 100 days onto the cycle. And so um, this bull run uh, might actually last even into the beginning of uh, the uh, next year, but just goes to show that, um, you know, this market's, um, this market's just getting started. Mark, are you a believer in the super cycle for Bitcoin and commodities and uh, just your overall thesis on what's going on? I am, uh, although I tell my guys all the time, um, you know, my job is not to predict the future. My job is to be prepared for every scenario. And so uh, we trade what we see, not what we think, but uh, I am a, um, a, a believer in this will be uh, a perfect storm of a super cycle this year. Very nice. And I'll read off some questions from the chat. Uh, obviously one of the hottest topics right now is investing in crypto and, you know, just disclaimer, you know, now this is to be construed as uh, financial advice, but you know, any info on the super having from Andres? Referring to uh, this year? Um, yes. So our projections uh, for this year are extremely strong. And, you know, even when, um, you know, we're referring to a stock to flow model, um, that's really just kind of um, tackling the digital scarcity side of things. That doesn't even uh, tackle the increased demand that is uh, we're seeing over and over again. And so, um, you know, this, uh, this cycle is probably going to be possibly one of our strongest uh, that we end up seeing, um, especially just because of um, the, the super, you know, the, um, I guess the perfect storm from all the fronts. That's great. Mark, uh, there's just so many investment questions and I think you'd be the perfect person to, uh, um, you know, provide insights on this. Do you think there's an inflation coming post pandemic? Uh, will it be a repeat of 2017 BTC dropping around 35,000 to 38,000 this year? Uh, I do think we will see uh, another pullback in 2022. Um, I don't think it'll necessarily be shared the same across the entire market because I think at that point in time, um, institutional adoption will start coming in and start propping up certain assets. And then you'll start seeing a lot of, um, you know, these small, small cap, um, you know, uh, meme coins that have no value kind of uh, dissipate with that. Interesting. And I know in our keynote, Mark Yusko was uh, extremely excited about the protocols, the replacements to TCP IP, HTTP, WW. Uh, what are some of the, you know, projects that you're most excited about uh, in this space right now from a you know what, there's, um, there's a lot of them, uh, especially everything that's in uh, DeFi. Um, I'd say some of the newer ones that um, we're really focused on is, uh, are really interested in is uh, Matic. Um, and even there was a, a quick swap that was, um, that's uh, built around uh, Matic that's using the uh, Uniswap code. Um, it's really interesting, especially some of these um, on how it's like, coming to scalability and uh, you know, use case and uh, even fees and stuff. But um, you know, I, I'm thinking that we're getting um, and we're going to see a lot more uh, interesting projects uh, come up uh, more and more. Very nice. Oh, this is a good one. How far are we from moving from a speculation based market to a demand based market, uh, specifically for Ethereum? When will fundamentals start kicking in again? <laughs> so I think um, I think. Honestly, I, I still think this bull cycle will be um, early adopters. You know, I think um, not until the next cycle will we really start seeing um, once institutions open up, that's when um, an incredible demand for uh, a, a need for some of these technologies. Very nice. And um, what are you seeing right now from that institutional demand side, traditional asset managers, how you know aggressive are they planning on getting into the space? How immediate, you know, their allocation size? What are you hearing? I guess on the, um, you know, uh, 
a massive demand, especially in the past week and so, um, with the recent pullback in Bitcoin, some of the market uh, across family offices, when you're talking about generational wealth um, that are accumulating and not for, um, you know, not for the day to day transactions or, you know, following the daily price movement or anything like that, but for uh, generational wealth. And that's when you start seeing um, that support that's uh, long lasting. Very nice. Thank you, Mark. You have a lot of Thanks. questions in the Zoom chat. <laughs> I think you got you guys, uh, 10 three, more three, just yeah. now. <laughs> but um, yeah, definitely stick around. See if you can answer them in the chat. You're pretty popular here. So thank you, Mark, for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Mark. All right. Moving on to our next uh, project is Pradeep. Pradeep Goal from SolveCare. Uh, excited to learn more about your project. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to write it into the Zoom chat. I know we have had a lot of great speakers. Uh, many of them are sticking around to answer questions. So make sure you just uh, write it into the chat, Zoom chat here, and everybody will answer it as they come in. Pradeep, welcome. Thank you, Ivan. Very nice right. to be here. Yep, yep. So excited to learn more about your project. You have 10 minutes. I'll give you a warning at the one minute mark, but take it away. Sure. Great. So I think we're going to talk a little bit about one of the more complex industries that is trying to implement blockchain and uh, represents a huge opportunity, a real use case for blockchain. And that's what SolveCare is doing. So I'll give you a bit of an introduction to what we are doing and invite the community to, to take up the opportunity. Um, very quick summary uh, for those of you who are not familiar with healthcare. Healthcare is about a $9 trillion a year problem in terms of a global spend about 4 trillion in the US, the rest worldwide. And if you look at the math, uh, of course we spend a big chunk on hospitals and pharmacy, 1. 1,100 billion on hospitals in the US each year, 380 billion on prescription drugs. But what's really interesting is that there's another 1,300 billion a year we spend, which is the largest single category, not on healthcare, but on administration of healthcare, primarily healthcare payments. And that's where a blockchain use case really lies. And there is an enormous opportunity that I want to bring to everyone's attention. And that includes healthcare financing and, and potential opportunities for DeFi as well. So healthcare is complex. It is a multi-party sport. Healthcare is never a vendor's you know, consumer relationship. It's a multi-party function. And there is a real lack of trust between parties, insurer, doctor, patient, family members, specialist. Uh, we want to trust our doctor, but the healthcare system is adversarial. And given the regulations that exist in each country around data sharing and the local laws, it becomes incredibly difficult. In healthcare, payments tend to be multi-party payments too, patient to doctor payment, patient to specialist payment, payer to doctor, meaning insurance company of government to doctor, payer to patient, employer to payer. Lots of parties pay each other and they all use their own set standalone systems, which makes it very hard to collaborate and coordinate. So it's right for decentralization and tokenization. I have spent my whole career in healthcare, so I know this inside and out. So what we did at SolveCare is to build a full stack healthcare platform that uses blockchain as a coordination fabric that allows different roles to interact with each other without revealing their identity or giving up control of their data. So everyone essentially can play a sovereign role, but still have the meaningful interaction in a coordinated fashion with each other. So that's how we use blockchain in our platform. And the objective is to tokenize identity, consents, transaction payments, and data ownership. If you do one or two of the five, you're not gonna get healthcare adoption. So we decided to tackle the big problem of doing all five, uh, identity tokenization, consent tokenization, trans healthcare transaction, tokenization, obviously payments, and data inter ownership and data interoperability. And the way we do that is we use a, a event ledger, which allows the events to be exchanged without exchanging the identity. Identity is locked in the wallet, but the events are shareable on the, on the care event ledger, which then allows different role nodes to act upon those events differently. So a doctor role node and a patient role node can read the same event ledger and do very different things with it. And that allows enormous configurability without having to sacrifice data ownership and sovereignty. Uh, at a more micro level, for example, if a patient is trying to make an appointment on our blockchain ledger, 
they'll put out a request, an event re a request on the ledger, which every doctor node can pick up and those who qualify or are available can respond to. And that event can then be picked up at the same time by the insurance company, which can authorize payment by issuing a digital token to the patient's wallet. So this allows for a significant streamlining of uh, healthcare events. And this is not theoretical. We have implemented some very compelling digital health networks already on the platform. The other element that we feel is very important is that you gotta make blockchain visual. Uh, human beings cannot interact with technology unless they have a visual interface to that technology. So in the case of healthcare, that's really important. So we are, uh, we implemented a standardized application called Care Wallet, which interacts with the event ledger and shows the events with uh, human understandable care cards, which allows you to essentially work with any event, but in humanize and make it actionable and transforms it into something that you can use in real life. The target audience is my mother or my daughter. If they can interact with the blockchain properly, they're not going to use it and they're not going to become blockchain experts either. So in all of this, what we are really able to do is to address some really complex problems like managing, coordinating diabetes care or dealing with mental health and suicide prevention or facilitating payments between doctors and patients or allowing insurance companies to issue proper benefits to their members without becoming the police cop between them and the doctor. Hundreds of use cases practically, many of them we have implemented, but the real idea is to empower the community and developers worldwide start implementing their own digital health networks in their community or in their country. So our vision is that in healthcare, 1.3 trillion is wasted each year just in the US alone. If you exclude all the payments from doctors and hospitals and pharmacies, we spend $1.3 trillion not delivering healthcare, but administering it. And that's absurd. The similar amount of money is being wasted around the world. So even if you simply stripped out that cost um, by allowing people to uh, maintain their identity and sovereignty, and publishing their events in a de-identifiable manner that allows proper care coordination, proper benefit and payment coordination, we could take a lot of the cash and redeploy it to actually making healthcare work better. So with that said, we have um, built a platform around our SOLVE token, which serves five different purposes. It works as a gas token for each event. You can put a price on each care event um, there is an interoperability token function where it allows data exchange. It's an earnings token for those who publish their services on the care marketplace. It's a payment token for doctor patient payments. And it's a staking token for the upcoming DeFi solution that we are connecting to the Solve platform. And what we are working with today is a variety of, of uh, large clients and partners. But what we really focus on now is to make the platform available to those people who want to transform healthcare, those who, have, those, who have, those who have a stake in the healthcare delivery, be it the device manufacturers or consulting firms or physicians and pharmacists who wanna run their own care networks, insurance companies that wanna launch benefit networks, government agencies that wanna launch population health networks, DeFi developers that wanna maybe do healthcare financing for devices and so, so deep. on. We're in our final one minute. All right, so I'm actually gonna stop and see if there are any questions. And I'm gonna end by saying that to the development community and to the crypto community. Healthcare is a challenging field, but we have done a lot to make it accessible to a tech innovator, to a DeFi or a blockchain developer to actually use our platform to build very compelling, usable real world solutions. And we welcome your questions and comments. Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, you're already getting some questions in the Zoom chat from Christian uh, came here. Something about personal identified and da identifiable data. So make sure to answer them in the Zoom chat. Uh, sure. We're going to move on to our next uh, item on the agenda. So thank you, Pradeep. Thank you for presenting. Thanks, Pradeep. Pradeep. That was good. All right. So let's welcome the next panelists. Our topic is a hotly debated one, um, and actually a lot of buzz. Jeremiah, welcome. A lot of buzz around this uh, do these two keywords. So social tokens uh, and NFTs. We have Jeremiah from founder at Kaleido Insights. We have Benjamin Leff, the COO at Shisha Finance. We have Bruno, technical educator at Web3 Foundation. Uh, and Nathan, 
Liam, founder at CryptoNut. So welcome everyone. Test, test, test. Benjamin, I see you now. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Wonderful. Jeremiah, I can see that background that you shared in your <laughs> the Airstream uh, How's it going? studio. Good, good. Bruno. Hey there. Welcome, welcome. All hey right. Good to see you guys. This is one of the most popular and sexy topics out there, social tokens and NFTs. I feel like everyone's, it's hit peak mainstream media. And uh, all of you, thank you for coming Um to this panel, maybe if we can start off, uh, Benjamin, uh, I know that you've been in the NFT space for quite some time, but if you can give an introduction uh, just for those who are hearing about NFTs for the first time, just what it is, what's going on in the industry, and we can start from there. Sure. So I've been in the industry since 2015, but as it relates specifically to NFTs or non-fungible tokens, as most of you all know, um, I began, I uh, purchased my first one in 2017, not even knowing what it was, using it to uh, help me play a game. I was playing on the blockchain. I, I began doing a lot of uh, deep dive and, and research into NFTs in 2018, 2019, and realized the a tremendous amount of use cases that NFTs have, not just for things like provenance and art and, and legacy items like that, but to really work in the DeFi space as well by collateralizing assets and putting them on chain as NFTs and some really amazing things that have been done in the space, um, not only from an artistic aspect, but also financial and social good aspect as well. They're a really tremendous um, topic, obviously, uh, because of the gravitas that they carry. NFTs can be everything from IP ownership to music videos, to simply your favorite memories in life that you choose to digitize and, and, and keep forever. So that's a, that's a little bit of a high level discussion or theory on my, my thoughts on NFTs. And I'm, I'm really excited to go a deep dive with the rest of you all about them. Thanks, Benjamin. And I, I know one of the, the comparisons that many of you have been having on that uh, email thread before this event was, uh, NFTs, art Legos with limitless possibilities. So I thought that was really appropriate. And as we kind of dive into uh, unpacking what's going on with social tokens and NFTs. Absolutely. Bruno, I would love to hear your insights next on NFTs. And I know, uh, you know, going from phase one is that we saw, but also what the future is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a similar history to Benjamin. I, I joined like Ethereum in the ICO, but I had my first exposure to NFTs with the CryptoKitties craze and um, didn't really let go since. But uh, I, I kind of came to realize that NFTs can be much more than just uh, things that gather digital dust. So um, I, I figured this art Lego uh, concept was was worth exploring. And so I think that the future of NFTs is much richer than just, uh, you know, celebrities uh, making their own tokens and selling them to fans, which is all the rage now, or, or just generally, um, just generally turning them into, into passes and into, into art. It, that's all very cool, but, um, you know, it's, it's quite the untapped potential there. Um, so what I see is something from like, there's, there's a system we built called, called Remark, which will let you compose these uh, aspects of NFTs, like uh, NFTs owning other NFTs, NFTs changing the appearance of other NFTs based on what they, which NFT they own, uh, NFTs being automatically fractionalized into shareholder tokens so that uh, people can democratically issue commands to these NFTs, NFTs with multiple resources at once, a whole bunch of these uh, upgraded things that no other platform has right now. And when you put all that together, you get this, um, you get this kind of transformers robot of, um, of infinitely complex NFT ecosystems. Like for example, imagine a metaverse, an NFT universe where you have uh, lots of land uh, like um, expressed as NFTs. So you buy an NFT, you own an NFT, that's fine. We, ha we have that today. But then you imagine a 3D billboard model as an NFT. And so it has multiple resources. It has a 3D model of the billboard. It has a 2D representation, and it also has shareholder tokens so people can govern that billboard. Now you send that billboard as an NFT 
to the NFT of the land. So the land now owns the NFT of the billboard and the land can equip the billboard. And so the billboard goes up in the metaverse. And now let's imagine that's a really popular virtual reality crossroads and corporations are really interested in putting their ad up there. And so what you get is corporations come into this metaverse and they mint another NFT, which is basically a texture for this ad. And so now they have to charm the token holders of this billboard whose ad they're going to display on this billboard. So now Nike is going to be showering you with, with shoes and Pepsi is going to be showering you with sodas just to get their, their ad displayed up on that, on that billboard. And so NFTs let you kind of have this community governed virtual real estate um, that, that kind of removes the middleman and gives all the profit to the people who are actually governing uh, the, the entire system they, they live in. Um, so this, this, this kind of stuff really excites me. These art Legos that you can put together and get like infinite complexity out of it. You know, that's, that's awesome. And I know we're going to have some interesting speakers later that are building those metaverses where those digital billboards are, uh, Jeremiah, you have any, uh, Nathan, you guys have any insights to, to that? I'm happy to go next. So I'm focused on the social token space. I'm an advisor to rally. I also have my own social token, the JAO coin, so I'm well-versed in this. Um, oh, about 15 years ago, I was one of the early pioneers of, of tracking the social media space. And, and 20 years ago, if I told people that you would be your own entity, your own media entity, and you could publish your thoughts and ideas, people were like, who cares? Who wants to see that? It doesn't make any sense. And here we are 20 years later, and we're talking to creators, people who create content, whether they be celebrities, YouTubers, Twitch stars, athletes, musicians, Hollywood uh, folks, and that they themselves, they've all adopted social media. But the next phase is to adopt a social token. And the main reason is to build an economy around your community, building an economy around your community. And this can be used in a number of ways. Um, at Rally, we use this to create private Discord communities for top fans of a band called Portugal The Man. We also have a famous DJ uh, called Jaws, and he allows his fans to vote up the favorite songs that he might include in his, in his next album, but you have to be a token holder of his coin to purchase it. We also have uh, the Lion King star. Um, she came on board and she launched the cat coin and fans can get a poster from her by purchasing the coin and which helps to support her big cat foundation. And so in all of those examples, these creators are now building economies. And notice carefully, I never used the word blockchain or crypto. I never said crypto or blockchain because that's that will kill a conversation when you talk to normal people. So if you can talk about this space without using crypto or blockchain, it means you can probably convince others. So that's the social token space. Rally is helping creators build economies around their communities. Thanks. Cool. Uh, so I can jump off of that. And uh, I do agree with Jeremiah that I also don't say crypto or blockchain uh, when talking to um, most people about it. I just say emerging tech um, just because that's what it is. And um, but yeah, I'm really happy to be here. My name is Nathan. Um, yeah. Uh, so about NFTs, I I hopped on the train a little bit late. I feel like all the speakers here have been in since like pre Ethereum and, and you guys have like a vast amount of knowledge. Um, so I heard about it back in 2017 when CryptoKitties also came out and I thought that was really exciting. So for the NFT work that I've been doing lately, it's kind of like a double edged sword of that's what I'm learning. Um, so I got the chance to interview Akon. Uh, I got the chance to interview the guy from One Republic, the main singer, uh, Ryan Tedder, and uh, this EDM group uh, called base jackers and they all started their nfts and i mean they sold it for a lot of money and so the double-edged sword here that i'm learning is like one is like if you're a celebrity and you want to get into nfts yes you can help bring it into the mainstream uh which is kind of important right for all of us who want adoption but the other side is that a lot of the artists unknown artists are having a tough time getting their art out there they feel like they're not being seen and they feel like it's unfair because you know, if you're a celebrity with a ton of clout already, you have millions of followers, you're very easy to kind of take advantage of the situation and, and leverage it. So that's what I'm seeing with the NFTs and, and with social media. And so it's kind of interesting to see how we got here. I, I never expected it to blow up like it did um, as it is now. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that's that's just uh, my thoughts on it. And I, I'm really excited to hear what you guys think and wh where it's going to go. 
Yeah, adoption in the mainstream, Nathan, I know that you have a YouTube channel. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, demand for content being created um, and just bringing it into the limelight. Uh, so yeah, on the social token side, uh, Jeremiah and you being an advisor to Rally, um, yeah, adoption, how, how do you see things playing out going forward now with social tokens? Maybe I'll take that first. Uh, right now, Rally's rolled out a, a number of creator coins, about 126 creator coins. There's been about 5,000 applicants. So we're just being careful that there's enough presence of the, the creator and they also have a business use case. This is a utility token. It is not a commodity. It's not for speculative buying. We're actually using it. I, I gave you those e-commerce examples or uh, perks that the creators use. So we're, we're just carefully rolling that, that out. And, um, however, for many of the fans um, and creators too, this is the first time that they've ever actually owned a quote cryptocurrency. I'm using the word now. Uh, this is where we're, we're trying to reach into the mainstream. Uh, we're trying to go to general media, general um, celebrities, fans of sporting goods. And so we're going to see the adoption. Um, this is a uh, it, rally is a decentralized project where 70% of the tokens are owned by the community and fans. And we did vote on a marketing campaign that is being led by the former uh, go to market of Patreon, uh, Brendan Morris, who's now at rally. And so a $9 million marketing campaign is, is lifting right now for rally. And we're also clinching some celebrities to onboard right now. So we'll, we'll be hearing a lot more about creator coins and those celebrities. Rally, the brand itself might be in the background. It might be the celebrities that are leading forward their own coin. You know, you just, you have to look under the covers to see what platform is providing it. So by, by fall, I believe that creator coins in the social media space will be very mainstream, perhaps as popular as, as NFTs today. Nice. Bruno, I, I know that there's a lot of features for NFTs that can be done. What, what is that biggest use case that you're seeing for, from a creator standpoint or any of these celebrities? I know we have Akon or Acoin joining later on. Uh, yeah, I Acon. think... Um, yeah, I think Jeremiah is 100% correct in saying that these, these are going to be like the, the default, the standard. Um, there's no, there's no getting, getting around it. Uh, we're going to be so used to creator coins, like they're going to be the new loyalty cards, basically. Mm -hmm. you, you don't like, there, there's, you know, like you, you will, <laughs> you'll, ex you'll expect, you'll be surprised if a creator doesn't have a coin. Um, because it's it's really the natural progression to eliminating the middlemen that have governed their careers so far, and also that have governed our access to their careers and their work so far. So I think um, all of this will naturally progress to a, to a more um, audience-owned creator uh, ecosystem and uh, audience-incentivized uh, creator ecosystem where creators can finally make money on what they do without having to, you know, drag it, drag it through multiple layers um, that skim off the top um, and and leave you leave you dry at the end. So uh, this is this is really this is something that's really really exciting. Um, one of the biggest hurdles that you have to go through here, and not I mean not talking about blockchain while talking about blockchain is definitely a, a good a good uh, first step, but you have to maximize the UX so hard that. Yeah, like nobody knows that they're writing entries into MySQL when they're, when they're using Facebook today. They do not have to know that they're using the blockchain when they're using creator tokens later. Um, however, the problem there is that this opens the, the ground to a lot of posers, to a lot of fake projects, to a lot of project, projects that will just you know swoop in, uh, say that they're, they have creator tokens and basically they'll just be more middlemen in disguise. Um, so this is a really tricky balance to achieve here, where people will feel confident using these tokens, and um, maybe they won't, you know, maybe they won't need to read the smart contracts per se, like we who understand them do, uh, when we want to check how safe a contract, how safe a token is. But they will at least need to know that, you know, their tokens are safe and their creators prefer this approach rather than that this this approach was hijacked uh, by by yet another middleman in a costume. Um, so I think this hurdle is going to be the most difficult one. And of course, we have the, the absolute nightmare of having to uh, have a, a, a blockchain's native token in order to interact with that blockchain. So now the first, the first project that successfully solves this without having to make centralized, super centralized trade-offs 
uh, will be the one that wins long term. You can, of course, deploy sponsored transactions on your server, cover the first few transaction costs for your users, whatever else you need to get that user acquisition. And oftentimes that first user acquisition wave will put you like at a, at a significant first mover advantage uh, to disadvantage your, your, your competitors. But uh, when we consider the, you know, like it's just going to be history repeating itself if we go down that route. So I think projects will have a very hard task on balancing UX and decentralization uh, while at the same time remaining very, very appealing to both creators and users. And I think that's, that's the next challenge to solve because the technology is there, but UX isn't. I want to jump in just that, uh, you know, normally I like to play devil's advocate, but uh, I hate to say that it sounds like we're all on the same side here with regards to social tokens and creator tokens. One thing we were talking about from a utility standpoint, uh, and Bruno brought it up, I saw Jeremiah gave us thumbs up, it really does provide a loyalty uh, type experience. And it also helps create a, a user base or a fan base, for example, uh, I purchase and collect uh, NFTs from a specific artist by the name of Vesa. And uh, when uh, you purchase a piece, sometimes, depending on what you purchase, he will give you some social tokens, which gives you access to the artist, discounts on for future purchases, things of that nature, really creating a, a reward system and uh, an ecosystem for me to come back and engage. And then for all the people, and I know this is in a, in a later talk, that are building these beautiful metaverses out there, it's, it's great to be able to go in and you can use your social token like you would at an arcade and, and have access to, to what otherwise would be, would be something that uh, people would miss out on, something very exclusive. I'd like to just build on uh, Bruno's and Benjamin's excellent points. Another benefit of social tokens is that it's programmable money. Programmable money, I gave some examples of you can, uh, we're seeing creatives are integrating this into their websites or apps where when, when a coin holder of the audience or fan base, when they own the coin, they can use it to access new features. For example, we had one creator from um, Clubhouse, he created a, a jukebox. So when anybody would tip him, it would play a sound in that room. And I already talked about the DJ allowed folks to vote uh, up different things. So we can integrate this into unique experiences where the more coins that you have, the better fan experience that you have, just in the same way we're seeing NFTs that are gonna be used as conference tickets. And the last point is there's actually financial benefits as well. So every Saturday, Rally uh, has a dividend called the Rally Rewards that are issued to all coin holders. And if a coin is performing successfully, they are issued rally tokens. Um, I own the tokens of many creators um, in, within the rally. And last Saturday, I uh, received 3000 rally tokens. They're all valued at about a dollar. So that's $3,000 of coin flow versus cash flow. That's the term we use now. Uh, so there are financial benefits of backing the creators and accessing those. So I just wanted to add that perspective. So mainstream adoption, and I, I like how you said it oh, well, Bruno, in terms of nailing that UX, do you actually think it's going to be the incumbents that are going, uh, you know, eBay's launching an NFT now, or do you think it's these newer startups? Who's going to create that Shopify where it's so easy to launch your own social token NFTs? And I don't know, what do you um, see? I think it's going to be social networks. And yes, they, it's going to be a, a nasty race. It's going to be a bloody race. Uh, even right now, just, just an hour ago or so, um, the first stories began to leak, still to be verified though, that Instagram is reaching out to artists on consulting gigs uh, about launching an NFT platform. Um, and they're asking people to sign an NDA. And so uh, people are understandably upset about it because Instagram has not been entirely, um, you know, like honest or beneficial to artists very much in terms of income and so on. So some of them just decided to instead go, go public with this information, which is uh, developing into a very interesting story, which I think we'll, we'll know much more about within like 12 hours or something. So um, who's going to do it? It's going to be the social networks that, that own the place today. Um, they will be the first ones to try this, but again, they have the UX, but they will be entirely centralized. And so this is the trade-off that we're going to have to sell really, really hard to the casual users that we want to actually convert over to our place, because to them, uh, decentralization doesn't matter until it matters. 
So uh, until they're still on the platform, while they're still on the platform, they have no idea that they can lose it. And when they lose it, it's too late because they don't know where to find out that they can't lose it. Um, so it's really, really important to educate them early, to get them over early and to start taking users away from these platforms while they're still uh, in their infancy or even in, the, in an earlier stage. Because when they get started, it's not gonna be an easy fight um, and they're not gonna go down easily. Like that, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of middleman money to give up. So you can expect a, a, whole, a whole bloody battle about this. Like you can see the, the Epic Store versus Apple Store um, Epic Games versus Apple Store uh, lawsuit that's that's currently going on. That's been going on for six months, and that's going to be a multi-dozen million dollar lawsuit just about App Store fees. So this stuff is going to be way more way more serious. Mm -hmm. Same thing in the social token space. The social networks and platforms will do the same. You know, Reddit with their kudos points that that seems very likely that that could become a social token. Anywhere we see reputation points, likes can become social tokens on Facebook. So um, I think we'll see that replication happen. Um, it's not just about the creators making the choice; it's about the fans. You know, are they going to back? Do they think of, about the world in a decentralized way, or are they just going to go with with whatever's convenient? And unfortunately, it's usually just whatever's convenient. And just one of the beautiful things to kind of tie all this together here, because we also are here to talk about NFTs as well, is that they're not mutually exclusive. Social tokens themselves, I think Bruno said it best earlier, you can have an NFT inside an NFT. Uh, social tokens can be associated with specific NFTs and utilized, again, like I said, as reward systems to claim NFTs, things of that nature. So it's all about building that ecosystem. And, 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 and do you really believe in decentralization? Do you really believe in what you're backing? And if you do, are you willing to provide social tokens behind that? Uh, as, as you said, as, as uh, Jeremiah said, it's kind of coin flow or coin backing um, to ensure that the artist or the content creator, let's say, that you're supporting gets uh, your full support by way of social tokens. So they're not mutually exclusive. And I see a lot of synergies in the future between NFT ownership and uh, influence over that via social tokens. We agree, Benjamin. Social tokens should be used to purchase NFT regardless on NFTs on regardless of whatever platform they're on. So we want to see that exchange happen. I agree with you. Absolutely. Nathan, you're a content creator. You have 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. I mean, for you coming into the space, what would you choose, uh, I guess? Uh, I think what Bruno said is, it resonates with me very well. It's, the, it's all about the UX. It's, I'm all about UI UX, just because our audience as well, they, they're they mostly from a non-technical and a non-crypto background. So we're trying, to, our channel is more of like a, like a Sesame Street or Magic School Bus, or you know, just like a Disney cartoony, way to explain crypto and so i think for most of our audience in our community is we want it to be easy for anyone so if anyone could just literally you know one click one stop shop and it sets it up for them all the way through then they'll be able to you know really get involved and what i've learned is it doesn't really matter what i think it, it's it's all about the community um if the community doesn't support the project there there is no project at the end of the day and and i'm learning that you know I'm, I'm learning firsthand how powerful community really is. I didn't really understand that, you know, in the past, but seeing what's happening with Dogecoin and SafeMoon and, and all of these other community projects and, and just how money works in general, right? It's if people believe that something has value, then it has value. So I'm trying to take a different stance on things and just really focus on uh, the groups of people, the supporters and, and the community itself. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> That was great. If anyone has any uh, feedback, uh, we have the final five minutes of this panel and just uh, closing thoughts, insights from all of you. I, I, think, I, think, I think, go yeah, ahead, Bruno. Okay. Uh, I think it's going to be really inter interesting to also see the, the scaling battle uh, because these incumbents with the centralized infrastructures will have a distinct advantage there in that they can run everything on their servers and it's going to be very smooth, transactionless. Um, but it's gonna be displayed as tokens. It's gonna to be presented to people as something that they want from the crypto space, but they don't know they want. And they don't know how it works on our side of the, uh, of the pond. Um, and, and then you have um, blockchains, which are either too popular for their own good, like Ethereum, where a single transaction will cost you $100, or those that have absolutely no users at all. And so they 
simply haven't even thought about scaling yet because they never had scaling problems. So when people say that, you know, minting on uh, Tezos is cheap, yes, it is because nobody's using it right now. And if it gets the amount of users that Ethereum has, it's going to have the exact same problems, only they haven't really thought about scaling yet. Um, so these, these other chains are, are, are a few years behind, and this is going to be an interesting battle to also um, see, uh, you know, play out because these platforms are not going to have a lot of time to innovate when they hit these scaling walls. People are going to leave and they, they're going to leave to for other platforms. This is one of the reasons why I'm excited to work on Polkadot and, and Kusama, which are just chains that connect other chains so that we get scalability through connectivity uh, rather than trying to scale one platform and be the you know one silver bullet for every, every single problem. But I, I think that's going to be also a very, very interesting, um, very interesting, you know, like situation to see to see resolved. So just two things on my end uh, before I forget. So, so Bruno, I definitely agree. You know, we don't need any more verticals in the space. We need, we need things to start coming together and, and have a, a truly blockchain agnostic ecosystem in order for, for mass adoption, which brings me to point number two, which, which Nathan said, um, and you know, I've been around since the ICO days and, and, and it really doesn't seem to matter what, what project it is. But again, with, without a community, without a following, you have no project. It, it's it's really about the community's needs. We're seeing more and more DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, come into play. We're seeing a lot more usage of these to social tokens and content tokens, as Jeremiah rightly pointed out, to drive projects and to develop you know the best content from a I would say fan based curated collection and set of things. And it all comes down to mass adoption and belief in your community. And, and, and our ethos at Shisha Finance is, uh, specifically is transparency and integrity in all that we do. So I, I believe that that's something that blockchain in and of itself, most people will stand for. And it is, it is quite, quite necessary uh, for us to move on and, 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 and really get to that mass adoption phase. Thanks, Benjamin, Jeremiah, Nathan. Uh, my points are that everywhere we see social media and social networking, we want to see the infusion of social tokens as a form of showing loyalty and engagement and fandom when creators create content, as well as the community. And um, whether it's decentralized, hopefully it will be as well, or centralized, I think we'll see this fluidity between both. Um, creator coins and social tokens will be the, the relationship uh, between them. So it'll be interesting to see this creator economy come to life. And a big part of the revenue should be from them owning their own destiny. And these tools can help them. Thanks a lot. Yep, and just piggybacking off that, I, I want to reach out to all the panelists and the attendees here. Um, you know, great panel. Uh, had a lot of fun talking to you guys. If if you guys want to reach out and you know connect with us, um, you know, follow all the speakers here and the and the host. Thanks to Ivan and Jeffrey, of course. And um, yeah, I mean, I I really want to get to know the community more. I, I I'm pretty swamped right now, but I, I I would love to take the time to just get to know everybody, just because I feel like everyone's opinion has just been able to kind of shape my worldview and and I think I'm, I'm learning that I really don't know as much as I think I know and and anybody's opinion would be very appreciated just because you know we're, we're all different people right and and so the best way for me to grow and learn as a person and to and to dive into the space is to just is just to speak with as many people as I can and so um yeah that'd be great please reach out and I look forward to connecting with all of you thanks Thank you everyone for attending and uh, sharing your insight. So we've shared everyone's link in the Zoom chat. So again, stick around. A lot of questions from the community and the attendees. So definitely stick around and answer some of those. Thank you for that discussion. Thanks everyone. Good All right. Moving on to our next panel. We have, so we kind of lightly touched upon it on this panel, but the concept of scaling blockchain. And I know we talked about cross-chain, uh, in the last one, but definitely scaling blockchain is a growing question and concern as all these projects are going more and more mainstream. So excited to welcome. We have Sebastian. Welcome, Sebastian, Hello. COO and co-founder at Sandbox. Dirk, good to see you as always. Hello. Co-founder at Upland. I need one of those shirts, Dirk. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, still. Still owe you that one. <laughs> 
I might want to order two of them for me too. And Chris, good to chat with you again. Uh, co-founder and CEO at Effect.ai. So this is going to be Hello. an interesting discussion. All three of you are actively very, very involved in, you know, both, you know, selecting which network. Um, I know you guys are building scalable projects on these platforms. So this is a really relevant uh, project uh, topic for everyone here. Yep. All Super right. very excited. Yeah, very excited good. to be here. Hello, everybody. All right. Same here. So to kick it off, uh, you know, uh, Sebastian and Dirk, you run two very large and successful uh, projects on the platform. And Chris, and just to kick it off, what is this uh, scaling blockchain topic? And just to give everybody some context about what's going on in the, in the space and uh, yeah, high level. No, I can start. <laughs> okay, so um, I think scaling has two aspects, right? The business side of it, right? How you're getting, you know, onboarding more users, but also how you find more users, right? And that's actually eventually what we want to do. And, you know, and then we have blockchain, which is obviously um, could be or can be a bottleneck, right? Depending, you know, the way you see it, because it's a very young technology. It's not, you know, like databases, which are 10 or 20 years old, which were high performant. And, um, and then you run, of course, into challenges, right? Because it's all, everything is new when you build your tech stack. So I don't know, what, what are you focusing on? On the tech stuff or on the business side or both? Or what, what are you, um, you guys? Both and you? all the above, because uh, mm -hmm. all, three, all three of you here have mm -hmm. really unique experiences that can touch upon both of those, those sectors. Yeah, maybe I just start with <clears throat> what what we did is, uh, you know, when we set out and started Upland, like like a little more, when we were thinking about the concept or a little bit more than well, less than three years ago, uh, we were thinking, okay, we want to build something which is you know relevant for for mass audience because we always said, okay, crypto people are nice, right, or crypto aficionados, but obviously it's it's a small group and you know obviously it's growing now and maybe one day everyone's going to have crypto and then mass audience equals crypto. But right now we know it's probably, I don't know, I don't have the exact numbers, maybe 1% of the population holds crypto. Maybe you've got better numbers these days, but that's my um, maybe fair assumption these days. So when we set out Upland, we said, okay, how, how can we build that? And, and what, what do we need to, to meet in order that, you know, we can really onboard the mass markets? And there's a couple of things on the blockchain side and then also on the other technical on the other technical side which is somehow related to blockchain because the, and when we started like three years ago it was always a challenge to uh, to bring and we know that applications onto mobile because um, obviously blockchain was originally you know more desktop oriented is changing now but we said okay when we want to build something when we want to launch upland for us it's important that we really mobile first and people can go there because that's where pe people are, or most uh, most of the people. So there was one. I want to say, okay, that's the first first requirement we have. Then the second requirement, of course, is that we said, okay, <clears throat> for us, it's um, how can we onboard a lot of people? Let's say when they want to invest, when they would put, you know, purchase maybe some goods or digital goods in in in, you know, can we use crypto for that? When you said it's just one percent, and like three years ago was even even less people. Okay, we need to have a method for where we can onboard a lot of people who are not those crypto aficionados who have a wallet and all other stuff. So we need to have other ways, traditional ways in order to get those people on board. Maybe that also is temporary. Maybe in the future, everyone has crypto, holds crypto and it's much easier, but you know, short term was probably easy, better for us, you know, to go down the route and in Upland, you know, you can use uh, Fiat in, that means you can credit card and PayPal on, on, on the web and iOS and Android purchases. Now the third thing was on our end is how can we scale it when we have a lot of users coming in and and why what is also very important that when they do transactions on the blockchain that all those transactions are for free to give you one example in upland i don't know if actually the all of the audience know what we are doing it's basically the earth's metaverse and you know it's uh, based on a real world you know think monopoly but way beyond that but um, the idea is when you want to transact or want to do something on the blockchain in Upland and each time you need to pay maybe for just collecting your earnings on the property which you have, each time you need to pay, pay a gas fee, that's that's challenging, right? Actually, that's not how a game can work. And that's where we said, okay, we cannot, you know, we cannot use um, certain blockchains. So we, for ourselves, made the decision to, to go on the EOS blockchain where all the transactions are free. That's a different type of approach uh, where we can actually then um, and scale it up. 
And so far, um, so all these things, you know, payments, onboarding with easy, like we only need email and passwords in order to onboard users. So this is all, you know, the most important requirements, you know, to get the massive audience on there. And let's say more on the back end, then you have really the, the scalability. And <clears throat> so we, for instance, we launched um, uh, Staten Island uh, a couple of days ago which was of course a challenge because we have so many players now in the app and we um there's no way we had to actually i think 40 transactions per second and that's what something only you know we were able to do on our on our blockchain because you know some blockchains just do not allow that uh, that high high of throughput right we minted 10,000 properties just in 20 to 20 minutes and um I think that this is very important also for the for the user experience. But then you run into other issues, right? For instance, when you only want to sell, you know, maybe five, you know, unique assets, five unique NFTs, and all of a sudden you have two thousand people <laughs> jumping on the same NFT. This can be also a new type of challenge. Uh, you always have to come up with, uh, you know, with new solutions. But I could stop yeah. here and let my panelists also <laughs> chime in. <clears throat> That's good. And just to share, you know, the, the insights that you're seeing just running Upland. Sebastian, I know you also have a lot of similar experiences. Wanted to hear from your side. How are you doing with scaling? I agree with Dirk on several points. Like there's no like one answer fits all. It's not just a technical matter. I think at the origin is more like a business and utility matter. Like essentially what we're creating, what we're offering as a platform, how do we make it accessible to the most and valuable and useful for the most. And when we're talking about NFTs, um, I think like not all NFTs carry the same utility and use case. Some of them are made just for collecting such as like sport moment in uh, games like NBA Top Shop. Some are just uh, crypto art and are made for collecting, maybe exhibiting, but that's pretty much all. Gaming NFTs is a much powerful use case as well. And the place where all those game NFTs and crypto art, even collectible, is going to shine the most is through virtual worlds, essentially. Virtual world is a place where anyone who owns an NFT can actually import it through interoperability, play with it, interact with it, create new experience with it, socialize through it as well in certain manners. And that's, I think, already a very powerful manner to scale um, in general, like uh, how many users can be interacting, seeing, potentially owning NFTs. The second is a point I'd like to bring on the matter is like, if we only focus on like NFT made by a single entity, which is the core creator of the game, it's a much more limited, again, uh, way to reach out to user where we are using NFTs for creator and boring the creator's economy with user-generated content, which is what Sandbox is all about. 100% of the content in Sandbox is actually made by the users through our creation tools, which means like anyone using a very accessible uh, way of expression, which is like voxel, 3D pixel, can make sort of digital Legos. And we have like hundreds of millions of users who played Minecraft, who played Roblox, who played Legos, who knows how to create with voxel from the very simplistic basic shapes, almost like Legos for kids, to yeah. more complex piece of art that takes weeks of months of work and are actually exhibited in museums around the world and can be worth a lot because you understand all the craftsmanship and the hours of work that's mm -hmm. been put behind. All of that can be reproduced within Sandbox as a virtual world mm -hmm. and opens the economy where those NFTs have also, again, a true utility as uh, through the game maker and more. Last of all, the fact that we are bringing IPs and brands, so content made by creators, but also uh, premium NFTs made by external IPs and brands that are really uh, allowing uh, users to play and interact with uh, NFTs, create their world experience, adventures into virtual world, and um, essentially something that cannot be done in the physical world. So if I'm a big fan of, let's say, uh, Atari, Care Bear, Smurf, just to name a few of the IPs that are in Sandbox, I cannot create my own game with it, but now I can into a virtual world, I can own it and can monetize it through the power of NFTs too. So that's a great way that we're reaching through the fans initially of one IP, but because in our virtual world, we are combining many IPs, then we are cross collateralizing those fans and they can start to experience NFTs from other IPs and brands within the world and from other creators as well. The beauty of it is also we are start starting to see even uh, 
new virtual brands that come that did not exist in the physical world and now are starting to acquire reputation and community within uh, our virtual world. Wow. Now that's, comes, why, that's why your yes. name Sandbox is so appropriate. <laughs> but well, I do, we think I, so. I do want to make that transition because both Upland and Sandbox, you're living in the metaverse. So there's a lot of transactions in the metaverse mm -hmm. from uh, users in there. And that's why I think it's so interesting, Chris. You have a interest, you know, have a different perspective. Um, he's dealing with scale on a different, on a different medium, I guess you could say. Uh, Chris, go ahead, and I want to hear from from you. Like, how are you dealing with scalability from your side? Yeah, scalability. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, you're good. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I've been on like 500 calls today, so I might lose my <laughs> voice. But um, yeah, scalability is an incredible issue, and it really did, does depend on what you're creating and, and who your user base is. Um, what Effect.ai does, we've recently branded to the Effect Network, is we have a global workforce of people from 152 countries that work on our blockchain-based um, platform, and they earn cryptocurrencies for doing micro tasks. Um, the most tasks that we have completed in a day was 480,000 tasks. If we did that on Ethereum today, it would cost like 40 million bucks. Um, so that's just not feasible for a business model and transactions in high volumes like we're doing it, especially when you're talking about microtransactions where you're, you're paying people, you know, anywhere from a few cents to a couple of dollars and you're doing that in high volume. So the, the, the scalability of blockchains, you need to sacrifice certain elements of uh, security and decentralization to have the adoptability and the usability for your, your users. So for the effect network, um, we chose the EOS blockchain as well. Technologically, it's perfect. It's absolutely amazing. The resource model uh, that uh, is used with the EOS blockchain enables our workforce to be able to accomplish thousands of tasks a day individually and um, not have to pay a, a transaction fee on any of those um, transactions. Um, you sacrifice decentralization um, and you, you sacrifice a little bit, but um, it works for us. And if you're creating products like that, um, you, you need to, to pick the right place. One of the biggest disappointments in the space is certainly how Ethereum has scaled or, or the lack of scaling with Ethereum. One of my favorite projects in the entire universe is Decentraland. I think it is the greatest accomplishment that I can, can ever think about. From I remember the, the ICO back in 2016, 17 and thinking, I don't really get it. You know, I buy this little chunk of land, this black land, and they've now turned it into this virtual place where in October I took part in their, their uh, Halloween special and I'm walking around and I'm collecting these NFTs, um, which I, I'm fascinated by and I love collecting them, but they're costing me 40 bucks for every single one that I'm, I'm collecting. And that's such an incredible disappointment uh, in the space. And um, I'm not too sure of the solvability. Um, there's many things coming out. EOS's model is really, really great, um, but it's not being adopted by many people. And then Polkadot, very, very popular project right now. It's really similar to what EOS was trying to set out to do with all of these different side chains or sister chains. They call them parachains. Um, it looks to be a solution, but the only thing that matters in, in, in that regard is community. So I heard that on the last call, people talking about you're only as good as the, the community behind the project, but that goes with the blockchain as well. And EOS is lacking an incredible um, community of people and adoption and, and uh, you know, views. So yeah, scalability, it's the most complex uh, uh, question, you know, to dive in because there are so many different layers and levels to, to scalability and what it means, you know, these second layer solutions on Ethereum and, and these different blockchains like Solana coming out, which very, very centralized model. But of course they're at the forefront of this, this whole uh, high speed, high transaction blockchain. And um, so, yeah, you have to pick, you know, where your products and services lie. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a toughie. Sebastian, I'd love to hear from you. I know you haven't shared Definitely. much. Definitely. 
that well i didn't touch yet on the technical topic but i, I think it goes beyond just like number of transactions a blockchain can handle it goes also a lot with like how you optimize the interaction of the users with the blockchain at which point they do need or don't need to do those interaction it's great that chris went through like being an active users in the center land so he could experiment like he being part of the world he initially uh, set up his wallet he accessed through the wallet and during that event he also was able to claim an nft reward which is in game uh, an in game action for him that actually cost it a transaction you normally do not need to have like in game transaction all the time within uh, games unless this was actually designed on purpose you could also uh, introduce various ways for pushing back those transactions for bundling them at a later time or for only introducing them only when you actually want to actually transfer back that nft and going further that's what a lot of other blockchain are and other sorry other projects are doing when i think about well um games like nba top shot or even blancos or even uh so rare like they do not have all the content at all time on the blockchain but only at the certain point of time where users went to transfer them out to another users typically so there are strategies behind that can facilitate and increase the scalability behind and through reducing the, the load uh, on the overall mainnet. Definitely, there's no denial that this year Ethereum has shown like a um, sign of age fatigue or growth <laughs> prematurely uh, into like adulthood and before Ethereum 2.0 could roll out. So there's many approaches that developers have been looking at whether they are like a uh, side chain layer two temp or other uh, blockchain but it's not that easy of a change for a developer like especially if you've been building a product for several years already and it's not easy looking back it seems it's easy but when you started with a blockchain you don't know like if it will actually scale in three years again when there is the same amount of usage and transaction you can only hope so until it's actually battle tested and I think still Ethereum is the most battle tested blockchain by all means. And for now it's in the growing pain for sure, but I think we have some of the best and brightest mind working on it too, which uh, is a great advantage. And they have been working for years on to it. And also it's always careful, be careful when picking your technology to make sure like you have the right ecosystem support that it's still being going to be supported over time which unfortunately some blockchain have been abandoned by the original team already three years after the original ICO time. So that's very evolving and changing environment, which doesn't make it so easy to say, take this chain or take this other chain and how we are, uh, as we are building on it a little bit like the ship on the ocean, but the ocean is not always quiet and like an oil sea. Sometimes it's more like <laughs> the up and down rides. Yes, I, I mean, it's part of like high growth, uh, but also high user base behind, I guess. Right, I totally agree. The, the network effect of Ethereum is, uh, uh, is a very, very powerful thing. Um, a very, the first mover in, in, in smart contract technology and has the majority of the talent um, uh, who are, are actively engaging and trying to solve these issues. Um, and, and that's great, but it's not feasible for some products and, and things to, to, to figure out how to, to make these products and services, you know, and for, for us, it, it was the same way we can consolidate payments, uh, you know, and, and have one transaction claim at the end of each day or at the end of each week, as a regular worker would do, as you get a paycheck that wasn't sexy to us. And it wasn't what we wanted. We wanted to have our transactions on the blockchain and we wanted to, uh, you know, uh, yeah, be able to have those uh, to, to all of our workers and, and prove those. But with that being said, like uh, Sebastian said, there, there are, you know, co-founders of these blockchains that take off after a couple of years and the ecosystem dies. So that's a really big problem. It doesn't matter how incredible the tech is. 
it, it matters if it's going to be around and still being developed on into the future. And that's why, yeah, you, you pick your poison early and hopefully you pick the right thing, but there's no guarantees anywhere. And we find ourselves in an incredibly difficult position where there is no access to our token whatsoever. If I talk to any influencer anywhere at any time and I mention EOS, it's done. You know, they, 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 they have another call that they have to get to. Somebody's calling that they're, they're gone in two seconds, you know? So it forces us to, to make decisions. And uh, now we're building our technology and migrating to Binance Smart Chain, where we're building those smart contracts in Solidity, getting ready for ETH 2.0, because we know that they have the network effect, but it's still not the, the best place. But these growing pains are not just the, the blockchains in the industry, but they're the people building in them as well. So we're all in it together. And uh, yeah, hopefully things will, will yeah, get there. They'll get there. Yeah, maybe to chime in here. Um, so first of all, I tend to challenge the the approach. Of course, Ethereum has a great community, but we're still talking always about the tech people, right? Who are building, right? Eventually, but eventually, when product become really mass market adopted, I hope, right, that the that this whole tech discussion becomes irrelevant, right? On which you are, of course, it's it's a, it's a it's a requirement to 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 serve your product, but you know, when a product is large enough, right, and has a large enough of audience it has, it was able to attract, you will see that a lot of other people will, will come, you know, not just on the consumer side, but also on the developer side, because the audience is there. So I tend to say, you know, even though, and what I hate right now is all this religious discussion, uh, Polka does is better, you know, whatever, Ethereum is better, you know, always those people who are so focused just on their, on their technology, but I think that's just, uh, just uh, not the right way to go about it. That's, uh, you know, or personal, my personal opinion here is uh, to really think about, okay, what's the end goal? And the end goal is to build a great product, what end users love, and then the rest will come. And then you don't care, you know, what kind of stack you're sitting at the end of the day, because you will be able to continue to be able to support those stacks in a, in a, in a certain way, right? So that's, that's why I see it. What I think a little bit tricky is um, when you change to other blockchains, right? I mean, it's probably not for you, Chris, but, you know, Right now, you're conveying some kind of a true ownership, right? And somehow it's related to your blockchain, right? And and when you now say, you know what, I'm just going <laughs> to erase everything and, you know, I'm moving to another blockchain. What would Sebastian go if he goes tomorrow on Polkadot? What would he tell his users, right? Oh, you know what? <laughs> We're somewhere else. I think that's also something you have to have in mind, right? So that's, uh, you cannot just, you know. But I also, uh, I also think your, that that's your product, a... right? <laughs> I think yeah. that that's a massive uh, uh, part of this entire uh, scaling debate or conversation is that we talked about it in 2016 and 17, interoperability of blockchains, right? I am the most blockchain agnostic guy. All I care about is the users of my platform. These are human beings that are spread all over the world. And uh, my mission is to build a user interface that's simple enough for them to come onto the platform, engage, and not have all of the problems that, that happen in the crypto space. So usability, UX, UI, and the usability of this technology is very important. But we don't want to sacrifice too many things. So this interoperability of blockchains, I think these cross chains and bridges that are bridging are a good first solution to be able to connect different blockchains. So we're not migrating or moving to Binance Smart Chain. We have an active DAO on the EOS blockchain, sophisticated smart contract stack that we just, we couldn't even imagine moving that right now to redo that in Solidity and then move that over. We want accessibility to our tokens. So we're making a bridge over to Binance Smart Chain to create accessibility for people to use the products and services that are being built on Ethereum, on Binance Smart Chain, uh, anywhere in, in, in any ecosystem to get accessibility to our token. They grab that token, they, they, they start to look into the project, then we have more users bridging over to our platform connecting to our DAO, joining our workforce, and it's just this cross compatibility uh, amongst blockchains. I hope that we have a future with the Effect Network where we can bridge to all of the blockchains, each and every one, and you can find our token very easily and fluidly in a decentralized manner, connecting all these blockchains because different products and services are being built on all of these different chains. 
and they have their ecosystem of people and we'd like to absorb those uh, into our community. So I think that's a big part of the scaling uh, you know, debate on how to connect these blockchains together to, to be able to actively build different things and different products um, that make sense on these, these uh, different chains. So that, that's, that's why we're doing it. It, it doesn't take away our, our circulating supply or change our tokenomics in any way. It's a bridge over there for people to be able to do their yield farming and these, these crazy things that kids love to do on, on pancake swap and all of these other things. And uh, that accessibility is just going to bring more eyes. And that's what we care about. Um, care about usability for our workforce and our users first, and then obviously to grow this ecosystem and grow our clients and our usership, uh, it's creating more accessibility to our token, which creates more accessibility to our platform. So um, that's how we're kind of scaling our network is just being able to, to absorb other communities and take advantage of these places. So. It makes sense. It's very use case driven as well. Like in our case, we let the ecosystem build those bridge like Curve Grid, for example, in partnership with Binance Smart Chain. I think they received some funding from them. They are building a bridge to enable any ERC721 and ERC1155 to be moved to Binance Smart Chain and then access there. The users can decide what they are going to do in the ecosystem, whether they are going to swap or trade at a cheaper price on, on, on the open sea equivalent there or stake it, do the liquidity mining and so on. What's interesting is like users have the freedom to decide like my asset, I wanna trade and I wanna trade faster or cheaper on this chain and I'm used to this application now, I can move them there. Um, we are not imposing it on them and we are already uh, making sure that we provide the where they have built their habit, where they have built their wallet, their accounts. We are providing the best and smooth user experience to continue operating in the best manner as possible in this way. And we offer additional connection to the broader ecosystem in general. Yeah, I think we also believe in this interoperability approach. So for instance, we're launching what we call an NFT portal soon. People will be able to import NFT from other blockchains. We're starting out with WAX and eventually Ethereum and others. And the nice thing is you can import them. And since we're a metaverse, we're much like, like Sebastian, right? We get then cast utility. You know, if you have now a, a virtual piece of art, you can put it on your virtual wall in your virtual house, stuff like that, or with a virtual car and you can actually drive it. And the advantage is, you know, that we also want to allow users to transact so you can sell your goods, you know, avoiding what we mentioned before, those gas fees or whatever happens on Ethereum. But going forward, and I think Sebastian, right, we talked about it once, right? I could also imagine, because we want to be open, right? I can imagine that we open up a full portal to Sandbox, right? In the way Sandbox maybe has a full portal up to Upland, right? So it should be really about, you know, that, you know, they shouldn't care what, what's in the background for, for the users, right? They just should should enjoy what, what they, if they play or or should make money if they want to make money in a certain application or or socialize with others. So I think that's that's just doesn't matter at this point, right? Until when you provide that uh, unique experience. And I see that also with, you know, the communities, right? You have the developer communities. Now, the, the, I mean, Ethereum is strong. I, that's, that's clear, right? Um, but eventually you have this, but this is only that small, right? And now you have this really large stack of end users coming on, right? And, and that, that might change uh, again the dynamic, right? And we don't know. And if you think about technology, if you think about like 10 or 20 years ago, everything was about Microsoft, right? I mean, you know, of course they have still, they're still important they're doing some stuff in the B2B space and so on. But otherwise, you know, it's other companies who, you know, Amazon, right, and Google who are, who are now the lead. And you have probably the same thing, maybe in five or 10 years time, we speak about a new blockchain which has been developed super smart with AI, whatever, <laughs> whatever's integrated, right? We didn't think of, and then people flock to that. But what is important is still the use case on top of it, right? People are still doing like what they used to do on Word, right? Now they're doing it in Google Docs or what, what other, or Slack or whatever, right? But it's just, it's on the cloud, it's different, different use cases. Things always evolve. I, I don't think we can today already determine what's, what's gonna be there in five or 10 years time. So that's just, just my two cents to it. And we just have to adopt. <clears throat> Those are some really good points. Yeah, I like that comparison. People are still doing the same thing on Word, just on Google Docs, but they're still typing. They're still typing the same thing. <laughs> but exactly. it's really, uh, really insightful, everyone. And uh, any closing thoughts from any of you? 
So, I Chris, any closing thoughts? <laughs> yeah, well, it's still uh, early on in the space. So I think like we're some of our games are not yet launched for the public. Some are already live with thousands of users. There's a lot to come in terms of like growth. We are talking probably with just thousands of thousands, at best a hundred of thousands users using our application, which is by far, uh, far along from like the potential market, like 2.5 billion gamers, million of active users on a daily basis once we really touch that mainstream point. So I'd love to have this conversation again year after year to see how we evolve there, how we are hitting market and I've been able to solve some of the challenge by vote, find new technologies and, and looking back, I think it's not typically just blockchain, like always in technology, you encounter this kind of issues. We've been building website with MySQL database and before MySQL was terrible and then came better and better and better. So overall, uh, don't attach yourself just to the tech only behind, think also at the overall picture and what's your path, focus path to grow your user base. Yeah, I think that that's a, a beautiful sum up of what we're talking about. So the technology, the underlying technology is incredibly important, but if you want to have mass adoption, which is going to push scalability, um, you need to create products and services and, and user experience first, you know, so on the last conversation, uh, the, the boys were talking about uh, eBay and all of these other, you know, even um, uh, um, Instagram coming out with NFT marketplaces and stuff like that. Um, we, we stand for something different and decentralization has to come first, but the mass adoption has to be usability for the people that are coming from just the regular world. So when I went to Upland before I started this, the whole tutorial off the front, that's what you need to do. Like you need to make something where people go, okay, cool. This is like everything else that I'm, I'm uh, you know, used to. And then you add in how to attach the wallet and, and how that works after you kind of onboard them. So the usability is going to push the, the, the scalability. And if we want the adoption, we're now competing with the big, big players in the space. And so we need to do a really good job. And just to add to that, we really need to take away like the 2017 tribalism, which I think is like dissipating and going away, right? Um, I think it's about cross-chain compatibilities, interoperability, and people working together to solve these things. And we're working with all kinds of teams in the EOS ecosystem and the Binance Smart Chain ecosystem to create this decentralized bridge. And that's the most fun ever to be able to play with a whole bunch of different players in the space. So I think those are the two paths forward is just work together no matter where you're building and uh, create stuff that users can actually engage in and, and user experience first. Yeah, I think that great words, Chris, there. So, so just maybe just a little add on is exactly that, right? We are decentralized. We are a small community of developers right now. And I think we should really think about how we can collaborate and work on things together. I know Sebastian is doing great work with the BGA, the Blockchain Gaming Alliance and all that. I mean, these are the things because otherwise, um, you know, the whole idea of decentralization will hopefully not be, you know, taken away by, let's say, by all the old guard, right, like like Facebook, you know, and then if they take over that, right, I think then we all as an industry have lost to my mind, right, if <laughs> that's a little bit my my thinking, right, so let's let's rather work together, even though here and there are some competitor, competitive approaches, but, you know, you always have that, but at the same time, maybe there's other things you can do together and grow the whole ecosystem much faster, stronger together. I think that's that's where we have to you know group group our, ourselves and 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 we have other enemies not our you know not us the ones who are in the, in the ecosystem right now. I love that. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Chris, for your insights. That was uh, almost like a philosophical uh, discussion. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and thank you for all the attendees and speakers joining in. Uh, that was our morning session for our crypto and blockchain conference. Thank you so much. So just, uh, you know, kind of to wrap things up, Jeff, and we can chat about this, but, you know, some of the takeaways were really, um, you know, that I saw was really, if you don't have a community, you don't have a project. And we're just seeing how important, important that is for, you know, whether it be gaming to workforce to uh, even financial DeFi projects. 
Yeah, and just in summary, the industry is always changing. And as uh, Sebastian and Dirk mentioned, year after year, we, we really launch these events and conferences to bring together uh, these thought leaders, both from the development side to the investing side to creators. Uh, later on, we have celebrities. We have uh, Acon's uh, co-founder for Acoin that's going to be joining us later. Um, and just different uh, people that you know want nothing more than to really bring collaboration, new technology and innovation into the space, help each other. And uh, we appreciate everybody attending. Uh, we'll see you in a couple hours at our second uh, session. And um, yeah. Well. All right. So who we have at the next session, we have David Moore, co-founder at Known Origin at the next keynote, which is at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, and we have people from crypto.com, Acoin, Electric Capital, Pantera, uh, and we have a lot of great speakers coming up. So stay tuned. Join back. Join us back at 6 p.m. Pacific time using that same exact link, uh, and we're going to cut into the intermission so Jeff and I can have some lunch. <laughs> but excited, excited to see uh, almost the part two of what we're going to chat about. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll Thank you, you everyone. We'll see you at 6 p.m. I'll be posting a banner, innovation banner, so you can see who are the upcoming speakers. But thank you, everyone, for joining and listening in. Our next speaker uh, is one from one of the largest NFT marketplaces in the world and uh, known as Known Origin. Uh, we had a previous NFT conference months ago, and... I feel like NFTs are in the news every single day for good reason. It's an absolutely disruptive technology that empowers creators, protects intellectual property, and very grateful for David to be joining us this evening, morning, or afternoon, wherever people are dialing in from. Hi, David. Welcome, David. How's it going? Hey, how you doing? You made it. Yeah. Where are you that? Where are you calling in from, or where are you zooming in from? Should I say? It's uh, Manchester, UK. Super early in the morning. Thank you for making the time. Hey, no worries. How's everyone doing? Doing great. Good, good. We had a pretty amazing session earlier. We had it with Mark Yusko uh, opening it up. We had pretty exciting topics around DeFi, uh, automated market makers. Uh, pretty jam-packed. We dove deep into scale for blockchain. It was pretty cool. Uh, excited cool. on where we're going to take this half. Uh, yeah, and I know, um, you know, the attendees are all pouring in now. Thank you, everyone, for chatting and jumping in. Uh, if you have any questions, definitely write it into the Zoom chat here. Uh, hopefully, David sticks around and answers some of those questions. But throughout the entire uh, second session, uh, we'll be here answering the questions, but there are also a lot of crypto enthusiasts in the community. And I can tell, you know, a lot of them are answering questions that are being asked. So thank you so much. Uh, so just to kick it uh, back off again, welcome everybody to the second session of our Crowd Create Crypto and Blockchain uh, Global Conference. Uh, NFTs is, is in the news. Uh, um, and now you can hear about it from one of the thought leaders himself, David, uh, with Known Origin. They're one of the largest NFT marketplaces in the space. And uh, just to recap, the goal of these events is really to support one another uh, through what we call the wisdom of crowds. Uh, here at CrowdCrate, we run a very large network and we carefully curate all the speakers here so you can hear it uh, for yourselves from some of these thought leaders. So we encourage everybody to post in the Zoom chat as well as join the conversation on Twitter using hashtag CrowdCrate. So David, uh, maybe a quick introduction about uh, yourself and then we can get into it. So yeah, hi everyone. First, uh, thank you for bringing me into the panel and onto the conference. That's uh, really great of you guys. Uh, so yeah, I'm David Moore, one of the co-founders of Known Origin, uh, one of the leading digital arts and NFT platforms on Ethereum, mark, uh, on Ethereum blockchain, uh, 15 years in the creative industries, previously at uh, Microsoft, Booking.com, and um, been in the blockchain space since uh, 2017. So yeah, great to be here. Been there from the start. That's awesome. And also those other projects, we're very familiar with them. So 
Yeah, thank you for joining us. So NFTs has been a lot of the talk, a lot of the talk. And um, we had a few projects earlier kind of diving into, you know, the metaverse and NFTs we're seeing uh, earlier. There's some talks about how uh, it's like the Lego art Legos of limitless possibilities. <laughs> that was a pretty popular one, but I would love to hear from you, David, like, where do you see, where do you see the future going? You know, you're, you're the head of one of the biggest platforms and um, where do you see the future? Where do you see what's next for NFTs? Um, so I can zoom right out and then we can zoom a little further in. So yeah, I think limitless possibilities is a really great place to start. So anything that touches the fundamentals of like who we are and how we survive uh, and beyond that uh, is kind of really going to change. It's going to be a paradigm shift in so many ways. So what I mean by that is uh, anything that touches the core things like shelter, health uh, and food are going to be, it's going to really kind of change how people live their lives so nfts and smart contract technology are going to be integrated into how we live going forward so if you own a property uh the true ownership of things like one of the most expensive assets of your life the thing the home that you own i can imagine that nfts and smart contracts handling deeds of houses uh how you pay your mortgage and then if you move into and of food provenance, I think that's going to be a huge thing going forward. And I think, again, NFTs and smart contracts are going to be handling all the kind of the food provenance things that you're going to see going forward. And in healthcare, at the minute, we have things like uh, Facebook that your, let's say you have a you, your first child, within minutes of that beautiful thing being born, you're taking photos and you put it on Facebook to share with your family. I think in the future, we're going to have places that we store these memories, these digital memories on chain through a private wallet. And these moments and these milestones in your life, they're actually going to be stored on an immutable ledger that's not something like Facebook. It's something that you own and you control and you choose how you use the, that data and how you share it. And, and if you go beyond that to things that aren't fundamental, but they're things that you want and desire, like fashion, music art it's gonna it's gonna integrate and touch all those things as well so anything that can change how we interact with like the core fundamentals of life and beyond is definitely going to be around for it's going to change everything and it's going to be around for a while so yeah the future of nfts for me is i think this limitless opportunities is a real great kind of statement and um, right now we're seeing an explosion in art, fashion, entertainment, and music. Um, but that's not uncommon for new technologies to go through those cycles. And I think most new technologies go through and get adopted by the bohemians and the artists at the start, and they kind of explore and push where we can take this technology. And that's what we're seeing right now. And it's, we, uh, yeah, so we started Known Origin in late 2017, first, part of 2018 and we it was an experiment right it was a this new technology type had appeared and we thought we'd find a great way to kind of explore and experiment with it and it started as just a handful of enthusiasts and passionate creatives that just wanted to create things and share and just move them around and test the system test what ethereum is test the network, how quick we could move things. And it's kind of really just blown up since late 2020, early 2021. It's now become the beast, the juggernaut that we see today. Uh, so yeah, it's super exciting. And I think uh, we can go into more of the detail about where I see the future of NFTs going forward and maybe touch on some of the technologies that are outside uh, crypto that kind of needs to almost either catch up or just enable the next wave of innovation. I like that. And I like how you mentioned the creators because the creators are often at that bleeding edge, right? They're the first to ad adopt new things. And we've seen this from, you know, from crowdfunding where there's the creator community behind Kickstarter. 
Uh, we lost you there for a second. Oh, there you're back. Yeah, I'm back and back. Yeah, I think, um, but I don't think that, that, like you say, that's not uncommon with new technology types. It's the it's the creatives that kind of take hold of it first and kind of really explore what it can and can't do. And then it tends to go to high fashion and high fashion kind of take it. And that's when it trickles down into kind of the mainstream. And I feel like we're sort of seeing that same product or innovation life cycle happening now. Uh, it's still super early, but some of the digital fashion movements and digital fashion plus NFTs, you're really starting to see that come come forward now. Um, so I think that's definitely one of the next innovation spaces that are, that's exciting. Uh, and there, so digital fashion's all, already kind of pushing immersive technologies, mixed reality, AR and VR kind of lenses. Uh, I think once you give people the concept of true ownership, that kind of the meshing of digital fashion items and true ownership, I think there's a real solid like use case there and a real great crossover. Um, and I know that we've partnered with, so when I say we, you Known Origin have partnered with a few fashion brands to kind of explore that space, because that's something that I think, like I say, could, could quite easily be the next kind of innovation space that appears, because we're creating a brand new industry, right? Before this, digital creators couldn't monetize their assets. They couldn't create connections with their audiences at this like direct one-to-one -one level. So we've already seen this radical transformation of the creative economy. Now I think we're gonna see a real disruptive movement in the fashion industry. Um, and it's gonna be really kind of great to see what happens next, like with NFTs, because they seem to be disrupting a lot of industries really quickly. And I don't think in my lifetime, certainly I've not seen a movement kind of catch on this quickly. If you think about it, we're only what three years into kind of what ER721 capabilities are. So NFTs 0.2 or sorry, 2. NFT 2.0 kind of that's that's where the exciting stuff's gonna happen. We're still kind of figuring out what it is right now. Where do you where do you see that going? That's interesting that you say NFT 2.0 and mm. um, you said fashion. Like, do you have some examples think, of where you think it'll go? Yeah, I think um, some of the really interesting stuff is either NFTs with utility, so NFTs that do things as well as that either they look great, but there's also some utility to it. I think NFTs that are attached to either an experience or an event, I think that's going to be really interesting. So for example, let's say there's a huge concert when we can all go back into live events and cold player on stage, but to get into the backstage of the VIP, you have to have uh, an NFT that gives you access or an access token. But let's say the crowd also get an opportunity to enjoy the band, but the visuals behind the band are also part of the experience. So when you're there, you can purchase the visuals that you're seeing on stage as a memory of part of your, a little bit like if you can remember taking the tickets stubs home after a gig that you went to. This is just a digitization of that. So it's just the people in the crowd not only experience the moment as a shared experience, but they then get an opportunity to buy an NFT of the visuals that they're seeing and being surrounded by. I think there's something interesting about NFTs as shared experiences. Um, and then the other thing is, the next kind of big thing is immersive experiences and kind of uh, AR. I think AR mixed reality pieces will be huge as well. I think if you can imagine, a, especially with fashion, if you can imagine an, uh, a layer of expression through an AR that you can purchase. So it might be that you go into a store and you pick up uh, a new a new jacket, but as part of the purchase, you also get an NFT that you can wear in the metaverse. And as part of the layer above that, you can also use a Snapchat filter to put the digitized version 
as a body scan over the over the top of yourself to share on social. So it's like NFTs with utility are you get the NFT, but it also unlocks a bunch of other ways to explore it or express yourself through it. I think, um, yeah, I think those innovation leaps are coming. And I honestly didn't think we'd be in this point this quickly. So it's going to be, it's not going to take long before we start seeing the early signs of the kind of mixed reality stuff coming into the space. Yeah. And actually see, so what you just mentioned right there is like the perfect brand play. So imagine mm -hmm. you buy Nike shoes and you wear it in real life. Yeah. You, your, your metaverse avatar can now have the exact same, you know, Nike shoes you just purchased. And I think that's. So I think um, you, make, you make a great point about, um, I think brands will be coming into the space and I think they're coming in, uh, they're going to come in quite quickly. Now the uh, kind of initial hype's died down and it's kind of settled down a little. I think brands are going to start making their way in. Um, and it's whether it's, it's going to be a really interesting time because it's either brands going to, are going to, big brands and corps are going to come in and kind of, they decide what direction we go in and what this thing is because their outreach to, to the masses is much more powerful than um, kind of a small community or a niche community of creators and platforms or we help brands come in with an authentic voice and they celebrate the talent that's here and we educate and we help guide them and they, they help shape what this becomes. So I think there's, there's gonna be real kind of crossroads of when the brands that come in with authenticity and celebrate versus brands that come in and try and co-opt what this is and turn it into what they believe this movement should be. I think it's going to be a real kind of a little bit of friction and a little bit of kind of finding out what happens when a Coca-Cola comes into the space or um, suddenly there's a, a wallet on your Apple device. That it's sort of these things we saw with the, I, before my time, I missed the internet boom, but it kind of, you saw when corpse co-opt a movement or a technology type, they can dictate the narrative and they can decide what it becomes. And I think there's going to be a moment in Web3 and NFTs where the brand, like I say, the brands that want to partner with the people that are building and shaping what this is might be a better play than just kind of snowballing into the, into the community and kind of trying to take it and take it to somewhere, it, well, it, we might not want it to go, you know? We've been there, let's learn from those mistakes that have been made and let's make this new movement better. David, as at Known Origin, you being a visionary for the company, you know, uh, what's next? And then what are, are there any projects that you're working on that uh, you wanna share or just- Yeah, I am, um, yeah, I'm not sure how much I can give away, but we give, we, we we, we actually pushed out a update email start of this week. It kind of blew Twitter up a little bit, which was good. And um, so we've actually been working, we spent the first quarter of 2021, essentially rebuilding our smart contract to future proofers going forward. And so we, the guys have uh, basically just torn down the original smart contract in the sense that we want to make it much more gas efficient on Ethereum. So we want to be the, lead, the the cheapest platform to mint uh, uh, on Ethereum mainnet, and we know that gas has been a real pain for a lot of our creators and collectors. So we're addressing that, and we're also making sure that the new smart contract allows us to push what an NFT can be going forward. So we've had a lot of interest from our community around generative artworks and creations, programmable NFTs that we think are going to be really kind of very interesting going forward. And um, I've always had a vision of um, creations and artworks changing over time uh, or changing through real world events or real world data. Uh, I think that's something that the physical art world simply can't do. And I think that's the thing that makes 
digital art really interesting. The ability to look at a piece on on my uh, digital device or on my on my digital uh, frame, and it's subtly changing throughout the day, or it's subtly changing because of uh, geolocation as I travel the world, or it's subtly changes because of the data inputs that the creator has chosen to kind of associate with um, with the artwork. Uh, I think 2021 is going to be all about collaboration. So we're seeing musicians collabing with visual artists to create video, video audio pieces. And I think we're also seeing what well, we we're building into our new smart contracts um a much more robust way of people to collaborate so at the minute on known origin an artist can collaborate with one other creator or charity or um, essentially one other eth address we want to we want to make we want to 10x that so we want to say an artist can collaborate with nine other people or eight other people in a charitable a charitable cause um and we think that's a great play for things like gallerists that want to create a profile in the space and then work alongside seven or six artists. And then any sale that gets made in that collective, the it gets put into like a multi-sig and then the, the artist and the gallerist can choose when to take their uh, accredited uh, commission split. I think there's something really exciting about allowing people to have this trustless way of collaborating with each other and they choose when they can uh, they can take their royalties and they can take their their commission uh, i think gallerists are going to be looking to get into space more this year uh, i think they've they needed some signals and i think the christie's and the sotheby's really helped with that uh, and now we're we're inundated with kind of brand, our inboxes going crazy with like brand and galleries, like wanting to explore the space more. So we're trying to build uh, a smart contract and a, and a well, we, we have built a smart contract and a platform that's going to just facilitate uh, the, the creation of novel and innovative NFTs and big collaboration. That's the big kind of the big reveal for 2021 on known origin. So it's uh, as soon as we get that, as soon as we get that smart contract back from the auditors, we're we're really going to push on for for the next the next quarter. That's fascinating. It's so interesting because let's say let's say it's five five months ago, I, I believe this was like, hey, what if museums took a, another look at NFTs? And here we are, known origin just you know built at you're literally preparing for the future because I, I literally see a lot of NFTs are moving this way yeah. where they can partner with a, a gallery house and this gallery house can have full transparency on where the, you know, where the funds are going. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. No worries. I know there's a lot of hard work behind that. We're actually getting a lot of interesting questions from the audience. Um, I'd love to dive into some of those questions with you, David. Sure. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So one of them, one of them is pretty interesting. I think it's spurred by uh, Elon's most recent announcement about Bitcoin. But <laughs> how and when are NFTs going to reduce carbon footprints? This is from Reader Ryan. So I think um, so. We're partly we're taking positive. We're, we're is known origin. we we obviously we're actually taking quite a big step to be more of a sustainable platform and company. Um, so the new smart contract I was just talking about, it's actually, we've actually re reducing a lot of the on-chain kind of uh, mechanics. So we, we've learned a lot over the last like two and a bit years, three years that some of the, some of the, some of the computation that we're asking of the blockchain, we can actually do off-chain and that, does a big help of reducing the energy consumption that's used. And um, I think there's going to be, this is, for us, this is our proactive way to kind of make sure that we're doing our bit around sustainability. 
as we get closer to uh, proof of stake, um, we're all we're actually one of the proof of stake node providers as a as a company. Um, so we're actually we're, we're committed to the POS movement. Um, so I think it's months away, which is great. But we wanted to make sure that the current the new smart contract that we put out gives us enough of a stop gap until we get to proof of stake. Um, and I think some of the, the iterations that we've made reducing gas fees and removing some of the non critical uh, interactions, moving those off chain are definitely going to help with our carbon footprint and our emissions output as a platform and a company. And that's super important to us. Uh, but yeah, I think the big win is obviously going to be moving from proof of work to proof of stake, but that's, a bigger a bigger challenge for the whole ecosystem so we've we've just made conscious efforts to build a smart contract that addresses the some of the environmental impacts because uh, like i say it's something that our community cares about and it's something that the majority of the creators in the space are, get really passionate about so we as a company make sure that we listen and we make changes David, what have, uh, has been some of those feedbacks that you've been getting from the community and just iterating from NFT, you know, 1.0 to 2.0? Uh... Can you repeat the question, sorry? Uh, just with everything that's happened, I, I guess, over the last couple of months with NFTs, like what are some of the, the feedback that you've been getting from the community? Some of the like most requested features that you're kind of innovating on that you think needs to be uh, implemented for the NFT industry as a whole, even? Yeah, so a couple that we get are um, a couple of like, Recent ones are, have been uh, additional file support. So how do we actually uh, support like 360 video has come up recently, which is really interesting. How do we support uh, some of the AR file types that are being born out of um, some of the Adobe suite uh, AR stuff that they're doing. Uh, obviously gas is been on everyone's agenda recently just because it went crazy seems to have settled down a little uh, so yeah reducing gas um file support image size is always a great one like we're we're still one of the ones that whole have the biggest uh, image support size size i think we're 100 meg but people are so used to like big big file types and big file sizes but when you're using a, a not decentralized, but a dis um, distributed storage solution, it's, it can get tricky. Um, so it's not a limitation on known origin, it's more of a limitation of the ecosystem. But we're really kind of, we're quite purist about making sure that if known origin ever goes down, or it, we never, we, known origin never goes any further, that all the collectors and all the artists retain all their own artwork it's stored on IPFS. We actually pin it to two to two nodes to make sure that there's backup there. Um, so we do everything we can to make sure that it's as decentralized as it can be. Um, and I think there's definitely a hybrid approach of kind of a creative platform with a kind of decentralization of its core. And we do everything we can to make sure, like you say, no origin just one day wasn't there that you could literally go to a th any kind of uh, Web3 platform and your all your images, all your NFTs, uh, all your data, you own it. So it'd be in your wallet and it'd be on a distributed storage solution. So we never we never worry about those sorts of things. Well, we do worry about them, but we never we never. Uh, we never feel like we're holding anything. We're we're just we're just a, essentially a platform that allows uh, collectors and creators to kind of find the best NFTs and make the the best uh, the best artwork. So, it's been a good time. It's great. 
Well, David, uh, you know, on behalf of the community, we're all big fans of what you're doing. We're going to be following everybody. Check out Known Origin in terms of, you know, NFT 2.0, the new collaborations that you have uh, uh, in the works. Uh, any closing thoughts, David, just for the NFT industry as a whole or for anybody uh, here looking to get into NFTs? Yeah, I think never before in my lifetime uh, has the world been talking about digital art until now and I think um, we might be at the very start and I think we're going to see some really interesting and exciting things happening toward uh, the middle and the end of 2021. Uh, I think that's the potential of how this is going to touch and change almost every aspect of not just the creative industries but almost all industries that have any any kind of ownership model or this um, dispute uh, rec recollection. I think, yeah, I think smart contracts and NFTs are going to really kind of shake it up. Uh, yeah, and it's going to be exciting to see what happens uh, from here and beyond. Uh, I think you Known Origins just going to go from strength to strength. We're, we're, we're building out the team and we're, we're excited to kind of share what's coming next. So yeah, make sure you're following us on Twitter and Instagram and join our Discord. Uh, we have, we're super present on Discord, chatting to the community every day. So yeah, we, we're loving it. And we're, we started with a tiny community and it's grown into kind of one of the biggest industries on the planet. So let's keep going. Let's keep it. Yeah, let's keep pushing the, pushing the edge. That's where the exciting stuff happens. So yeah, <laughs> thanks again. Thanks again for uh, letting me jump on. Uh, it's been great chatting uh, and I hope you have a, a, the rest of the session. It looks like it's a, a, a full a full day of awesome talk. So I hope I I hope I uh, added to that. David, you're an inspiration. Thank you for sharing your early morning with us. And uh, yeah. feel free to stick around. There's there's a lot of questions coming in, and I I want to go through all of them, but we need we do need to move on. But you did a great job, David. Thank you for your insights. Thank you. You take care. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you, David. All right, so David will be sticking around. Feel free to uh, leave more comments and questions in the Zoom chat. So, thank you. That was really insightful, kind of showing the future of NFTs. Uh, we're going to move on to our first uh, project. It's uh, Marshall Lees and Tim Smith at Virtua Studio. Uh, welcoming you to the screen here. All right, so you'll have 10 minutes. And again, uh, welcome, welcome. So the two of you, uh, you're going to be getting questions in the Zoom chat. So make sure you watch that as you're doing the presentation. And of course, feel free to stay afterwards to answer any other questions that people have for your project. But excited to learn about what you're working on. Uh, I'll let you know at the one minute mark, but looking forward to it. Right. Take it away. Thank you, Thank you Ivan. And uh, that was a really great talk beforehand too. So really interesting to hear. Uh, yeah, look. Thanks for the opportunity to give you a 10 minute rundown on what we're building. Uh, and we're about 25 days from launch from what we think is uh, sort of really exciting new development in the NFT space. Um, one of the things we're addressing is a way to sort of get longevity and engagement out of this space. Um, we think there can be a lot more to this than just sort of simple art drops. And so we've developed a number of mechanisms that are really about helping the engagement between creators, um, and that's creators of any sort of uh, interesting digital or virtual content, and collectors and fans of those creators. And so we're doing this in a number of different ways, and we're bridging the sort of physical world and physical merchandise with the digital world and NFTs. Um, and we've got a host of exciting things coming, some big IP we're announcing soon, uh, we've already got some incredible artists behind us. Um, and yeah, we're, we're really excited to be sort of coming into this space and shaking it up a little bit. So the main parts about Artify, the, the sort of pillars that we refer to in our team are discover, collect, earn, curate and connect. So we're doing things like changing the way you actually discover uh, creative, uh, creative content and art. We're doing that through gamified crates um, on top of sort of interesting, innovative drops. Um, and then we're allowing people to collect in different ways. 
earn and get rewarded for collecting. Um, so completing subsets of collections or participating in on-platform events um, allows our users to earn from that. Uh, we're also partnering with uh, company Nifty Pay, who are going to be allowing things like um, loaning and uh, lending against the value of NFTs. Uh, we'll have fractional ownership on our platform. And one of the most interesting things we're doing is changing the way you can curate and display your collectibles. So we've, we're building the first fully customizable virtual galleries. And so you'll be able to build a gallery of your dreams, essentially, um, however you want to reflect your personality in the collection that you assemble, you can display that in our virtual galleries. Um, we've got VR coming to those uh, soon, but if you want a gallery on a, a moon base in Mars because you collect sci-fi, uh, you can do that. If you want a sort of ethereal wonderland around fantasy art, you can do that with our galleries. Um, and that's probably a good segue to, to say that we're launching with uh, fantasy and sci-fi as our, uh, our genre. And we're doing that because we know that space very well. And we also know there's a lot of passionate collectors and fans in that space. Uh, Tim will tell you about some of the artists yep. we've got with us in fantasy and sci-fi. Yep. So we have, um, we've, with, with our launch for Artify, and it's coming out mid-June, we've got some amazing artists from um, including Frank Frazetta with Frazetta Girls. Um, we've got um, San Julian, we've got Juan Jimenez, um, we've got Cirillo, and a lot of these may not necessarily be household names, but in their sort of fan bases, they are some of the biggest and best of the, uh, of the artists of, of this particular genre, particularly particular around fantasy and sci-fi. So we're thrilled to bring on board so many amazing artists um, for people to discover um, for example, with Juan Jimenez, um, his work is synonymous with um, the Meta Barons, that comic series that he wrote with Jodorowsky. Um, we've got, uh, we have so many of his work that has never been seen before. So on the platform, we'll be releasing um, not only just straight art drops, but we'll be looking at ways to make these collectibles unique, um, whether it's through very subtle animation or other aspects to sort of bring them to life and bring them to, um, to excite collectors in brand new ways. So um, there's a lot to come. Um, we will, through our marketplace platform, we'll be doing, there will be the traditional straight art drops as well. But one of the other exciting aspects of Artify is the virtual crate system. And the virtual crate system allows for, um, it's an onboarding um, uh, element for people to be able to sort of, you know, buy a crate of, art and it could be you know it could be on a specific artist or it could be based on a theme and that's how we think we're going to sort of really be able to sort of engage with collectors to get them on board a theme could be all around dragons so for example Cirillo who is one of the the greatest dragon illustrators in the world today uh, it'll be some of his work in there but we'll also be able to tap into the almost limitless talent that's available in in the world who could also contribute to this um, crate and people can sort of crack the virtual crate open and build a collection through um, through this process. Yeah, and we think that's one of the the really important things to do in this space, drop the barriers to entry. So there are a number of other sort of um, platforms that allow the display through, through virtual galleries, but it's very hard for non-crypto people to sort of get into the space and build a collection and a collection that they're sort of really passionate about um, just because of the, the expense in doing so. But we're bringing really well-known artists and really incredible art around specific genres and then creatifying it and gamifying it and having that bar of entry really low so that people can start to get involved, start building their collection um, and start sort of immersing themselves more in this art than they currently can. Uh, and there's hundreds and hundreds, there's millions of fans out there who currently love this type of art, but all they can do is push like on an Instagram post. We're giving them more than that. We're giving them a way to um, really engage with that art and also interact with the artists and the creators as well. Um, so there's some really interesting things coming. Yeah, so um, we encourage, uh, we have a limited time, but um, if you're interested in discovering what the world of Artify is about, 
um, come to our um, website and sign up. We've got some really exciting things coming over the next couple of weeks. Um, the website address is artify, A-R-T-E-F-Y dot I-O, and you can sign up. We'll be doing some um, exclusive drops and um, we have our social um, outlets for you to join and um, engage in the conversation as well about um, everything that's to come. So um, Artify itself is part of a broader ecosystem. So um, in uh, about four weeks, we'll be launching our um, utility token, um, Relics, and that will be able to be used within the Artify platform and the other, other um, platforms that we're building within this same ecosystem as well. So we'll have the art aspect. We'll also have um, some gaming um, platforms that'll be, uh, that are in development as well. Um, we've got a roadmap that takes us through at least for the next 12 to 18 months of um, exciting developments. But as Marshall alluded to right at the beginning of this conversation, we're so excited to be in this space at this time. Um, there's lots of exciting things to come. So we, um, please join and sign up. Yep. yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you two, for sharing your project. Pleasure. Yeah, appreciate it. You're getting some uh, questions from the community, comparing you to some other projects. Definitely take this, take the time and answer them through the Zoom chat. But thank sure. you so much for presenting. And uh, if any of the audience has questions, feel free to type it into the Zoom chat. Uh, Marshall and, and um, his team will be there to answer them. Thank, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks very right. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Moving on to our next presentation. Go ahead and share my screen. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay, for this next presentation, we wanted to share a little bit about CrowdCreate and how we are actually one of the largest global networks of creators, investors, thought leaders, and content creators. So again, like what you see today on our event, we're highlighting some of the biggest projects to the innovators across the board. And we haven't just done this with blockchain and crypto. Uh, our last event was the NFT conference. So, um, you know, we regularly do this because, hey, we connect projects with these thought leaders. So uh, yeah. just to- um, And just add, uh, to get everybody context, uh, a lot of investors, project creators, and even founders here uh, have been asking, how did we build this community throughout the years? As Ivan mentioned, we've worked on over 80 plus successful projects and every single one of those projects we've noticed that they've built a successful community. And so we're going to break down exactly how we've done it and a little more background about CrowdCreate and hopefully this can uh, provide some value uh, to what you're working on. So across the past six years, we've raised 133 million and 80 plus successful projects We've been in the space, uh, we covered, you know, opportunity zones, aerospace, blockchain, DeFi, to now NFTs, which was one of the keynote talks today. Um, here's some of the uh, conferences that we've held, masterminds, you can see we've been doing it for a while, and you can recognize many of the speakers here who have been on our previous events or are now speaking today. All of these projects that you see here represent a big piece of the crypto blockchain community. From Ethereum to Bitcoin to Dogecoin, these are the communities that run these projects. And you can see these communities are what these projects live and die by. And if you were here on session one, uh, many of the topics shared by these panelists were these communities are the lifeblood and they're truly what determines your success, your user base, who's investing. It is so important now more than ever. This is what we do here at CrowdCreate. So in 2018, we did the fastest token raise in Asia. And how do we do that? We built them social traction. So you can see here, we're outside of consensus uh, 2018 with a taco truck for one of our projects. So you can see it's really truly in the community behind the projects is what powers it. So this sheet here shows you the network effect of how it happens. So behind the scenes, if you want to get to an advisor or let's say an investor, it's not always a direct path to them. You have to go through their network. You have to go through someone that knows them 
And this is, this is one of the big benefits of CrowdCreate because we've already built these relationships and it makes it easier for you to get an introduction to that investor, to that broker, to that influencer who could make a big difference between you know, getting your name out there to even being featured by some of the biggest crypto channels out there. You can see here in the bottom right, I'm actually interviewing BitBoy Crypto, uh, one of the largest crypto dedicated channels on YouTube. Uh, also bad crypto podcasts. And you can see here at the top, we regularly attend all of these conference, all of these conferences, and we get to know the speakers. We get to know the community. We know this space really well. And we leverage those relationships to help projects grow faster. And so at the core of what we do here at CrowdCrate is our data. So not only do we tap into public data sources like LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, when Dogecoin is going viral or when Ethereum is building a community of developers, uh, but also events and conferences like our own and previous NFT conferences, DeFi conferences, uh, we're in touch with those speakers. And uh, what we've noticed is this energy and excitement with these communities is really what leads to the success of our project. And so uh, our global team here at CrowdCrate has been building these connections for the last six years. So you as a project creator, as an investor, as a NFT artist, who do you want to get connected with? Uh, we've done it both uh, in person, but also virtually. And we really value the community here. And for all of these projects, it's really these relationships that has been at the core of uh, building a project. And so this is a case study. It's not just for cryptocurrency and blockchain, but also for real estate. Uh, this is one of our previous clients here uh, that was an affordable housing uh, real estate fund. And what we did was tap into different investor groups and also uh, enthusiasts uh, to you know, bring social impact and change to a local community. And through our efforts and also through our network, we were able to successfully raise them capital. And it's not just about raising capital when you're building a community, but also creating content. And that could be through video, it could be through articles, it could be through funny memes as we've noticed with Dogecoin and a lot of these meme coins that have been happening. And it's really capturing a person's attention uh, through different marketing methods. And at the core of this is really relationship science. It's matching people with projects that they're truly passionate about, uh, that they're willing to spend uh, both time and money on. And uh, it's everything from early adopters to artists and different industry verticals and even niche spaces as well. And so all this and even our company name itself, it's called CrowdCreate because we believe in the wisdom of crowds. And uh, we've seen this with crowdfunding, uh, crowdsourcing, and also the entire movement of crypto and blockchain. And uh, we really hold it dear to us that, you know, uh, this is a great book, uh, Why the Many Are Smarter Than the Few, and how this collective wisdom has shaped, uh, you know, shapes business, economies, societies, and nations We've seen this with DAOs, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, and just really see the future of smart contracts, people, collaboration, uh, really working together. Uh, as we've noticed, this that um, yeah, we live in a life of abundance. And so we'd like you all to follow CrowdCreate. Um, we have a Telegram channel and also on Twitter. Uh, and this is an announcement that we will be launching a token soon to empower these communities and to allow other creators to tap into all of this technology and the network that we've built over the years. Uh, building communities is really essential for any project and what we've built here at CrowdCrate is unlike anything else in the world. And we'll be powering a lot of uh, this global network of investors, founders that you can tap into for your own project and also contribute with you know, capital insights and social buzz. Uh, we've actually been working on this platform since 2018 and we're gonna be walking you through a demo of uh, the tech side of things. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, 
So we believe in what we call crowdsource intelligence and innovation. And this is really a revolutionary protocol for ideas. And we think about all the technological, uh, technological innovations that have happened throughout the years and how they were able to bring people together through feedback, through ideas. Some of the largest brands today currently do this. And as we know, uh, they're gonna be, you know, leveraging this technology of NFTs, of crowdsource innovation, and uh, being able to tap into their customers, essentially, and rewarding them for their ideas and their feedback. And so at CrowdCreate, you know, we believe, what if we could CrowdCreate together the next big thing from hardware projects to software projects to the next Ethereum, the next Dogecoin, and really leveraging people's insights, excitement, social buzz um, into what we consider um, the wisdom of the crowds. So it's gonna be a bounty driven intensive financial model. You will be rewarded in a social token for um, you know, getting behind these projects and uh, um, everything from giving ways and really aligning people with these business um, interests. And so there's a lot can be done on this platform. So this is actually a working demo of it here where people can get paid to share, to be a part of these projects. You can see here, uh, we're crowdsourcing lists of some of the top uh, blockchain investors in the world. And this was really inspired by uh, Reddit meets Kickstarter model. Um, you can see here where different uh, real estate operators would rate and review other projects in the space. Um, people here would be, uh, you know, funded or, or even incentivized through um, the previous technology that we built in was Bitcoin, Ethereum, and essentially we'd be putting our own social uh, token soon. So really just wanted to tease this to uh, everyone that is attending this uh, conference. Again, follow us on Telegram and also Twitter and can't wait to share the news with everybody here. Yeah, I know one of the topics brought up by uh, you know David earlier in the keynote was brands moving into the space. So we see this as a, a great possibility where brands can actually tap into those communities and reward them for their feedback, almost closing that feedback loop. But we're going to be at Bitcoin 2021. So if anybody's going to be there, send us a message. We'd love to meet in person. Uh, I know Brody asked, what's the coin name? It's going to be CrowdCreate Coin. Um, or we can tease it in more detail at our Twitter or follow us on our Telegram. Thanks, Paul. All right, so moving to our next project. Thank you, everyone, for listening all the way through. We have Josh Murchie, Head of Impact at Project X NFT. So carrying on the, the NFT trend here, excited to hear more about your project. Josh, welcome. Hey, Ivan. Hey, Jeffrey. Thanks for having us. Always a pleasure. So we have 10 minutes to talk about your project. Share, share with us what you're working on. Excited to learn more. Uh, I'll give you a, a message at the one minute mark and take it away. Perfect. Thanks. So just present the screen. So, um, yep. My name's Josh Murchie. I'm the head of impact here at project X. Uh, one second. Is that presenting all right? Yep, you're good. Yep, cool. Uh, so yeah, my name is Josh Murchie. I'm the head of impact here at uh, Project X. And basically what we're trying to achieve with some of the initiatives that we've got going on at the moment is how can we help uh, creators not only make money, but make an impact and change the world at the same time. So a little bit about my background. Uh, I am a Unis Center Fellow, so Dr. Unis, the Nobel Prize winner for microloans to the poor, uh, also a co-founder of littlefill.org, which is uh, one of the first projects in the blockchain space trying to help clean up the charity industry with transparency and efficiency. Uh, so it's not an, NFTs as a concept are not a new technology. They've been around for years. Uh, there has been a, problem there though from usability of people that are not technical so you know back in 2018 nfts were still around there was Gosh, still your, screen, your screen is still loading is it yeah still not there 
There we go. We got it. Okay. It mustn't like it in present mode. Uh, okay. We'll just go like this. Uh, yeah, so N NFTs have been around for years. They're not a new concept. Uh, we've been working with that technology since back in 2018. Um, the only difference now, though, is that it's become much more mainstream for anybody that's non-technical to be able to interact with NFTs, to mint NFTs, uh, trade, and so on. And I think we've we've kind of seen that in the industry now. Uh, you know, with the example of people selling the $69 million artwork on Maker's Place. Uh, marketplaces like OpenSea allowing pretty much anybody to mint and create an NFT with no real understanding of how to or how blockchain based wallets work, minting, gas, all that kind of stuff in a matter of minutes. We believe that's great, but it also brings in a bunch of bad actors. So, uh, you know, with the ease of use and the ease ability of people being able to launch and mint new NFTs in a matter of minutes, so too are many scammers basically coming in, stealing other people's IP, launching them, wash trading them. And then, you know, the, the poor people that think that they're actually buying from an original creator or something that has value end up getting burnt. So Project X has basically come out and is looking to redefine the way that people can get exposure to NFTs, uh, collect uh, and launch and know with certainty that, you know, these NFTs are from who they say they're from. Uh, they've been validated. There's not been wash trading going on um, and, and so on. So it's really about sec uh, security and that whole peace of mind when you want to interact with the NFT space, as well as making a social impact at the same time. So the idea of perpetual impact uh, is basically that we are able to engage with different celebrities, artists, creators, and so on uh, to launch an NFT and embed a small percentage of uh, impact as a perpetual royalty so that every single time that that NFT trades hands, it's going back and making an impact on a cause or a charity that they care about. Uh, why is this good? One is that it, it really gets away from the whole uh, model of just constantly asking for donations. You know, people can be making an impact, leaving a legacy and so on uh, just by launching an NFT. And they're still able to actually embed their own royalty into the NFT as well. So they can make money, make an impact even after they die. You know, the, the NFT in theory should go up in value and as it trades hands, they're leaving a legacy. Uh, so we are working with Little Phil on the side of this. So it's Little Phil's a partner of the project, which can help facilitate to over 58,000 charities through the Little Phil giving platform. Um, and which is also going to be able to help increase the transparency and engagement between, uh, you know, the impact that these NFTs are generating. Uh, a little bit about uh, the rest of our team. So we've worked in the space of uh, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and specifically from my, my point of view around not-for-profits uh, and social enterprises for around five years now. Um, we're supported by some of the best advisors and uh, crypto investors in the industry. And we're currently uh, in talks with a range of different marketplaces, uh, as well as some A-list celebrities and sports stars and movie stars and so on, who are really interested about how they can engage with NFTs without potentially tarnishing their brand or reputation. So, you know, many of these uh, celebrities that we've been speaking with have pondered the idea of launching an NFT, but out of fear of tarnishing their brand or reputation have been very hesitant now the ability for them to start to get some exposure to NFTs, create an impact on a cause or a charity they care about, and whether or not the NFT does well, and it does really well and helps the charity really well into the future, or whether it does not as well as they were hoping, either way, they've launched it to help create an impact. 
and it's much less likely that you know anyone's going to put much criticism for trying to help a charity by launching an NFT. Uh, happy to open the floor to questions and if anyone would like to connect and find out more about what we're doing my contact details are up on the screen so josh at projectxnft.com thank you awesome thank you so much josh uh one of the questions from oliver can you define how much percentage goes to the charities uh yeah great question so we we leave that up to the creator of the nft so minimum 1% and it could be up to 99%. Um, it really depends on what the creator wants to do. So for instance, uh, some of the creators that we're speaking with are celebrities that don't necessarily need the money. So they're more interested about making an impact and the percentage that they're willing to give is much higher than um, you know, somebody that may be emerging and you know, they're, they're still struggling and need to be able to have some kind of financial means coming in. Awesome. I know it's uh, one of the topics actually, you know, David mentioned it earlier, but that movement of, you know, NFTs that want to donate to charity or brands that want to donate to charity. This is a great mechanism uh, to facilitate that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Josh, thank you for your time and sharing your project. Um, I know that's top of mind for a lot of people. Uh, Jeremy asks, what would be the best place to reach you, Josh? Uh, so just josh at projectxnft.com. Uh, it's just on the screen now. Uh, I can put it in the chat. So keep your questions coming. I know Josh is going to stay in the, in the audience and answer any questions, but thank you for your time, Josh. No worries. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for everyone for listening in. All right, we're excited to announce the, the next panel. It's going to be an exciting one. Um, the topic will be Invest Like a VC, and we're going to be joined by Maria Shen, partner at Electric Capital, Lauren Stefanian, principal at Pantera Capital, and Ivan Leung, who commonly speaks about this topic and invest like a VC. So, so well-talked about topic, excited to hear uh, where this discussion goes. Hey, and just a disclaimer, uh, nothing is to be construed as investment advice. Please consult your professional when it comes out. This is uh, for informational entertainment purposes only. So welcome, Ivan, Maria. Great to have you back. Lauren. Hi. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so we'd love to kick it off with introductions from uh, Maria and, and Lauren and then uh, Ivan on uh, just background investing and um, nothing but respect for what you're all doing in the space. Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Maria. I'm a partner at a venture capital firm called Electric Capital. Electric Capital is a crypto focused um, early stage firm that's based in San Francisco. So we invest in um, uh, we're often first check-in and we can invest all the way up to a series A. Um, my background before joining Electric, I was co-founder and CTO of a supply chain startup, um, which is how I got into crypto in the first place, just dealing with a lot of cross-border payments. Um, and prior to that, I was at Microsoft for a couple of years, uh, worked, working on search technology as a PM there. So my background is in uh, computer science, I have a master's in computer science and as well as product. Lauren, yeah. I'd love to have you go next. Oh yeah, so so my name is Ivan. Um, I I'm actually a um, I do a media and consulting. So I run a family office for uh, investments and um, in crypto specifically. Uh, my background is uh, a molecular biologist uh, uh, in in um, for my major, and I actually uh, worked in the biotech industry um, when I first got out of college and worked at different financial firms. Um, one of them being Oppenheimer. And, um, and also various different uh, investment banking firms. And so started a YouTube channel. Uh, I also, I'm also known as CryptoBud. I do a lot of uh, work with projects and work as advisors and, um, and also run a, a, a kind of like a little small uh, educational group with some of my community members, so. Awesome, um, I'm Lauren. I'm a principal at Bantera Capital. We are, uh, 
the crypto focus fund, we have about like 5.5 billion AUM and we invest anywhere from seed to, uh, well, we started doing a, a number of growth stage deals as well, just because um, of how uh, late stage the, the companies uh, we're excited about are getting. Um, and then personally, my background is in uh, computer science. I used to be a software developer at a uh, trading platform called Fidesa, and um, I worked in trading after that at Bank of America, and then I joined Pantera around three years ago. Awesome. We have a very distinguished group here. Thank you for you know joining, and I'm excited to see where this is going because uh, there's a lot of projects and there's a lot of funds, and, and even the individual investor, they all, they all want to see the insights that you're, you guys see, um, you all see. So definitely see where this goes. Jeff, um, where do you want to take this? Yeah, Maria, uh, in terms of, I know the topic uh, for this panel is invest like a VC. And uh, you were last at our conference, uh, we're big fans of your developer report. And uh, maybe if you can just give some insights on what you're looking at at Electric Capital and even just uh, what's going on in the space, due diligence process, all the above. Yeah, well, um, thanks so much for that. Well, um, I, I, you know, there are a couple of things that we look at. The developer report that you mentioned is um, just for context. Um, everyone at the Electric Capital in, in, in the Electric Capital investment team um, are engineers by background, and so we actually end up writing a lot of code ourselves. One of the things we've done is um, crawled effectively the entirety of GitHub to figure out. Uh, where the open source repositories are in crypto and use that as a signal to understand the number of developers in the space. Um, and we publish a report every single year called the developer report that tracks how many developers are across Bitcoin and Ethereum, across crypto overall, um, you know, new layer ones, DeFi protocols, and everything else in between. Um, so that's certainly one of the signals that we look at. I think crypto companies are, are unique in that respect and that they are open source and they're so community oriented. And so a big part of it is, you know, how active are your communities? How active are your developers? Um, uh, if you're, you know, if you're forking code, are you also adding new features to it after the fact? Um, so that's certainly a big part of it that I think is, is different from traditional venture. Um, but there are also aspects that we look at that's, that's very similar to what traditional venture companies companies look at, like for traditional venture firms look at, which is stuff like, you know, what is your team composition? Um, even if it's a, you know, even if it's a decentralized project, you know, who are the people who are working on it? Who are the people who are excited about it? Um, are there moats in the business? Um, are there moats in the protocol as well? Is it easily, um, you know, is it something where someone can fork it and then take all the value away? Or are there certain things that, you um, uh, allow this protocol to be extremely successful and, and kind of have network effects and have moats around it. Um, you know, so, so in many ways, I think uh, crypto projects that we look at are reevaluate um, very similar to traditional companies as well. Thanks, Maria. That's one of my favorite reports in the, the whole space, by the way. <laughs> Maria, so what are you seeing today? Uh, you know, on piggybacking that that developer side of things, Mark Yusko was our keynote speaker today, and he, he mentioned those five internet protocols that are going to be disrupted: you know, FTP, TCP/IP. But uh, yeah, I would love to hear because I'm sure a lot has changed just from when we last spoke. Yeah, I mean, I you know, definitely a lot of new smart contract platforms are coming on the scene. I think there's been an opening uh, provided around transaction fees being very high on Ethereum. It's meant that a lot of layer one protocols that have lower transaction fees have been able to step in um, and, for example, build their own DeFi ecosystems that's very tailored to um, retail communities or enable new NFT use cases that um, you know, don't work on Ethereum, again, because of high gas prices, if it costs like $50, $80 to mint an NFT, then that's a very different use case than if it costs a fraction of a penny to mint NFTs. Um, you know, so certainly I think there's been a lot of developer activity 
um, on, uh, on things like Binance Smart Chain, which is more controversial in the crypto world, but uh, you know, definitely undeniable that they do have a lot of activity there. Um, we're also seeing a lot of activity across like Solana, Nervos, uh, Blackstack has had an uptake. Um, Near Protocol has seen a lot of um, activity in the NFT space. Um, they have minting platforms and artists and um, really interesting use cases that they're enabling because their transaction fees are so low. Um, Polkadot is, uh, uh, has, I think Polkadot and Cosmos at this point has um, more monthly active developers than Bitcoin. And so definitely quite a bit of activity there as well. Um, although just to caveat that it's not entirely a fair comparison because I think there's, um, you know, because these are smart contract platforms, there's a lot more developers in the ecosystem that are building on top of it. So not exactly an apples to apples comparison, but um, definitely a lot of interesting activity that, that we're seeing in the layer one space. Lauren or Ivan would love to hear from you. And really, uh, this is just a way for bounce ideas and would love to hear just different fund managers kind of share their insights on how it's a very uh, philosophical way to invest actually and in trying to predict the future. But yeah, feel free to chime in. Well, ladies first. <laughs> okay, we have Lauren again. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I would totally agree with Maria. Like, we're seeing a lot of activity on um, not necessarily moving away from Ethereum, but uh, like recreating uh, certain decentralized applications on top of other uh, layer one solutions, which is really exciting to see. I mean, especially for end users who, um, you know, <laughs> like don't want to pay $300 in gas fees for one transaction. Um, so that's, I mean, like one, definitely, uh, you know, we're seeing the same thing, but uh, I would say like, we've been focused pretty heavily on DeFi lately. And so we're seeing a number of applications uh, being built in that space. I think it's slowing down a little bit, but certainly for the past um, probably two, three months, we've been seeing like a huge wave of people coming uh, from you know, really top tier engineering companies uh, coming to build in the space. Yeah, just just to kind of hit upon that point. I mean, from the media side, I mean, um, I've been starting. I've been starting the. Uh, I had my channel back in seventeen in the cycle, and you know, the channel has grown substantially since then. And I've seen these different cycles of entrants coming in, and this year has been definitely the year of the VCs specifically, because we did have a lot of venture capital coming in in seventeen. But I mean, I was in the space since 2012. And so I've seen the growth of crypto and how it's changed a lot. But uh, this year specifically, I've seen a lot of growth and specifically decentralized finance and how uh, definitely there is a demand right now for alternative banking solutions that allowing hedge funds and very large players to come in to earn yields since obviously the interest rates are so low. So we're seeing a lot of, um, in, in, especially in my space and my, my, my industry, there's a lot of uh, applications for, and, and actually the expansion of decentralized finance in a much higher, higher, um, higher rate than I, I would have expected. Um, and obviously the growth of the NFTs have kind of allowed the, the retail to come in, but, uh, but that's kind of what I'm seeing on my end. It'll be interesting to see how DeFi evolves from here because crypto has this really rapid exponential growth kind of uh, innovative uh, a space versus Silicon Valley, which I think it's very, very, um, uh, I think Silicon Valley, I think has stopped innovating in many ways. And so I think a lot of the uh, big money is now flooding into crypto when literally a couple of years ago, it was just the laughing stock of, of, of Wall Street, so. When it comes to valuations for uh, yourselves uh, being VCs and you know some of the traditional models, Ethereum and and um, you know the conversation about it uh, being ultrasound money and this triple point asset now for Ethereum, like how do each of you value um, some of these protocols or even things that are in your portfolio? I guess, Maria, um, you have quite a bit of institutional investors at your fund. Is that correct? Is there a certain investment thesis that they look for in terms of expectations on uh, returns for these 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a it's a good question around how to value these protocols. Um, I mean, fundamentally, I think the the vision of crypto is extremely ambitious, right? Like on a technical level, um, it's it's really about how do you actually, you know, how do you create the system? How do you create this perfect system to coordinate human behavior? And how do you incentivize people in the right ways? Um, and in practice, in many ways, you're you're creating this new form of money and you're creating this new form of value, not to mention all of the applications that are being built on top of it. Um, I mean, even looking at Ethereum, I think there's a couple different ways to look at its value. Um, one way of looking at its value is similar to how a lot of people look at Bitcoin, which is um, like, what is the, uh, um, you know, what is the market cap of gold, for example? And we think that there are a lot of characteristics around Bitcoin and around Ethereum that are very similar to gold, um, especially with the way that uh, Ethereum is evolving, making it um, you know, possibly more deflationary. Um, there's going to be a semi-finite supply. It's going to be a lot more portable. It's going to be liquid. Um, and so certainly that's one way of looking at, uh, at how Ethereum can be valued. Um, I think there's a, you know, a ton of different ways you can look at it as um, what if Ethereum becomes um, a small global reserve currency. And um, as, you know, especially as uh, some of these other global reverse uh, global reserve currencies may see fluctuations in the future. Um, you know, is there going to be a kind of currency that's that's outside the control of governments that can actually be a, a currency that everyone else is using? And so that's, you know, if you look at um, what can Ethereum be worth if it were a global revert, uh, reserve currency, I think that's definitely another way of looking at it or as kind of a you know, the, the currency of a non-jurisdictional country. Um, so you definitely get into uh, some really big numbers there as well. Um, so, you know, I, I do think, uh, and then you can also do some more traditional ways of valuing, like you can do, you can look at it as um, uh, through kind of a discounted cash flow of the gas that Ethereum is producing and kind of what, what is the expectation that uh, as usage grows and as trans transaction grows, like what does that mean for Ethereum's value? Um, you can also look at it as, you know, what does it mean if Ethereum is the settlement layer for the global, uh, for this really extensive and global um, financial stack? And what is that worth? Uh, or what is ETH worth if, um, you know, again, the entire global financial stack is, is now built on top of it um, and ETH value effectively has to underpin the value of everything else. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of these, um, there are a lot of assumptions that kind of go in and it just depends on what you believe in, but, um, um, you know, fundamentally you can look at it as this is something that, um, that, that kind of is is very different and, and is um, it's like a pivotal change in how we look at like financial history or we can look at it in more traditional ways and you know evaluating it through a DCF or something like that as well. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of different valuation techniques I would say. So, so, um, so yeah, so one of the ways we, we do it because uh, we actually have to look at the, uh, the, the evaluation metrics for this to figure out how high can Ethereum go before our next cycle? So we use the halvening cycle for Bitcoin as a way to determine um, prior valuations of how far we can go. Because with every single cycle, and that occurs every four years of Bitcoin cycle, is we begin to get valuations that become stretched, usually due to euphoria and a lot of capital coming in. The first metric we use for Bitcoin is stack to flow, which is basically the amount of supply coming in versus the demand. And that kind of traditionally has worked out in a rough estimate. Now, a lot of these models are not necessarily like really, really 100% um, accurate. There's always going to be, you know, a little bit of a margin of error. But one of them is, has to do with the deflationary aspect of Bitcoin, which has to do with the halvening. So the halvening is a huge one, which encompasses the large crypto market. And so the crypto market currently is pushing at about $2 trillion. So our last cycle was about at $800 billion. So usually what happens is we end up 
moving into this top end range. And we take a look at how much Bitcoin is being produced and how much um, that's going flooding into the supply. So one metric we use is in Bitcoin's case is specifically is minor distribution um, addresses. And we also take a look at how much supply is out in the market versus the demand and also uh, the on-ramps, the fiat on-ramps that come in. And so there's, we usually do a couple of calculations to try to figure out Bitcoin's price before it tops out and then it crashes because it usually has these like multi-year cycles. Now for Ethereum's case, it's a little different because uh, we're going into the EIP-1559 protocol upgrade next uh, in about two months. And that's going to change uh, Ethereum's supply which is going to make it deflationary. So we take a look for our, um, obviously, revenue transactions and how much um, that's going to grow with the network. And so uh, obviously we're using Ethereum fees, specifically the gas fees are being paid in um, versus and we use a PS multiple. So price to sales ratios, um, taking a look at it from almost kind of like an equity perspective. Um, the, only, the only issue with these type of models is that because Ethereum is so, it's growing exponentially, the problem with the PS models is that they fluctuate too much. So what we use is another metric, which is TVL volume locked in DeFi projects, which we take a look at the decentralized finance um, uh, liquidity that's being locked up using Ethereum smart contracts, and then calculate a price to uh, a price evaluation against that to figure out how much value Ethereum can generate for the next five years. And usually traditional equity models are, are, are going out for about five, 10 years. The problem with, with crypto is that because the tech is changing so fast, we have to adjust the models to compensate for that. So prior to Ethereum's explosion in DeFi, they were basically using um, very basic models, kind of like the inflationary rates, uh, how much, how much, what's the inflation rate for that specific year. But now with decentralized finance, what we're finding out is that there is going to be a lot of demand for smart contracts, which eventually um, lock up a lot of the ETH. And, mm -hmm. and we use the TBL volume to market cap to figure out how much valuation there is um, overall the entire DeFi project. So we have Ethereum in the DeFi space, Ethereum as a store, store value, which is becoming like that reserve asset almost. And then Ethereum as a commodity, which is going to be used as a transactional piece. And between all these three, you come up with a valuation model that almost is very similar to like oil. And so versus uh, Bitcoin, which has a valuation very similar to like gold, and if you take a look at the gold market relative to Bitcoin's digital asset, you kind of have an idea for where the valuation should be. But uh, I think using traditional metrics is kind of like where we're heading at at this point, just because now these were cash flow positive um, projects. Uh, back in 17, they weren't generating a lot. And in fact, Ethereum's transaction volume were actually almost like nothing, uh, aside from the ICOs where people were using it for fundraising. And so now we're seeing is uh, Ethereum is definitely um, a cash generating cow. And you know, a lot of that, I mean, a lot of that is, is really interesting because it's transparent and, and through yeah. the blockchain, you can see all of this data flow and kind of like what Maria is saying, even, even the dev developers checking in their work on GitHub, you can see how much people are actually, how active these communities are. Um, it's really a unique time to, to look at these kind of signals, um, kind of like this big data approach. I wanted to hear from Lauren, like, what is, what is your take? I know at Pantera, you guys are, are ma massive. You guys have a very big picture perspective because of the reach and the projects you have access to. Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, valuing certain projects uh, in crypto, I would like basically agree with Maria. Like there's a number of ways that you can look uh, at, at um, you know, what they're trying to do and, and think about like on a macro level, like where is this going? How many people do I think are gonna be using this? You can also look at comparables. And I think all of us have been in this space so long that we have data to show like, you know, even if something is just a white paper and has no traction, like if it's a layer one, for example, and say like, I haven't already invested in a number of layer ones, I'd look to other layer ones to see, you know, what kind of valuation, if this is successful, um, can this get? And then on the flip side, yeah, you do have, um, for live projects, you do have real um, transaction fees that, you know, a portion of the revenue might be going to token holders and you can calculate, you know, how much as a token holder you'd be making from the revenues that are going to you. Uh, you can look at if it's um, a buy and burn model, like, 
burn kind of is also could be, you know, similar to, to revenue. So there's a lot of different factors and it, I think it like really varies project to project. What are some signals that would say an everyday investor would, you would point them in the direction to, because things are changing so fast these days and these burn models, yeah, we're seeing this more and more. But just a question from the community is what, 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 what is a good signal? What is there to look for? I know we're wrapping up into the final eight minutes. Any tips? I mean, my favorite one is like, would I use the product? Um, Cause that is <laughs> like what generates value in the long-term. Yeah, I think the others, I, I agree. I mean, is this thing useful? Do you see people use it? Do you see yourself using it? I, I think it's a huge signal. Um, besides that, I think, again, community is a huge part of crypto. Um, and what we've seen from Yearn Finance, for example, is that, um, you know, it, like you can try to, you can try to fork it, but you're not going to be able to catch up to how quickly they're building features and how active their community is. Um, you know, I, I think also interesting examples between like Uniswap and SushiSwap, where you can fork the code, um, but if your community sticks with you, then um, you're just going to have longevity in the ecosystem. And so I think that community signal is is huge to look at. Just you know, looking through their Discord and their Twitter, um, and and seeing if if you know, just actually just hang out there for a little bit and seeing is everyone just asking about prices and you know, wondering like, okay, like when when moon or are there people who are like yeah like let's build against this like hey i created this cool project on top of it or like are people actually talking about use cases and are people really really excited i think that's um that's certainly a huge signal and then i i think on a quantitative side making sure that you understand the token economics of the project as well like what is the inflation rate is it um you know are they burning the tokens is it fixed um, is it fixed supply or is it flexible supply? What is the inflation in the beginning? How is the inflation going to change going forward? Um, and just being able to convince yourself that this is um, this is something that you know if you do purchase the tokens or you do choose to participate, um, that the that the actual the way that the economics of the tokens are structured actually makes sense. So um, yeah, go ahead. yeah. So I'll kind of add to that, and I think these are all great points. Um, honestly, the the biggest value that token holders have is is how much yield they're going to get. So what we saw with Yearn and with Curve Vaults that they introduced, and SushiSwap is a great example of uh, two different systems with Uniswap. So SushiSwap had a incentivized uh, liquidity pools for a lot of large uh, funds. And Uniswap went the other approach. They didn't actually introduce the governance token until later, which started off kind of like the whole DeFi kind of arms race. Uh, at the end of the day, people really only care about one thing, and that's to make money. Um, the community, I think, is very interested in the technology, but at this, uh, usually in these cycles, what a lot of people get attracted to is number one, token price, and number two is the fact that that they're um, they're having a token. That is not being that's being valued by generating more value by by attracting more capital. And at the end of the day, I think uh, if you take a look at Uniswap's um, ascent to the top ten um, range, really came from the fact that they were able to align themselves with their early investors and also create a governance token that was able to uh, provide value for the people who came in early. A lot of projects tend to not do that. They don't have a, a structure or a model and work well with their early investors. And so what happens there is that they end up um, having a lot of what they call shit coins. <laughs> so, and so what we're seeing right now is a lot of, there's an arms race right now for in DeFi for high yield and also for the fact that they want to be able to attract all the largest, the largest uh, capital out there and to provide liquidity uh, into the system. So uh, companies or projects that have very high, very good tokenomics um, that are able to um, leverage that incentive system, I think are going to do well. And, and as an example, I think Uniswap, you know, proved itself. Um, same thing with some of the larger projects that that have done well. There are a lot of projects jumping on the stage, and I know it's like, is it the highest yield? But then some of the some of the presenters that we had earlier was, hey, look at the project, you know, look at look at the team. Who who are the people actually developing them? You know, are they even going to be around? And what are they doing with your what you're staking in there? So it's interesting to see, um, you know, not just to chase that yield, but look look a little deeper, look at who who's behind that project. Uh, we have a question from the community. 
Uh, Oliver, thank you for asking the question. He says, uh, when pitching projects to VCs, uh, do we, can we expect NDAs to be signed or are VCs not opposed to signing projects with NDAs? This is actually a common question. Love to hear from the two of you. Uh, um, I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, I feel like we're probably going to say some more things. But typically, we don't tend to sign NDAs. Um, and that's just a common thing, theme you see across like most VC funds, I would say. I, I think it's more and more common when you get to later and later stage companies. I'm assuming the same for you, Maria. Um, yeah, I, I would act, I would say I'm happy to sign an NDA. Um, and generally speaking, you know, we we don't share the information. Um, and there's there's kind of a lot of trust involved, anyways. Um, but I, uh, I I think unless you're creating something, you know, really highly technical in 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 a different way, I would be a little bit skeptical around NDAs, especially in crypto when so many things are being developed in the open. Um, I think it's, uh, um, yeah, sometimes I, 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 I guess, especially in crypto, I would wonder um, why an NDA is necessary. I agree. It's kind of against uh, the mantra of the open ethos. source and ethos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so generally speaking, I, I mean, I think there has to be some kind of basic level of trust that. But Maria, Lauren, and Ivan just wanted to say thank you. And, and any last closing thoughts? A lot of people here look up to all of you. And when they, a you know, topic, invest like VCs, really want to understand your mental models for how you uh, really just uh, invest in general. So anything um, in closing you'd like to share with the community? Maria, do you want to go first? Um. Yeah, I, I think for people who are looking to invest in crypto, um, I would say two things. One is obviously do your homework, and I'm sure a lot of people are, are already doing that. But I think the second thing is, um, you know, be in it for the long term and just looking in the next like five years and 10 years, I, I truly believe crypto is going to be transformational. So when you do make those investments or when you do decide to participate in an ecosystem, um, definitely think about the long-term value and whether they're going to be around or whether it makes sense to spend your time here. Um, and then if, if it does, then I would encourage you to, on top of buying the tokens to actually, um, you know, help the ecosystem out, whether that's helping with their governance, uh, helping with their documentation, writing code. Um, I, I think there's a lot of value to be gained there. Awesome. Thanks, Maria. Lauren. Thank you. Yeah, hundred percent. I'd say like, just, I mean, if you're interested in the space, like get involved. I think there's, it's, it's so open to everyone, especially with the explosion of DAOs. Um, there's number like tons and tons of ways you can, you know, provide value to networks, learn from them and, and, you know, kind of learn by doing, uh, which I think is super unique to, to the crypto space. Thanks, Lauren and Ivan. Finish yeah. So, so I would just say that, you know, for someone who's been in the space for a while here, I would say that we're, we're literally at, at I'd, I'd say at the next evolution of, of tech. And I think that Silicon Valley is just going to come over here. And I think anybody who thinks that if we do have a market drop or we have, cause Bitcoin is, is, and just in crypto in general is very volatile is anybody who's coming into the space is just basically don't, don't uh, stay the course, just pretty much stay the course because we're literally witnessing the birth of, of the internet uh, 2.0. And, and, and I think um, we've had, we've had, if you were here when Amazon and Google and, and all these companies started back in the 2000s, I think um, we are literally at a juncture point where this is going to be the most disruptive type of technology that I believe is going to transform a lot of people's lives. And, and even though uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technology has changed a lot and there's a lot of, a lot of things happening in the space every single day, um, we're going to mature and we're going to become a lot. Uh, this entire industry is going to grow much bigger than many, what many people expect. And I think $2 trillion market cap total for crypto is literally a drop in the bucket compared to what type of industries it's disrupting. So for anybody who gets phased, whoever gets scared and says, you know what, this crypto is not for me or whatnot, we're still very early in the actual cycle, um, in the long-term cycle. We're talking about 10, 20 years out. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Lauren, for your words of insights. You're all very well respected in the community. I'm actually so happy to have uh, you join our conference. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, thank everyone. you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's move on to our next group. Excited for this uh, next panel. We have women leaders in blockchain. So this one is Maria, thank you for staying staying on the second panel. <laughs> but no I, I hope to unpack a lot uh, here because um, this is a well-talked about topic. Welcome, Lynn. Hello. How are you? Good. Nice to see you all. Maria, it looks like you're just going strong. <laughs> <laughs> I made a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> All right. well, welcome, Lynn. We'd love a quick introduction from yourself, and then we can get into it. Thank you. Uh, so Lynn Liss, COO and co-founder of both Acoin and Acoin NFT with artist and global leader Acon. Um, and should I go into background? I thought, I didn't know if we were waiting for one other person. Yeah, let's go into backgrounds. I love, I'm personally very curious to learn more about you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll say, and this is only something that came up uh, as I moved into the crypto and blockchain space, my very earliest background was launching a startup bank in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I got, you know, just really giddy about all things financial, operational, and innovations. Um, I went from there into uh, global consulting. And so I worked with a lot of the earlier banking and financial innovations um, with Bearing Point, KPMG, CGI, was around when checks turns into um, images, right? Which sounds just silly. Electronic banking and digitizing checks was like a really big thing where all the banks had to come together and really uh, make a pivotal change in how finances operated. And I then moved into uh, social impact. I moved into startups, you know, web 2.0s came out and I never thought I'd talk about my banking background, but I can see, you know, really blockchain and crypto is that next huge evolution in the financial industry. It's where everyone has to come together and see things differently, understand that we can have currencies that exist beyond the banks, that we can trade um, digital financial assets together all the way to things like NFTs. Um, so it's really exciting and just to short circuit to um, how I came into Acoin, uh, as mentioned, I had spent about 10 years in the social impact space, um, stemming from my experience with several, uh, what I know everyone's saying Web 2.0, you know, Web 2.0 from my perspective was, um, you know, the Facebook community. So I'd done a lot of social impact slash Web 2.0 community builds and um, then spent about a year advising companies that were doing ICOs. Um, when those were such a thing. And primarily, again, only in the social impact space. And so no one was doing that yet. You know, I think I just heard your last panel and it's still such a nascent space. Um, no one was advising, you know, how to move into the social good space of blockchain and cryptocurrency then. Um, my husband was, um, who's been in the entertainment industry for years, introduced me to Acon, my partner, John Karras. And we launched Acoin, which is a cryptocurrency for Africa, a DAP ecosystem for Africa. And about two years spent in that space, which I'm sure we'll dive into. Um, we also got pulled more recently, about six months ago, into the NFT space. So we launched Acoin NFT, which builds on the brand of Acoin and our experience in blockchain and cryptocurrency. Um, it really leverages our teams, especially Akon and John um, Karras's massive experience in the entertainment space. This is an artist community. We have an artist first ethos. It's really a consultative model, um, bringing artists all the way through the life cycle of how to ideate an NFT and bring it to market um, through our platform. So we just uh, recently launched and many big things to come. Hopefully many more, many more announcements to come. That's awesome what you're doing. And oh, absolutely. Interesting to hear about your background, how, how it brought you to where you are. Um, and actually one of the topics uh, we wanted to bring up is, yeah, you, 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 we went on this trajectory and you got to where you are uh, and it kind of brought you to blockchain, crypto, and now NFTs. Um, you know, one of, one of the topics that is often talked about is 
um, how to get more women into these spaces, especially in this, this cutting edge. And the both of you are definitely on the cutting edge and very, you know, reputable projects that you're working on. Um, how do we approach this from like a societal perspective? How do we get more women to be involved in projects like, like this industry? And I'd like to hear from the both of you. I'll start and Maria, you can follow up. Um, I'll say it's the reason I did this panel. I actually <laughs> a bit shy away from, you know, women in blockchain or women in anything initially, because I think, oh, you know, why does it have to be that way? You know, we have a whole conference and then we have this women in, but I went to, um, I was just telling this story over dinner the other day. I went to graduate school at University of Chicago and it was at the time where there were no men in the program. And I, I didn't think about it looking back, but um, I didn't think about it then, but looking back, I can see that uh, they needed more women. You know, it was a movement. And I think in this same way, you know, I'm proud to put myself out there as women in blockchain and crypto to put a face to something that could be scary to other women. They might think it's too technical or too confusing. Um, so I think for me, it's about, you know, with Maria, it's putting a face that women are leaders in this industry. Um, and then on a personal level, I spend a lot of time, anybody who has a skill. So, you know, when I speak to lawyers, traditional lawyers or accountants, who have just a peak of interest in this space, I really just take a lot of time convincing them just to dive in, learn everything you can in this space. It is all out there, right? I mean, I know every one of us on this panel just spend oodles amount of time on medium and videos and articles because there's something new every day. We don't know everything. It's changing overnight. Um, so they can do the same. I mean, you can become an expert, right? Um, pretty quickly and obviously you'll have to take the skill you have and then apply it to this industry, but that that's the art that they can do in their, their trade. Um, so I think to me, it's about inspiring others to, again, take their skill and apply it to this industry and it's needed. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel, but, and women, um, but I, I feel we're constantly in need of, you know, better lawyers, better accountants, you know, again, every trade along this business marketing, you know, we, we need more and more. So that's my, my spin on it, Maria. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I, I, I also, uh, I also <laughs> feel some type of way about women in, in blockchain type uh, panels, but I, I agree. I think um, it is important to, to show up and kind of put a face to um, women in the industry. And um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think probably part of what's been really interesting about NFTs recently is that it's brought in a completely different set of audience members, audience members to crypto. Um, prior to NFTs, you know, obviously DeFi, uh, I think brought in a lot of new users. Um, but the culture around DeFi is, you know, very kind of like very aggressive. Um, and uh, not, you know, I, I would say like not always you know, not always the most like enlightened uh, when it comes to feminism. Um, and I think the, the interesting thing about NFTs is it's actually brought in this um, really interesting mix of creators who are curious about crypto. Um, we've put out this survey to just figure out like who are the people who are creators in crypto right now. And, you know, over half are people who come from the art and design industry um, who are not coming from traditional crypto industries. A third are coming from, um, from people who have never interacted with crypto at all. And I think, you know, it's not really just about bringing more women into the industry. It's about how do we bring in more of a mix of people into crypto overall? How do we bring in, um, you know, just kind of a different set of skill sets? Um, I think if you look at uh, part of part of the question around like you know DeFi protocols are not known for their wonderful design, and I think part of that is just because um, you have you have a very specific set of people who are constantly making products um, for for like a very specific crypto audience, and I think you know with NFTs and, and with crypto just going more and more mainstream, 
you're going to have a lot of um, interesting perspectives coming into the crypto for the first time. And, and part of that is going to be women, but definitely a lot of other groups as well. Um, if I could add just one uh, thing, you're inspiring me about something we're really heavy into. So, cause it, it's, you're spot on, you know, it isn't just women, it's different types of people. Um, and we found the same. It's that it's bringing creators in, many of which are women, many of which are different ethnicities, you know, it's all, it's the whole yeah. gamut. So we're spending a huge amount of time. We did our first test launch just a few weeks ago before we do our really big, big A-star name campaigns, which I can't wait to share, hopefully on your next conference, um, but to do educational videos. So we're doing a whole round of how-to videos. I mean, surprisingly, there's not that many great, one out, uh, great ones out there, explainer videos, and really trying to come at it from the artist and creator's point of view, because not only making the the purchasing process simple, how to get a MetaMask wallet, how to get Ethereum. Um, it's such a cool opportunity to mainstream crypto and blockchain through NFTs is definitely um, something we're aware of and focused on and, and proud to be a part of. So you're, you're spot on with that, Maria. And thank you, Lynn and Maria. And, and really we're champions for diversity and maybe the panel should have been called just diversity in blockchain. And uh, you know, Lynn coming from a banking background I remember finance conferences where the, there's this particular look and feel. And then when you attend a crypto conference and it's beautiful seeing the diversity where people aren't wearing suits and ties, like at a traditional finance event, but people are walking in looking like they came from Burning Man. And it's just this yeah. celebration of like art and finance. I know the discussion was about NFTs versus crypto, but it's beautiful. And that's been the overall theme of just the world coming together with uh, this technology. So th thanks. Yeah. Absolutely. Here, here. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, it's so funny. Just to echo that statement Jeff was saying, uh, when we, we used to go to the crypto conferences, you'd be able to spot the, the early adopters and they, they'd really look so unique. And it was almost a collection of really unique ideas that defined the entire movement, right? The, you, I, you know, you watch the documentaries, you see the personalities behind them they're really unique in the way they see things. And it didn't just come from a single mindset. I think that's why um, you, we do need diversity, uh, all types, in order for this industry to go where it needs to go, because we do want to hit mass adoption. And we're not going to hit that if we just have the same ideas or same UI or you know the same, same thing over and over again. We don't want to hit that again. Yeah, it's something um, interesting you know, we've moved into such a Zoom audience uh, once, you know, the lockdown occurred and we had COVID strike. And I sort of miss in a way, this is gonna sound strange, but not seeing who I was working with for a little while, you know, there was sort of, I remember we worked with someone on our team who's so young, you don't really even know it, you know, until then we saw him on video all the time. We're like, man, he's really young, you know, or recognizing somebody that you didn't realize was a certain ethnicity or um you know a certain look or style of person it's again all at the same time it's so cool to see that and then embrace it all and say oh, look at all this amazing that we get from different people but um yeah this this industry if there's any industry to me uh, that is just a myriad of you know beautiful skills beautiful people and such diversity is the word you're using correctly um it's phenomenal we're all lucky to be here i'd like to um, pivot the talk just a little bit and just talk about some of the challenges because i know if a coin uh, actually it's interesting a lot of people are asking about the a coin wallet but i'd love to hear from the both of you what are those challenges you're facing um you know at electric capital a coin like how how are we solving the biggest challenges and what are you looking at right now you know going into potentially this, you know, 2021, the fourth, the fourth year of that crypto cycle. Yeah, I'll speak just because I'm happy to hear my A coiners are out there. Hey, um, they know well, you know, we, we all know we deal in the US with uh, significant regulatory compliance, just not even issues, just confusion. And, you know, it's not clear yet where it's all going to go. But it, it's also there um, in Africa, which is where our A coin currency is focused and it's taken just uh, miles to get to even 
have a payment processor that can come into our wallet, which we've launched in Kenya so that we could expand it globally. We're there, we finally got past the compliance, but it's you know restricted to certain regions um, because they're going through their own psychology of um, where to apply regulations. And I'm happy to see, and Kenya is a good example where they're just applying a tax, right? So, you know, yes, it's moving away from traditional government, but as long as the revenue stream is still coming in and we're fine, right? So let's apply the tax to that. But in Nigeria, it's shut down and they're choking the payment processors, right? So it, it will evolve, it will change. Um, and then that, so that's on our ACOIN front. That bleeds into our NFT front just, just lightly in two ways. Um, we wanna do some really cool things by bringing ACOIN into Uniswap, but we're struggling with, um, we've always focused on being non-North American from a, a, a global perspective, again, just to keep our focus on Africa. But in this case, if we could put in some cool staking mechanisms around purchasing NFTs and getting you know, early access and whatnot. So we're looking into it because the P2P space is really complicated. I don't think you know the SEC has put even their stance on it yet. It, it's peer to peer, so it should be out of the realm. It's NFTs, so it's a collectible, right? So you feel like you're pretty safe, but I think the lack of clarity, you know, um, puts us in again risk averse and trying to be cautious on that front. Um, so to me, I think I think that's one big area: regulation, compliance, just trying to really follow the right lines. Um, and then I think, as mentioned before, I think education, you know, both in the NFT space and then also um, just generally cryptocurrency and blockchain, it is about raising everyone's education um, to bring more people into the industry, but that's happening. So I feel really strong and confident on that front. Um, yeah, I think are, when you talk about challenges, are you asking about um, like challenges in the crypto industry that you see? Yeah, I kind of want to transition to, to another point later, but uh, yeah, challenges in the crypto industry right now. And then I think that the next point would be transitioning to some of those challenges with uh, increasing diversity. So I you know from an investment standpoint and also for yeah. Lynn, even the influencers you choose to work with, your ambassadors, I, I, that that is a transition I was going to go for, but uh, you asked first. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think challenges in the crypto industry, a big one um, is just getting, like from my perspective, I think it's getting more developers, getting more founders into the space. It's getting more designers into the space. Um, and that kind of flows out to, you know, how do you, now that we have this really rich DeFi ecosystem, um, how do you actually onboard more people onto it and, and make it something that's like very, you know, that's very accessible to all the new people that's come into crypto. Um, and I think that will take, uh, you know, that will take more design talent coming into crypto, for example, to, to make that happen. Um, I mean, I, I think part of what's great about crypto is there are actually so many challenges, which makes it very exciting. Um, I think in the NFT space, there's a lot of, um, there's, there's, uh, there's at this point, it's very easy to make your own NFTs. Um, there's lots of minting platforms, but then I think there's this opportunity for there to be um, social ties based on the types of NFTs that you have. So can we start mapping out a social graph of like, who are the creators and, um, you know, who are their collectors and, and can people start interacting with each other? And so I kind of see this gap of like an Instagram for NFTs um, stepping in to, to really organize some of this data. I feel like NFTs right now feel a little bit like um, websites in the early 90s before, you know, maybe before Google came along and really organized it. It feels, it feels very, very raw. And I think we're going to start, um, you know, obviously there was a lot of curation, powerful curation platforms and, and curators coming into the space. So I think that's going to be a huge thing going forward. But then I also think there's going to be uh, there's going to need to be a lot of social signals feeding into um, the discovery and the organization of NFTs. And, um, you know, I definitely see that as kind of like an open opportunity in crypto as well. Awesome. And moving into that second follow-up question is how do, how do we increase the, like, 
diversity challenges and even from an investor point of view and who you choose to work with? I'd, I'd love to tackle that one. Yeah, I think the way I look at um, you know increasing diversity is you really have to do the work for outreach. It's not about just sitting on your hands and waiting for more people to come into your top of funnel. It's about um, first of all, you know, making making your website or or making however you present yourself outwardly um, very open to very aware of the kind of language that you're using to make sure that. Um, everyone who reads it won't self-select out based on the type of language that you're using um, in your job descriptions, on your websites, um, making sure people can see that this is a place where they can apply. Um, so I think that's that's one part of it, um, like kind of like uh, the bare minimum that you would have to do. But I do think there's a lot of homework that everyone should go out to do in terms of engaging with um, uh, you know, organizations that do try to bring in women and more diversity into the space, like She256 does a great job of that um, in bringing in more people into the top of funnel. And so engaging with organizations like that and seeing, um, and, you know, seeing basically, are there people that you can work with in there? Um, but I do think, you know, once you get applicants through the door, I think women, um, as well as like, anyone like people of color or anyone else that you feel like is lacking in the crypto space should be evaluated in the same way as everyone else. I don't think there should be a special rubric for, for women um, to get investments versus anyone else. But I do think um, that pipeline is important, making sure that your pipeline looks at least equitable among you know teams that you're talking to that are led by women and teams that are talking to that are led by men. Um, I definitely think we can do a much better job with that as well. But um, I do think it's about, you know, just to kind of summarize, I think it's about increasing that top of funnel. And then once everyone comes in, I think treating everyone fairly and, and looking at everyone on the, based on the same rubric. Um, here, here, I echo all things you're saying, and I can see it's clearly from that investment focus. Um, when I look at any startup I've worked with, um, but I'll just speak to Acoin and Acoin NFT, it also really starts from the top, right, from leadership. So not only would I not work with um, women and men that didn't landscape and look for the best talent. And in this case, um, you know, just speak to Akon and John, they're, it's not even that they're pro-women. I mean, they are, but they're pro-human. <laughs> and so many of the people they bring to the table just simply have the right skill set the right you know vision the right talents um and just evenly across the board also are women or you know individuals of different ethnicities or different age ranges um so it's phenomenal to see but i i think you know it's just no longer the boys club it's not working with people that sort of will keep you know glass ceilings on anybody um so to me, it's just all very natural. It's how we operate. Um, but I think if there are other organizations, you know, and you had to redefine them, it would be redefining. It's all the, the levers that you just spoke to, Maria, but it's also starting at the top and making sure you have leadership that is, you know, color, gender, every single category in the book blind in that way. Um, and then they will naturally um, bring in the right ratios of people because they're out there in those ratios. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, just being conscious of the words that you even use on the website, right? It's just making sure that people don't self-select them themselves out. That was, I really, um, I feel like that's some people just accept words and they just put marketing words that they don't really think twice about. So that's a really good call to action that, you know, at the entire crypto community, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually haven't heard, heard that one yet. And I, yeah, I, I don't think people are are consciously, you know, when they write a job description, yeah. they're like, oh, I want to make sure no women applies to this. Like, I doubt anyone's, you know, I think everyone's well intentioned, um, but I think just being very conscious and, and very like being very cognizant of what you are putting down and how you could be um, interpreted by the people who are reading these job descriptions or websites or whatever marketing materials. You know, I'll I'll add to that. I'm going to take a leap here, but I feel like we're all going through it to a degree. You know, I'm the most, again, pro-human, my entire team is, but we grew up saying, hey, guys, 
right? I mean, isn't that something that even in those words, you know, shifting to say, you know, humans or peoples or, you know, it, it, it um, aligns with what you're saying. You know, it's really cool to see those evolutions happening so quickly because if it did ever, you know, offend or exclude someone in a conversation even, um, we're seeing that happen in real time in our human race, which is really cool. So everything, uh, again, echoing what you're saying in terms of your branding and your positioning and your copy all the way to conversations that you have as a team and as a company, it's really special to be a part of them. Yeah, even myself, I was catching myself on the last panel and it's, you know, you're just so accustomed to saying things, but you know, you, you have to be more conscious, um, you know, today. Yeah. And it's just it's just right to be so. Uh, we are going into the final three minutes. Uh, any closing remarks from the two of you? Um, I like to say on every panel because we're still early enough. You know, between our DAP ecosystem with an Acoin, we love to rally people to come and join us. As long as you want to be in Africa, and we'll be moving beyond Africa into other developing countries. But that's our initial focus. And you're willing to trade in a coin so that's the utility we are curating the best app snaps and really providing a marketing platform and a really cool easy experience to go into those tools and services for entrepreneurs reach out um and then on the nft side um watch for uh these next couple of days we have our marketplace launching so you'll be able to see a lot of the cool both um up and coming artists, artists you want to know, artists you definitely know and want to see the NFTs they're doing. We're, we're certainly, we're definitely serving as that curated um, vision into those um, artist campaigns. And they're really special because we're spending a lot of deep consultative time with each artist to develop just an amazing rollout and not just one drop, but an ongoing, you know, a year of drops with these artists. So we feel really um, honored to take this journey with them. Uh, and you'll also be excited to see what they bring to life. So if you're an artist, also watch us and come and join us and be a part of that journey. And thank you for having me. This is fun. I wish it was longer. I feel like there's more Marie and I could riff on maybe next time. Yeah, well, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having this panel. I think um, not every conference thinks about kind of including diversity and women in, into the conversation. So I think it's really important that you do. Um, I guess two parting thoughts. One is that one thing everyone can do to um, to kind of support women is just to amplify the women in their networks. So if you see, you know, your women coworkers or people in the ecosystem who are women who are doing really cool things, um, retweet them and amplify their message. Um, but I think the other really important thing is only do that if you actually think they said something good. Um, if they said something intelligent, because you don't want to set like a different standard for like what's what's uh, you know what's good what's good to amplify versus what's not. I think you know women should definitely be held up to the same standards and same bar as everyone else. Um, but if you can go out of your way to see if there are women in your life that you can that you really respect and you think are super smart and you want to amplify. Um, and then I think the second parting thought is um, you know if there are. Um, women or people of color in the audience who are have questions around um, whether they're working on something interesting or um, they're thinking about working on something and they just want perspective from uh, someone who's working in venture. I'm very happy to have that conversation. Um, feel free to just DM me on Twitter. My messages are open and I'm always happy to chat. Maria, Lynn, will be cheering you on from the sidelines and on Twitter, sharing your projects with our community and uh, again, big fans. And so, um, yeah, need more uh, people like you in this space. So keep rocking it all until <laughs> next time. <laughs> a lot of, a thank lot you, of thanks Maria. from the community. So <laughs> thank you for sharing those insights. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for having us. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. All right, so we heard it. Um, moving on to our next topic, we have our project presenter, Melissa Ohm. She's the director of Charitable Strategy. Uh, very relevant, very good transition um, from our last topic. Um, she's the R and D strategy, Charitable Strategy R and D at Hope.
Melissa, welcome to the stage. Yes. Hello. <laughs> can you hear me well? I was trying to set it up. Yep, you're How good. You I can hear you great. You great can too. hear me? Yep. Awesome. Hey, thank you for holding the stage for all this long, Ivan and Jeffrey. You guys have been like really holding the fort and, you know, it, it takes so much time and it's been such a beautiful thing to see all the conversations happening. So thank you for creating this space and look at those beautiful smiles. You're actually Melissa, we, Melissa, Ivan and I, we get so much energy out of just talking to people. And so it's... if anything, this beats anything else we'd be doing. So we really okay. love it and talking to people like you. Well, and you're doing a great job, you know, bringing people together in the industry at this time when people are, you know, working from home and, you know, there's less gatherings happening. It's just such a wonderful opportunity. And thanks for having us. I also can't believe I'm preceded by a wonderful panel on women in blockchain. And I see that the closing uh, panel is on real world crypto. So it fits with us. Like, I just feel like it's like the perfect placement as well. So thanks for having us. Yeah, excited to learn more about your project. So Melissa, I'll give you uh, at the one minute mark, a little warning, but yeah, you have the stage and excited to, you have a lot of fans here. I'm seeing a lot of uh, <laughs> Go Melissa, Hope Token. <laughs> there, there you, you go. Have it. it's, it's a community project. So that's what happens. You just bring the communities together. So beautiful. And uh, just before I know, Ivan, that we were talking, you know, about uh, a way to kind of segue into our project. And I just want to bring up this um, recent donation that Vitalik did, because we are talking about the, the convergence of charity and crypto in this presentation that I'm giving you today. And this recent, uh, you know, crazy gift that he made um, to the uh, COVID relief in India, which was like a billion dollars worth of crypto. Um, not only did the coin crash in price, but also the Indian government was left with this a crazy issue of actually having, um, you know, not knowing what to do and how to handle with such a big gift um, because it destabilized, uh, you know, how do you, who's going to cash all this money? How is this going to be dealt with? Uh, so, you know, beautiful, beautiful intention on the one hand and then forcing the conversations that we're all seeing right now with all of this um, new money and new interest in the crypto and blockchain space right so we are basically at this at this really interesting point where uh, crypto is finally having to really integrate in some really powerful ways with some of the things that we do in the in the real world and um, i just wanted to reference that because it is just it illustrates a lot of what we're dealing with at hope token so we are, I'll tell you more details about our project, but we are uh, um, charity crypto token in the Binance Smart Chain Network. And uh, we're super young. We just started our project about a month and a half ago and we're so excited. We're babies uh, in a way, but we have such a large and ambitious vision for our project that we know we're gonna be around for a while. Um, but what we're doing in this space is precisely trying to bridge the two worlds bridging the innovation and the creativity and the community power that we have in the crypto space with its wealth, with a lot of wealth, and uh, communicate with the nonprofit world, which is usually, uh, it, you know, doesn't have enough money to do all of the work that they have to do to make the world a, literally a better place. So we're in this moment where we, we're really creating the conversations and, and developing the relationships that we have to really have so that we can have this this merging uh you know and this this moving forward of um of our crypto power into having real world impact right so uh, talking about relationships i can tell you that for example just taking that example of vitalik having given so much money into the space and and the challenges with that when we're going uh, to talk to charities uh, about the possible donations that we're giving we're finding that there is you know, a, an awkward feeling of not knowing what crypto is, right? Like, you know, how do you accumulate so much wealth so quickly? And why do you want to give it to us? There's a little bit of just discomfort in general in, in terms of the new world that we're bringing upon. So I, before I go into the details of our project, I just want to say that there's, we're really at the crossroads in a moment where there's so much space in the blockchain world to create products and, um, and, and assets and, and conversations around uh, educating. You know, your previous panelist, Lynn, was talking about education. And it's so important that we bring these uh, conversations about educating the nonprofit world into the possibilities of leveraging a lot of the money that we produce in the, in the crypto space to support uh, their humanitarian aid um, initiatives. 
So, um, okay, I'll tell you that uh, what we do in principle is that we use donations. So everybody that uh, comes to our project as an investor is taxed in every transaction. And we take a portion of that tax and we put it into a charity wallet. And we have two main projects. One is that we give monthly donations to very different causes uh, because we want to have an ample reach in social impact. So we have a, a wallet where we accumulate money that we give out every month. And then we have a wallet where we put money uh, for a cumulative fund that we want to ac accumulate um, to release in, in case of a really important natural disaster. So I guess we use donations in our world to start the conversations because uh, we don't do the donations to just leverage the marketing or the visibility of our project. We really use the donations to be able to have a dialogue with the nonprofit organizations that we're trying to reach. We are powered by community clearly because we are in the Binance Smart Chain Network um, and every project there is not necessarily or it's not often backed by institutional money. We are just a lot of people from around the world who are coming together because they have a shared vision. And as we know today, no matter what product, how good your product is that you put out in the market, um, if it doesn't have a strong community, it's probably not going to be sustainable. So something that's beautiful about the Hope Token project is that we are shared, we are coming together for not only a shared vision, but a shared value system because people who are involved in our project are often involved in their own lives and trying to make the world a better place. So uh, it's a beautiful ground actually to really uh, connect uh, with, like, uh, with human beings that are actually trying to improve the life of uh, others around them. So for Hope, I'm gonna actually show you a little bit of our tokenomics just to kind of take you just so you, you see a little bit of, of how we do this, um, I did speak about the, the taxation on the, the percentage for the tax. So we take 8% of every transaction. And from that, we, we take 5% for charity, 2% for operational costs, and 1% that we burn because we're a deflationary uh, um, token. But there's something that, you know, we, when I was talking about Vitalik crashing the price of the coin when he made this gigantic donation, we somehow figure out a smarter way to do it earlier on from the very uh, get-go of when we started our project. And um, the way that we do this is that when we donate, uh, when we make a large uh, donation, actually any number of donation, any amount, we take 20% of that amount that we've committed for the donation and we reinvest it in the HOPE uh, ecosystem. So uh, our first donation was actually a really beautiful one that we managed to raise $100,000 in less than three weeks since launch and we awarded that to save the children. And uh, so we awarded in one installment 80% of that, which is $80,000 the equivalent in crypto. And the 20% extra, we actually reinvested it in our own project um, and now we give it to the charity in installments uh, over 36 months. So basically, just these are the details to just tell you that we give large amounts, but we also take a portion and we reinvest it in our own coin to support our investors so that the price keeps going up. So it's kind of like this thing where people are making money, but they're also giving money. And I think we're trying to, with our project, really dive into that paradigm of you know, wealth of the people who have, and you can have, but you can also give and you can also support others. In our community, it's really interesting to see, uh, you know, we are a completely uh, transparent team. So this is something that is helping the charities work with us because the final minute, we're not Melissa. anonymous and um, we're not anonymous. And so we're able to actually uh, be able to be super upfront with what the project that we have uh, bringing up for ourselves. And um, and when that, that, that like, um, Sorry, the, the thing of not being anonymous is actually a really beautiful uh, doorway for the charities to talk to us. So anyways, we have so much going on in our, in our, in, in, on our website. This is like, you know, marathon of trying to get so much uh, into our conversation. But thank you for being with us. Check out our website. I think uh, we are really at a point where everybody should be talking about how to leverage the power of crypto to really support underprivileged people around the world. And we're right there. So... Thanks for your time. I know Ivan just gave me the one little, the, the one minute thing. So thank you for having us in case I'm, uh, there you go. You're back Melissa, in the Melissa, thank so you so you much. <laughs> You're getting a lot of questions actually. So make sure you stick around and answer them. Thank you so much for your time, Ivan. <laughs> thank you, Melissa. Go Bye, ahead. Jeffrey. <laughs>
go. All right, so let's welcome our next uh, speaker. Christian from Sustany, excited to have you present. Christian from the future. I, uh, we've known you for quite some time, Christian. We literally know you as the guy always years ahead. All right. What do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> There's a lot of topics to unpack. Uh, Chris, what do you think is more uh, relevant? The identity chat. I know we also had the web 3.0, but uh, yeah, what's top the, of mind the, for you? Uh, those go, go hand in hand. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll actually will be speaking again at at six a.m. tomorrow morning my time at a, a conference in in Europe, and so I literally just got done making that presentation for that. I I typically like dread it until the last moment before I put it together. <laughs> so I can walk you through that as a as an exercise. Um, uh, Chris, how about an, an introduction? Just uh, sure who you are and uh... yeah. So um, I'm of Sassani Capital. Uh, we are venture fund um, exclusively focused on decentralized software solution, a term that I use in, instead of blockchain. Most people would call it blockchain, but um, we're very technical in nature. So we like to be accurate about the terms that we're using. And so decentralized software solution in that sense also include graph based solutions and solutions that we haven't really th <clears throat> excuse me, thought about. Oh, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Um, that we haven't really thought about. It's not your microphone, it's my voice, actually. <laughs> Part of my dinner, I guess. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, the, the big picture here is that we need to kind of fix the sense of the past. So I, th I think I'm going to talk about that. But um, first, the obvious, the funny accent in my voice originated in Germany, and I was a software developer in the 80s then decided I wasn't all that good at it and went to law school and after law school joined one of the first internet service providers as their general counsel and we just got very lucky to sell that company at the height of the dot com so I promptly retired from the law it was um, over 20 years ago now and moved to California and we set up our first venture fund which was focused on voice of IP solution, multi-massive online player games, which those topics um, for most people that listen to this will probably now share a lot in common with um, blockchain based solutions. So we were one of the first allocators to the space. My partner, Carl, founded the Ethereum meetups, you know, Carl, here in Orange County six years ago. That's how we met. And so we started developing our theses on uh, investments in the space and how technology is going to change economic activity at large. Um, so we run a good size venture fund, raising our second right now, but are also very academically minded. We're, we're using the scientific method to investing. And so ever any knowledge that we're gaining in the process, we like to share with academia. We're responsible for most of Harvard's fintech program and teach at some other universities, also engage a lot of standards organization in this space. Anyway, that was probably more information than you needed right now, and you already heard it. So we can talk about more interesting topics from here. As a Christian, uh, we always talk about, or I know you have a good insight on the future of blockchain and some of these um, new technologies that we do not immediately see right now. Yeah, so um, uh, we have kind of a little bit the advantage of hindsight in a way. Um, so it's, I sold my last startup in 2008. And so the, the realization at the time that I had is that we really never ended up building the World Wide Web. And that's a statement that I've been making for over a decade. Um, because I, um, I noticed that the web is largely, descent, uh, largely centralized. And that occurred to me. Uh, because Google was stifling our growth, they didn't index all of our pages and so forth in all our startup that we ran at the time. And so I started to think about ways to actually fix those shortcomings. And uh, funny enough and kind of ironic, uh, we started discussing this back then in, in Facebook groups. So if you look back in time, then in 2008, there will be the first Facebook groups that talk about the decentralization of the web and then eventually started to write a thesis around that. But in, in very broad terms, what, what we're using right now is, is the commercial web. and. 
a lot of awareness has been built over the past couple of years. And then more importantly, we also developed a lot of the technologies that can actually mitigate against these damages. And if you look at this from like a 30,000 feet view, you can look at this from the perspective of we started out in economic activity initially, like drawing things on paper like and writing contracts on paper and exchanging these papers and then we invented things called databases in the 60s and we started recording these contracts and those and then eventually we developed the internet and then consequently the world wide web and uh, we connected those databases to these networks um, in hindsight, that was a very bad idea because you actually cannot protect databases in any significant form. And so all your data, your personal identifiable data now sits in four to 5,000 databases. And a lot of time it's being augmented with additional data. And most people by now finally know this, that Facebook will buy data from Target to then enrich that, um, their databases with that information to then provide social engineering services to their actual clients. Right? And, uh, now there's finally also laws against these behaviors, albeit they don't really go far enough. The, the point here being is that you perceive yourself as a user of the internet, but you aren't, right? Um, you should really be an endpoint of the web, which you are, but you don't get to direct your activity. So what I mean by that specifically, the second you enter one letter, into Google, you put in an A, you get a certain suggestion of results. So it's already influencing your behavior at that point in time, right? Because what you are seeing is different from what I am seeing. And it's not directed based on my hopes and wishes and what I was actually trying to accomplish. It's mostly directed towards, at the end of the day, increasing shareholder value of the company that's providing this particular solution. So, but if you think about this, um, what is this network actually for? Well, it's it's for the coordination of human beings. It's it's to better everybody's life in 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 simple terms. So my point here is that if I type into a search engine or otherwise um, a, a tool, what is the best best fill in blank, right? The best insurance for me, right? Then that result should be available to me that result should not be a bunch of advertising links and otherwise information that is looking like uh, objective data, but that's also uh, advertising at the end of the day. Because what people don't know is that you're not searching anything, right? You're running a query against Google's index in that particular case. And that, that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg of um, what the current drawbacks of this technology is. So we actually need to reverse this particular paradigm. So what do I mean by that specifically? Well, you are the director of your own net. So everybody gets their own corner of and curation of the um, World Wide Web, which was actually the, the idea that Tim Berners-Lee had when he was starting to coding HTML. He was trying to solve a particular problem at CERN, the nuclear research facility in, in Europe, for the sharing of information of researchers at that particular institute. So we well, still we have a we have one minute left until our next presentation. I know that there's a oh, lot wow. to unpack, uh, <laughs> and Christian will be back uh, at eight thirty uh, uh, or in the next. Uh, okay, yeah, I can. This. Yeah, as you know, you can wake me up on this particular topic in the middle of the night <laughs> and can talk for about three hours because they have so much pent up information that I, I thought about over the past decade. Anyway, so um, what I'm hoping to see being developed is essentially at the end of the day, cryptographic primitives that are mapped to things such as blockchain and graphs. At the point that being, you need to be in control. As in, you need to control about your agency, how do you spend your time and attention, and you need to control uh, uh, of your data. And the only way of doing this is to reverse the current paradigm to where essentially you have a kind of a, I call it the do, do not call list for all of your data, for all that you are. It's like, you, and you opt out of everything. And until you opt into a specific thing, you don't, you don't will be bothered with any advertising copy or otherwise directed. Um, Christian, that's going to be perfect. What projects uh, can we follow or even just, uh, um, just to learn more about this, the future well, of identity databases yeah. and so I, I started this effort some time ago because we uh, I got frustrated that uh, we looked at so many um, projects that use this term identity. Identity is really a different discipline altogether in technology. 
um, but they are trying to to solve the problem of agency, of data control, self-sovereign identity, things of that nature is typically assigned to that point. That being, so I started this little GitHub library where uh, we're simply providing the actual definitions that you need to actually address this topic. Like with any discipline, you need to first learn the language. And I, I listened to a, a couple of the other talks and even people who have been in, in that space for some time, they're still confusing very simple things like at the first speech, a, a speaker still used the term blockchain technology versus blockchain, like blockchain technology was uh, created 10 years before uh, the Bitcoin white paper was published, as actually mentioned in the second footnote. So if you want to learn something like look, look at these libraries, try to come, uh, like actually understand the language and, and understand the principles that are being built, because 99% of the effort that, that we're seeing is just going to the wrong direction. As in, we, we know that these approaches don't work. They're, they're color sucks, right? They're, they're more of the same. They are still username and password systems. They're, they're account-based systems. So you need to come at this from a very different mindset. Christian, we'd love to share that with the community uh, yeah. when you're back, but definitely want to hear more about yeah. that. I'll, I'll send the link, yeah. All right. Thanks, Christian. You'll be hearing Christian join... Uh, at our, on our final closing panel. So thank you. Uh, moving thank to you. our next project, we have Anthony from Innovation, Innovating Capital. Um, welcome. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me okay? Good, good. Yeah, we can hear you perfect. Great. Well, uh, thanks for having me. So uh, I know I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to jump right into it. All right. So, uh, uh, Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jeff Emanuel, and I am the founder and CEO of uh, Pastel Network. And Pastel is the world's first fully dedicated and truly decentralized NFT platform that allows users to register, store, and trade provably rare assets. The platform gives creators a way to securely connect with fans and collectors to sell unique limited edition digital assets without the high fees or storage constraints of other crypto projects. So um, just quickly on my background. So I studied math in college and I've been working in the hedge fund industry since 2008, uh, doing fundamental and quantitative investing. And I first discovered Bitcoin in 2013 and just have been hooked ever since on cryptocurrencies and decentralized systems. And I'm also a digital artist on the side, which also helped lead me to the uh, idea of pastel in the first place. So just to give you the history here, pastel first began three years ago when I saw the potential of doing rare art on the blockchain, which I first heard about from a now forgotten project called Rare Pepe that was built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain using what is called the counterparty protocol. And Rare Pepe had a lot of problems. Fees were way too high, even back in 2018. And there were lots of aspects of the systems that weren't decentralized at all. Like they didn't store the image files in the chain and they relied on a totally centralized website. And in fact, to get a new rare Pepe made, you had to send a telegram message to the founder and submit your idea. And he decided by himself which ones to allow. And so I love the idea, but I thought there's a much better way to do this. And so we started this process of designing and building a purpose-built blockchain just for this application of rare digital art, or now they're called NFTs. At the time, <laughs> we called them rare art. And so we chose to build on a rock solid technical foundation, which is the Zcash project, which is itself based on the Bitcoin code base and simply adds shield to transactions. And so then we took this code base and what we did is we transplanted the master node logic from the Dash project, which allows for individual servers to help run the network while getting compensation, but it's permissionless and anyone can create one. And so, um, and then using this system, we built this very generic and flexible system of tickets uh, for registering and trading NFTs using special coin transactions. So they actually inherit all of the uh, underlying uh, security characteristics of, of the cryptocurrency, which is based on Zcash again. And so on top of that, we added our own storage layer for storing the image files and a lot of other cool technology that I'm going to tell you about now. And so you might ask, uh, don't we already have a great NFT platform today in the form of Ethereum based projects like super rare and rareable? And my answer to that is no, it's actually a really broken system that has uh, succeeded commercially despite its numerous problems and flaws. To start with, the fees are absurdly high. It costs hundreds of dollars to mint an NFT on an Ethereum based platform, and it can even cost $40 or more just to bid on one. 
And what uh, you know this does is that it excludes artists who don't have the money to risk $400 to make an NFT that might not sell at all. And it also makes microtransactions impossible. So an artist can't make 100 copies of their NFTs and sell each copy for $2 like, you know, um, like on a Patreon because this doesn't make any sense in the context of $40 worth of gas fees just to make a bid. And you know, crypto was supposed to be this enabling of technology that would offer a more inclusive vision, you know, where people from poor countries can also benefit. And so in Pastel, not only will we have much lower fees, we've designed a mechanism so the fees will always be low, no matter what happens to the price of PSL, uh, which is our native currency token. And that, but the high fees are just one of the major problems with Ethereum. And another big one is to ask yourself, you know, what do you really own when you buy an Ethereum-based NFT? It's basically just some metadata ticket in the ledger, not the image itself. It just has a link to the image file. Sometimes that file is hosted on a cloud service such as Google, but like, what happens if someone stops paying the hosting bill? And you know, if you look historically over time, web links almost always have link rot and go bad. You know, even things from 2007, most of the time those links are dead. We still have artwork from thousands of years ago that's been preserved, but it's questionable whether some of these NFT images will still be available even 10 years from now. And, and some people might say, oh, but what about IPFS, um, interplanetary file system? The problem with IPFS is that there's no guarantee that anyone will continue to host the file. It's like having some old uh, BitTorrent file from 2008 that there's no peers anymore. And there's no built-in economic incentive to do so. Whereas in Pastel, we design a storage layer that's specifically designed for this use case of NFTs with an emphasis on simplicity, decentralization, and most importantly, extreme redundancy. And in fact, a majority of the servers that run the storage layer, which are called super nodes, like Dash's master nodes, can suddenly vanish and users will still be able to recover the image files. And most importantly, from a decentralization standpoint, anyone can run a Pastel super node without permission. You only need to own 5 million Pastel and have a moderately powerful Linux server, which you could rent in the cloud for less than $75 a month. And most importantly, the super node concept answers this crypto economics problem of IPFS. There's a clear incentive for super node operators to want to store this data reliably because they earn a portion of the mining block reward for doing so. So we don't need to rely on their generosity to continue to host the files, but on their self-interest, which is a lot more reliable. Yeah, the other final big minute. issue is, final minute, okay. So the other big issue, what does it really mean for an NFT to be rare? In all the other NFT projects besides Pastel, the rareness or authenticity of an NFT, NFT starts and ends with the digital signatures. So an NFT is genuine if it's signed by the private key of the artist, which a user could theoretically verify using the artist's social media. Uh, to check the public key. This works well because only the artist would know the private key that's required to generate a valid signature. Pastel has digital signatures. In fact, we have super advanced ones, even to, uh, one that's uh, resistant to quantum computers. But we go beyond that. We've introduced this very powerful idea of quantifying the actual rareness of the pixel patterns of the images themselves. And this works by using seven different deep learning image recognition models that have been trained by companies like Google, Facebook, and Microsoft to generate robust image fingerprints. And then we compare the fingerprints of any new candidate image to the fingerprints of all the previously registered images on the Pastel network. And then we can precisely say whether an image is a near duplicate of a previous image. And this is robust even if the original image has been transformed in all sorts of ways, like cropping, stretching, flipping, adding noise, edge detection, changing colors. The end result is that we're able to determine with a high accuracy whether a newly registered NFT is, NFT is truly rare on Pastel, that it's not similar to any previous NFTs on the system. And if it is, it receives a special designation which collectors can take into account when determining how much they're willing to pay for the NFT. Anyway, that's the basic idea of the project. Uh, you know, I, I want to thank everyone. We have a team of over 20 developers working on the back end and front end development of our platform and wallet software. And our user interface and design team have developed an incredibly user friendly and attractive interface for creating, collecting, and trading NFTs. And we're backed by a network of marketers, influencers, and reputable PR firms in the US and Asia. And we also enjoy the financial backing of key stakeholders such as Innovating Capital, which means that we don't have to rely on constant coin sales to fund development or ask our community for donations. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about our project, please go to our wiki on pastel.wiki 
And uh, please join our Telegram channel and follow us on Instagram and on YouTube. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. And I apologize for the, the name change earlier. My apologies on that. But it's really interesting yeah. to hear you know, your, your passion and you want to solve some of these issues that a lot of these platforms aren't looking at. And really, it's truly creators mm -hmm. and, and thinkers like you that, that push innovation, right? Thank you. Yeah, no, we, we, uh, we think we have the most advanced technology in the world for NFTs and the, the quantifying the rareness of the images themselves. That's something that other projects haven't even expressed as being a desirable thing to do, let alone have solved it. And it's like an open research problem too. It's not, it was, has not been easy to design this system. So we're very excited about it. Thank and, you, Jeff. Uh, you know, we, we, Thanks for having us and uh, check us out on uh, CoinGecko. PSL is the name of our, uh, or is the ticker of our coin. And uh, you can buy it on the Bitcoin.com exchange and on Uniswap. So thanks for having me again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, All right. Bye -bye. So we're moving into our final closing panel. Uh, the topic is real world blockchain. We're going to have Christian, who you heard earlier from Sustainy Capital, rejoin. Part two, <laughs> and we have Ivan Soto Wright, CEO and co-founder at MoonPay. Welcome, Ivan. You have, yeah, a, you. you have a good name, so. Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> we, we got good names. And we also have Joel from Bad Crypto. Welcome. The hey, what's happening? Entertaining Joel. <laughs> I'm here to amuse you. Just consider me your rodeo clown. <laughs> the smartest one we know. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll see if Peter can join. He was actually a speaker on one of the earlier panels, but let's see if we can bring him back. But yeah, excited. Um, we're going to be going through uh, some topics here and kind of closing out the, the event. We had, you know, we talked from DeFi, we talked about NFTs, we dove into a lot of philosophical thoughts uh, behind the industry. And even some of the, the people that are spearheading you know, kind of looking at what not a lot of the other mainstreams or platforms are looking at. So really interesting group of truly passionate people. So excited to see where this conversation goes. Joel, would love for you to kick it off. A uh, big fan of your podcast or your show. And just so how are people using crypto today, primarily? In Dogecoin. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like more people, you know, if you listen to a Mark Cuban, they're collecting more in Doge for their merchandise than, than Bitcoin or any of the other cryptos that they've used. It's really interesting to me that this silly little meme coin that's developed such a community, um, they are so adamant about this coin that they are actually putting their crypto where their mouth is. You know, Bitcoin is, is challenging to spend with the, the wild fluctuations that we're having when, when people uh, see that it can drop from 60,000 to what are we just uh, around 40 right now, maybe going to 39. Um, it's, it's not holding its short-term store value. And so I think people are more hesitant to, uh, to actually use it. And we're seeing them use some of these, uh, these lesser um, elevated coins to make their purchases. Ivan Soto, right? Would love to hear your insight and feedback to that. Yeah, so I guess I guess my take on it. So I run a company called MoonPay. We're really focused on the on and off ramp challenge. So uh, essentially connecting every single legacy payment method in the world to this new crypto economy. So I think we have a pretty unique insight in terms of how people actually use uh, cryptocurrencies because we power a lot of the wallets, uh, websites, exchanges, and protocols. So we get a sense of kind of a wide variety of these applications. Um, I think to, to Joel's point, um, I mean, Doge has been super interesting to follow uh, recently. I think it's brought uh, a ton of awareness uh, to the space and also just kind of questioning uh, some of the valuations that we've seen for some of these crypto assets in general. Um, but I think for me, I still believe Bitcoin, you know, it definitely has a thesis around store of value over the long term. Uh, I take Joel's point that, you know, you can't necessarily use it to buy coffee. Um, I think the biggest thing that we really need to solve if we want to see real world adoption is we need to really fix the network fee problem. Uh, we need to be able to scale these blockchains. And so kind of where we are now, the, the analogy I use is we're kind of like in the dial up phase, right? We're not at fiber optic. Uh, it takes time uh, for that to kind of propagate. And we're going to see new solutions, whether it be 
uh, layer two via lightning or an Ethereum layer two solutions, or even new protocols emerge that are just more performance, right? Uh, you can wrap assets like Bitcoin onto uh, other blockchains. So I think it's still super early days. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think uh, just, just the, the, you know, a meme coin can gain so much attraction in a short period of time. But I think that that's also telling of our, the times that we live in today. Uh, you know, you look at what's happened with Reddit and what happened with the, the GameStop movement that we saw a couple of months ago. Uh, I think the same kind of themes are just playing out uh, in the cryptocurrency markets today. And it's, it's crazy that one tweet uh, from Elon Musk can move the market uh, that much. I, I try to look at all this as noise and, and kind of the grander scheme of things of, you know, how do we actually solve these real problems? And, you know, the, the way that we're going to do that is upgrading the performance of these blockchains. Ivan, now that I know you're with MoonPay, you're one of the on-ramps for WaxP, right? That people can buy wax through. That's through correct, yeah. See, that's, you know, as part of the wax community, we're seeing people use wax on a regular basis on these marketplaces like Atomic Hub. You know, people, there's a lot of the brands that are coming on to wax, such as, you know, Tops and, and others that are taking fiat for the NFTs. But the reason that uh, wax really is the king of NFTs is we have more people spending wax right on those platforms and that's that's real world adoption they don't care if the price of wax is high or low they're using it exactly i mean i think i think it comes down to the communities and you know and and how we actually see real utility and how these things are used i think for me I'm, I'm far less interested in the price i'm way more interested in you know are people actually using these cryptocurrencies and i think a lot of the alternative blockchains are being used in a lot of cases because people are fed up uh, with the network fees on Bitcoin, fed up with uh, gas fees on Ethereum. We've been talking about layer two for a while. Uh, I hope we get to a solution uh, over the summer. You know, finally some uh, incredible protocols like Uniswap trying to work on you know new layer two via Optimism and, and some of the the new upgrades we're going to see. But I think in the meantime, um, you know, you're going to see better performance as some of the, some of these alternative uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchains, and, and that's what we're seeing today. Christian, I see you're sharing your screen. What is what is this graph share? <laughs> yeah, that it's uh, from another talk I'm giving. But you, you can see, like, uh, I try to always look at the big picture, right? So, so what what's real world economic activity, and how can this paradigm serve real world economic activity? And in in the real world, we have fungibles, we have non fungibles, and this is how this picture looks like right now, right? So there's a lot of people that are trying to like quote unquote tokenize real estate, which is a really terrible term. You cannot tokenize any anything that's not already digitally native that's just a fallacy that's kind of like taking uh, taking the the metaphor of I took a picture of a house and I digitize it that's just technically nonsense the larger point here though is there is a billion good use cases for this technology uh, paradigm and as much as anybody I uh, appreciate a, a good in-game item but um, I, I think it's due time that we move on to the actual real world utility and build those because the use cases are utterly apparent. Like every time I check out at uh, some store, I'm thinking, hey, I really should get this digital twin of what I'm buying here with, with all its provenance and history that this thing went through, right? And at the end of the day, I've been making this provocative statement for some time. Chances are the number of cryptocurrencies we need is somewhere between zero and one. The reason being is um, whenever you look at your digital wallet, what do you see? You see the translation of that particular digital item into your language of value. And for most people on the call, it's probably the US dollar. That's why you see a US dollar price be below your Bitcoin, your Dogecoin, your Ether, and so forth. And not that these things don't have any value, but um, value is being made out of a combination of belief and utility. And right now, it's just a ton of belief and very little utility, right? So it's, it's kind of a disproportionate um, equilibrium here that over time you will see shift to, to real world economic activity because that's at the end of the day what we are fixing. And the reason why I'm talking so fast is because there's enormous pressure to get this right and to get it right right now. And what I mean by that specifically, we had this inflection point in human history to, war, to where we either all live in complete surveillance states where every movement of yourself, of your physical self is being monitored every second of the day and all of your financial activity is monitored penny by penny or in smaller increments. And this scenario is, is possible right now. 
And so unless we provide the technologies to prevent this, we all live in a much worse version of 1984 that George Orwell had, could have never imagined. So that's why as much as I appreciate stories around Dogecoin, I, I would love for people to just take the story, but then move on to, to solve the actual problems that everybody is facing right now. We could solve a lot of that if everybody would just get off Google and Facebook and Twitter, abandon the social media and the Silicon Valley overlords that are the ones that are actually cooperating and imprisoning you. Right. Use browsers that don't track you. Use search engines that don't track you. Just say no. You know, I I quit Facebook earlier this year. I don't miss it at all. And I find that I am a much happier and at peace individual. Christian, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I agree that when we talk about tokenizing real estate, we're kind of using semantics. But one of my beliefs as far as practical applications of NFTs is that your deed your, your ownership title, as well as your car titles, your insurance policy, these will become NFTs. So when we're talking about real world application of NFTs beyond collectibles and in-game items, the big market is actually proving ownership because it's in your wallet, not because you have a piece of paper. Would you agree? That, that, yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. But you have to understand the technologies. Uh, so all of these systems are what I call key lock systems. So the point there being is, uh, to use a very, very simple metaphor, if you create a game, right? So you create your avatar and you create slots for the avatar so that this avatar can pick up the gold coin, can pick up this, the sword, can pick up any other things that you're creating within this in-game in environment. We have kind of seen the development backwards right now. There's a lot of like tokens being created, a lot of in-game items being created, but these avatars, this digital representation of self, they do not exist. And the, the simplest example I can make for this is the typical procedures everybody has been going through to actually even buy for the most part cryptocurrencies unless you earned it because you're already invalidating a very necessary prerequisite of any blockchain which I call herd immunity. As soon as you attach PII, personal identifiable data to one transaction, you invalidated the herd immunity of that particular blockchain. There's nothing immutable obviously about Bitcoin anymore. There's no censorship or resistance in Bitcoin because most of Bitcoin is setting under custody and centralized exchanges. So the point that being there's a huge list of, of blacklisted IP addresses and wallet addresses and so forth that either you can send stuff to or after you do, you will, will, will lose your other coins that are in that wallet. They are no longer accessible to you. They ban you from, from the exchange. So moving backwards though, is so the obvious, very obvious solution there is that we invalidate the legacy paradigm. The legacy paradigm is such that you have to KYC yourself at the point of time when you're opening up an account and then consequently touch fiat currency. That's actually, in my opinion, and always has been illegal and unlawful and unconstitutional. The point there being because if you're just creating an account, you actually haven't touched fiat, right? So you shouldn't actually provide your PII. So if and when and where I can provide you with a system that only attaches personal identifiable data to transactions that are actually needing to enforce these laws, i.e. you cannot buy whatever, weapons of mass destruction, you cannot send it to terrorist organizations. But at that point in time, I inject this information to the transaction, then guess what? All the account-based systems all of a sudden become un unconstitutional because you got this solution that doesn't violate um, your personal privacy doesn't violate your constitutional rights. This is entirely possible with the primitives that we have right now. But Ivan, uh, speaking of the primitives, we'd love to get your insights on this. And Christian just wanted to go around and anytime, you know. Yeah, just doing after from all this, like I think, you know, I, I can't remember who this quote is described to, but the next big thing looks like a toy, right? And I think where we are, it's easy to, you know, basically. Uh, right off what's going on with Dogecoin, right off what's going on with NFTs right now and look at all this meme stuff and think that none of that stuff is actually important. But I actually think it is because this is where developers are experimenting. Uh, we're at the very early phases. I think eventually that will translate 
you know, downstream to the things that Krishna is talking about. I mean, there's, there's incredible applications using Providence, using this technology for real estate and all these other great applications in the future. But I think we have to perfect it and in games and in game items and assets, like this is an area of, of great experimentation. So I think it's an opportunity for us to test these blockchains, test limitations, uh, break the system like we did with CryptoKitties and Ethereum. Uh, you know, these blockchains have proven at least today that they cannot scale. Uh, for these real world adoption use cases. So I actually think it makes sense that we should be playing around in these kind of early applications inside of games before uh, we take it into kind of more uh, real world use cases. And then I think as well, I think the other thing to bear in mind is, uh, you know, you have uh, existing regulations, uh, which make it, uh, you know, obviously there's obviously a friction uh, associated with that when you're dealing with securities, for example, um, you know, you need to work, you know, there, there's laws and, and regulations in different parts of the world around how that actually needs to take place. And so, um, you know, I think that's why it's better to kind of experience. Yeah. So, uh, Ivan, this is one of the largest misunderstandings in the space, and it's it's mostly due to the fault of the um, lawyers and legal professionals um, that our startups involved. I've seen hundreds, literally hundreds of projects destroyed because of this type of mentality. The point there being, if the technology is actually implemented correctly, you do not have that exposure to regulation. You shouldn't, because think about it, the, this technology should never be uh, exposed to a particular jurisdiction. Right, it's by nature global. It's it's like the World Wide Web. So if and when and where you implement the technology in the way that you're actually creating a peer-to-peer -peer transaction where the token is a digital bearer instrument on a public blockchain, the the purveyor of that particular technology has no exposure because you don't have custody over the assets, nor do you have custody over personal identifiable data. This is the only accurate way to implement the technology. Any other way where you have exposure to regulation, you're not implementing the technology in the correct way. You're, you're part of the new middleman. Not that these functions are needed, but ju just keep in mind, if you don't attach this correctly to a public network, you will be circumvented around. We call this the, the least cost routing system because you're the new friction. You're the, the remaining friction that people have to work around, right? Because the default method today, at least in advanced and modern societies, is simply that of private commerce, right? You could do most of the transaction that you're doing with your digital money, obviously with cash, it's just a matter of practicality and no one could prevent it, no one would ask for your passport and no one gets to attach PII to this particular transaction. So the, it is important to realize that this is the, the scenario you need to create in a technical way in order to be viable in the future. All other models will be invalidated. What we're doing is we're actually keeping two lists. We're keeping one list of projects that are either not there where we need them to be, or and we're keeping a kill list. We're literally keeping a list of companies and implementing the technologies in the wrong way, where they still where they are um, creating the new middleman, where they're still creating username, account, password systems in some shape or form, invalidating the herd immunity of the network, and there will be executed they, they will be removed from these networks right? they, they have no reason to exist it's the aol right yeah, i would take a different view in some ways i mean i think I, I totally see some of the benefits around anonymous transactions and being able to do things peer to peer but the reality is if you're trying to bring a mainstream audience uh, unless you want this technology banned as it has been in certain countries no you you don't ban technologies again th this is like a confusion of different semantic layers you you, you can well, prevent just, people from doing I things guess it really depends. if you want to for example if i want to have a token that represents a security i'm going to have to follow securities laws if i want a token to represent stock in coinbase or stock in facebook or tesla i'm going to be subject to securities laws and then as part of that you know, my job is to make that experience as simple as possible for the user. And in those cases, unfortunately, there is there is laws that are existing. You're going to have to provide personal identifiable information. You are going to have to follow the regulatory framework of those different geographies. And then, then you have issues around anti-money laundering. Uh, you know, I think you have to implement KYC in some cases. Um, so I don't I don't think it's uh, kind of a black and white rule. Um, you know, I, I, I see I see how you I, I see the advantages of a peer to peer system that can be anonymous, but if you want to bring mainstream adoption, I think you have to follow the rules and, and the different jurisdictions in which you operate. I mean, that's that's how we have a business today. Well, it's interesting yeah, because people yeah. will 
people will move to different jurisdictions and right. and depending on where where they want to fall and enjoy i think this is right. perfect for well you because- we 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 see yeah i just moved to puerto rico so uh so there's <laughs> that you know following the laws that right. exist here to uh legally um not pay capital gains taxes and pay less on my, my business taxes uh, but you know it, it is true that when we see the more regulation we have the more it seems to discourage innovation and i think christian you know you live the, this idea that you have is it's kind of utopian that hey if we could uh ha- people could be free to develop and the technology can propagate without regulation then amazing things can happen but that's not the reality that we live in no you you actually can right now and you even could during the ico phases implement the the technology there is a relatively easy ways to actually avoid that so because it's it's mostly a misunderstanding of of regulation and not being able to discern between the letter of the law and the objective of the law so kyc is is just one of those whitewashing terms inside of the regulation that is aml again uh, the, the financial service providers is obligated to prevent money laundering, right? They're not interested in your personal name. They're not interested in your birthday and so forth, right? The, the, that doesn't interest them at all. So if and when and where there's actually solutions where they don't take custody of the data, where they just hand over the data through another mechanism that doesn't actually involve them, where they don't need to know you, that's the way it should be. And that's the, clearly the way it will be. And we're already seeing these solutions being developed. So there's a massive amount of work being done right now. And and I totally agree, obviously, with Ivan, we, we need these on and off ramps, but you need to develop these on and off ramps in a way that works towards decentralization. And there's lots of missteps in, in between where you become the target, right? Where you well, it think- seems to be going the other way, right? That's what's happening. The more crypto finds mainstream adoption with exchanges and other financial institutions, the more we're having to do this KYC, the more regulations that we're seeing. How do you go the other way when it seems that in order for people to feel secure, they want yeah. people no. want to be governed? No, it's happening right now and it's happening from a different angle. So uh, right now, as you guys know, there, there's this huge effort underway to create something like health passes and biometric solutions. And so the, the, the point here being, uh, so we're involved in, in multiple developments on that front because if and when and where your personal identifiable data, your biometrics, your your DNA, your health data is is compromised, you can't roll that back, right? One, once there's a digital copy of that, you can't roll that back. So the only way to implement this from the get-go is entirely secure. Entirely secure means a cryptographic primitive under owner control that is mapped most likely to a graph that's uh, if in, uh, it's incidentally uh, validated against the blockchain-based solutions, which are actually digital vending machines living on top of this de- decentralized infrastructure. It's the point here being is that most people do not understand what is the, the tip- topology that's being built right now. They're kind of on this middle layer layer, don't understand the top layer and, 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 and uh, the end points of the network. The end points of the networks uh, are you always have been you, right? And the point being is you need to have control over all of these elements. And this is being done right now. So I, I can't na- na- name the, uh, the the companies that are um, involved in these pilots right now, but they simply have to implement them by law. So uh, imagine that once you have one passport, one passport that's using your biometrics, your real world life ID uh, set that is already attached attached to a government validation system. I'm specifically not using the term databases. How many other IDs do you need? How many other IDs will you want to use? The answer is none, right? And these are systems that are being implemented right now that span the globe, that span 156 countries. It is out of necessity, right? It's not a question of if and when and where and and, uh, what government will uh, apply these. It's out of necessity because there is no other way to secure this data. You can't plunge them back into the databases and start associating that with the collection of all your data that's sitting out there. I'm keeping a list of four to 5,000 data brokers. I want to see all of them die, literally, because they have been manipulating all of us for decades right now, right? Because what they're selling is not your data. What they're selling is social engineering as a service solution. That's what they have been selling for a decade. 
And it's a human rights violation. It's atrocious. It's the reason why we are in the space. We want to see. Christian, we love your we love your passion. I just so you know, we have five minutes left on that. And maybe yeah, sorry, John, I, I didn't mean to, to manipulate, <laughs> no. like monopolize. I should say. But, but, this particular really about, but, but I think you're bringing up super valid points in general, right? I think it's just a, the, the thing is it's a super complex problem. Right. I don't think it's like a, there, it's it, especially when it comes to owning your data. I'm all for that. Right. I think it's it's a very scary thing when you're basically sacrificing your data to a third party. You don't know their security systems. You don't know if they could get compromised. And then your data is at risk as a result of that. Uh, everyone has been pwned uh, today and we still haven't gotten to what that kind of global standard is for your biometrics and your data. And yeah, it would be an absolute disaster if there was a way that that became compromised because we're trusting all of these other endpoints that were not secure. I, I totally take on board all of that. I just think, you know, there, there is a reality of, of kind of where we are today uh, and, and bringing more mainstream people into crypto. Um, you know, I think there's going to be a, a whole variety of solutions to kind of getting there. Um, and, and we're not, we, we don't have a perfect solution uh, to this problem yet. But I think, you know, all of your Christian, points, Christian would say he does, though. <laughs> I, I don't no no we I mean to be clear I mean we, we are translator between the world we, we just have the benefit of seeing hundreds of projects every year and um, we we started writing a thesis around the decentralization of the web in in 2008 so for for, for us it, it's like a lot of work that that went into this over over a decade so we we've already tested a lot of the approaches so, so we we use the scientific method to investing meaning we we look at every startup as an experiment. Right? And so we take note of that particular experiment. So we classify all identity projects based on what they're actually doing. We're classifying every currency of what it's actually doing. And, and we don't try to use these broad labels like something is a security token, something is a utility token, because that's all nonsense. At the end of the day, these are all individuals quote unquote smart contracts, which are not smart at all. And they're all based on open soft, uh, open stack software. So they're all also evolving. So the this whole paradigm of trying to force these uh, round packs through these square holes, that's utterly misguided, right? And as I said, I was an engineer before I became a lawyer. Now I'm, I'm neither. But what I'm really passionate about is simply to seeing the World Wide Web being um, developed for the first time, because that's what I saw when I first joined AOL, like in 94 or something. Uh, I saw that idea of combining all the brains that we have together and actually solving human problems at scale, right? And we still haven't done that. And, and that's just wrong, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, we are, we are this insignificant uh, piece of the world, right? As we haven't made it like 5% of the time that the dinosaurs been around. The larger point here being is, Everybody right now is rowing with, with, with force towards Niagara Falls, like in terms of the technologies that we are developing. Uh, instead of clearly seeing here, this is the, the direction we need to evolve to. We need to A, realize we are all in this together, like we, we are this insignificant life form on, on this tiny speck that we're all sharing together. There's there's no reason to, to fight each other on anything. We all need the exact same things at the end of the day. And my point here being is the internet is for me the, the largest common denominator to actually make this happen because it connects us all. But as long as we're using it to be divisive and to, to, to create incitement, we're using it for the exact wrong purpose in my mind, right? We, we should you're, be using it. You're absolutely it right. For, for they, good, for good they pit us wrong. against each other. Uh, exactly. Christian, I think we, we had you bet on bad crypto. Yes. Uh, we, we, a few talked years ago. Yeah. we talked about DAOs. We talked about DAOs. We talked about DAOs three years I'm ago. Gonna, yes. uh, email us. I want you to come back on because I want to go deeper on this topic. Right. And DAOs let's have, is still the most important topic that most people don't talk about much, right? Well, we did that already. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, I, guys, I, I, I summarize, Christian. I mean, obviously, uh, the internet did not really become, it was not censorship resistant. This technology does have the ability to become censorship resistant. And it just sounds like you want it to move in that direction uh, and, and, and make sure that we're taking advantage of the applications and, and the protocols and the technologies uh, to make sure that we, we sustain that direction versus some of the other activity that's happening. Because I guess we don't want to repeat 100% of everything that's happened on the internet. I think, it, is that kind of broadly? 
I guess. Yeah, here, it, here. it starts out with understanding the topology, right? So the big picture, what's the big picture that we need to work towards to, right? Because there's enormous amount of urgency. And I see lots of projects on a daily basis that go down the same rabbit holes that we already saw other projects go down. So uh, my point is not like to talk down to anybody at all. It's very much the opposite. I don't want to re have anybody repeat the same thing. And I've been there myself, right? As I, I, I ran projects before, because you get tunnel vision, right? Because you don't get to see the big picture. You don't get to see the other the mistakes that others made. And that, that was part of the idea of creating a World Wide Web. That was Tim Berners-Lee's idea of we're, we're create, connecting these people at CERN so they don't duplicate each other's efforts and they know what the other people are doing and can build on top of that, right? That, that That's what we all built on, right? So we didn't invent language, we didn't invent HTML, we're all building on the same thing. But at some point in time, we just let certain entities and interests take take over the World Wide Web specifically, because right now, the majority of the World Wide Web is optimized to increase shareholder value for a small portion of companies, which makes no sense in any world, right? And it doesn't even make sense for the people that work at these companies at the end of the day. Christian, you say that's a lot of truth there. And I think we definitely could do a follow up and unpack that. And Joel, you, I can see you already want to <laughs> get that, get that, some of those, capture some of those thoughts. But I do want to have, you know, uh, Ivan and Joel, I want to hear some closing thoughts. And I know we kind of went on a, on a tangent, but I do want to bring it back. Like, where, where, where do we see, you know, the real world actual application, you know, now and in the future, right? Uh, my mind is is already blown with you know what Christian's talking about because I I see the vision for it. I'm just wondering how possible it is to get there when you have forces that are much bigger than those who want to advance this, right? Because there are forces in the world, there are powerful people that want nothing more than can, than to control the population and even have population control literally right they they do pit us against each other and so you know you're fighting the culture which is running downstream so this becomes an uphill battle and uh, to to have people step i mean i christian i know you're chomping at the bit to to say something about that because i don't know how you fight that kind of power to achieve the this utopian goal that you're going for it, it's much either easier than you would think Oh, okay. Well, we just solved the problem. There you go. <laughs> I even feel, Christian, it, it's fighting human psychology, actually, and this power. And it's just, and I, you know, I, I, I want to no. live in this utopian uh, future. And I, how, how are you going to wake up billions of people all of a sudden <laughs> when every message that's being thrown at them is, yeah. is in opposition to what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah. Uh, it's actually relatively easy because you fight fire with fire. So to make a very simple example, if I filter your filter based on your own criteria, if I give you an easy tool that that removes all the ad copy, so to speak, from your search result, that, that removes all the hate from, from your YouTube result, and I keep doing that, right? Let, let's call it a Google plugin, uh, uh, a browser plugin. So a browser plugin that just optimizes for what you have in mind. I want to be happier, healthier, more accomplished, more successful. And then you start with simple things. You, you start with one particular beach chat. You, you give it to people who are psychologists. And but that doesn't sell, Christian. No, no, it's not sells. about selling it. It's, it's about... But, but, it, but the, it is for the powers no. that be. It is for Google. No, 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 no. You will simply notice that you all of a sudden you're better than your, your, your coworker. You all of a sudden are being more resourceful. You all of a sudden are in a better mood. You, you will be simply more productive because the, the point being is of a lot of these algorithms to simplify that. And you know, this probably much better than me. We've been both in the same like ad tech space at some point in time in the past, right? A lot of these algorithms are optimized for time on site. Right. So they're, they're not optimized for the result. So if I give you the perfect result while you move on, right, you don't sp uh, spend your time like going down a particular rabbit hole you didn't want to down and go down to. You don't watch the next YouTube video that actually polarizes you more. So if if your objective is to to then actually get better, guess what? It, it's literally 
uh, evolution in progress. You build evolution into this, you, you get better. It's a survival of the fittest. All of a sudden you, you're seeing that, well, I'm getting better. I'm getting better results in my search. I'm, I'm getting better results in my health. I'm, I'm getting actually what I was looking for by, by not even changing something, right? And this can actually spread much more than the opposite. As in, hey, I'll give you this little tool. It's this little Chrome plugin and it saves you X, Y, Z. Kind of what Brave was trying to do. They, they kind of went on a, on a sideways there because I introduced this. Christian, I, love, I need to interject here, but right. you, know, you I, can, know. I know you, Christian, can talk I, about this forever. I, I, so. I, I, hey, we're, we're the last session. Why do we have to stop? This is good. <laughs> I yeah, stayed he, up this late, damn it. I, I, but but yeah. here, so, here's the thing. I'm going to interrupt you, Ivan, sure. because... <laughs> People, human nature is right. uh, uh, is this weird paradox that people, yes, they say they want more of these positive things, but they feed on the conflict. They feed on the negative. It's why people watch the sh you know these shows that are controversial. It's why they go back to Facebook yeah. again because they are they like being in yeah. that segment that's pitted against this other group. That it, it feeds their soul in a in a weird dark way. And so if you're give it's like giving people a drug. It's bad for yeah. them, but they keep coming back for more. So they think they want it because yeah. they think it makes them feel better, but it doesn't. It destroys. Yeah, uh, uh, it's a fine line to walk. It's social. I call it social engineering for good, right? And um, I, I don't know if you have kids, but you you can incentivize kids with, with a stick or, or or with a reward, right? So it's it's the same mechanism at the end of the day. The stick sometimes work better, works better, but but long term, if you instill passion in a person, right, he he she will will go forever. Right. That's why uh, if you look at the most useful tools that we develop, things like Wikipedia, they have one common thing um, that uh, it's rooted in psychology in common, which is um, like sharing the things that you already know, that, that you're already passionate about and so forth. Right? But that's been so corrupted, too. Wik Wikipedia it, it, has been it, absolutely destroyed. C correct be because it hasn't been implemented correctly Th that's exactly the point y you want to implement it in in the same way that we're implementing the the kind of bad incentives right now where it's inadvertently encouraging you to do the quote unquote right thing um i can't think of the term right now there's a, a psychology term for it uh, it's, it's cognitive surplus um or related to cognitive surplus is exactly what i'm doing right now by the way it's like i'm super passionate about seeing this technology move into the right direction and solve everybody's problem that's why i talk so loud with such urgency and so often about it because i just have thought about it for such a long time that that i see certain directions that can work right and any everybody in the world has that Every, every everybody in the world is passionate about something, right? I I don't think that that people are generally passionate about being outraged. I, I think there's passion in any person in the world about a particular po um, topic that's positive, and that could be gardening, that that could be cooking, whatever it is. If you incentivize that, it, I don't know. Cancel culture seems to thrive on being yes. outraged, and it get, it gives sure. these people a uh, a sense of purpose that they feel that it, they, they appear as though they're fighting some invisible yeah. evil, but they're yes. really not. C correct. And so I have to simplify this massively because we're already over time, but um, all language can be um, at, the, at the root pulled down to math, right? What, what I mean by that is there, there's really only one science that's physics, there's really only one language is math. You can reduce everything to math. So if, if you know anything about natural language pro, uh, programming, for example, so the, the, the point there being is, um, it doesn't matter if you believe in gravity, right? You will always f fall flat on your face if you don't. So if and when and where you actually provide the information in a factual manner, if, if you're finding the right result, for example, to like cure you from a, a certain disease, then you're the one that's cured, right? Versus the, the, the person that, that's believing and praying your cancer away or something else, that particular gene pool doesn't get to survive. I'm being kind of crass right now, but the, the point there being is we can do this mathematically today already you you can prove obviously two plus two is is four and on top of that you can prove well there's gravity and we can measure that and we have proven this and so forth you can do this with information 
you, you can do this with information that you're sharing. And from there, you as the individual, you as the cohort, you will simply be more, be more successful, right? So should you see this correlation in, in societies where there's this dissonance between belief and education, right? And all uh, societies that still have these strong beliefs and in, in, in kind of these ancient uh, uh, storytelling things, they're typically worse off. They're, they're typically also less uh, economic successful and, and so forth. So we just have to uh, start implementing the right incentive mechanisms in the sharing tools that, that everybody gets access to the right information rather than what we're doing right now. And, and it, the, the, so the solution has been obvious all along, right? It's, it's simply implementing the scientific method into information exchange. So that with that one person that died of drinking whatever bleach to cure their COVID, that the next person please doesn't do that, right? So that you can, cannot put stupid things in, into your search engine to, to get your wrong ideas proven, right? You can, the, the belief that the world is flat is actually increasing. Think about that. That, that, that's absurd. So we can measure these things. We can measure all of these things and we can drive them down. And that should be the objective. That should be the call to action, right? And that's how we should measure and hold these companies responsible. So one last thing and then I shut up is uh, if we just measure the externalities that we are creating by this type of information distribution and hold these um, the, the originator and the, the people that are putting a, meta, a megaphone to this information responsible for the externalities, at that point in time, the externalities will stop. Uh, we have caught evidence for that already. It's, it's the typical case. You, you have um, uh, the, the right to say anything that you want, unless you're in a crowded room, you sh shout fire and people get trampled, right? So we decided that. The thing is, the only thing that we don't hold these companies responsible for what they're doing right now, as in causing these externalities of, of behavior that we clearly know is wrong, right? So you clearly shouldn't be drinking bleach, as one example, to cure yourself from COVID. So the reason that we don't hold them responsible is that no one is developing the, the, the evidence tools to actually follow down the line. Oh, this happened because this person put out this information, then this particular cohort inflated this information and they created this particular silo. By the way, that's the only reason why you will hold on to these beliefs, right? You put yourself into this data, data silo. Like, and if you can provide the evidence, guess what? then at that point in time, we can hold people that facilitate this type of behavior responsible and they should be held responsible, right? We should hold people responsible for the clear damages that we can measure. We are not measuring them right now. Create these measuring tools. That's the call to action. Create measuring tools that here, these companies are selling my data and fight fire with fire. If, if people are offering data brokerage solutions, do the opposite. Christian, I... I love that. And I love you've it. been listening to the Christian Kamir, Kamir show brought I'm to sorry. you by Red Bull. So. <laughs> Christian, it's, it's, it's funny because uh, I'm, I'm wondering, even in like uh, the history of hu humanity, like are there any examples of, and I, I kind of have one I, I'm thinking in mind of this like trial and error nonstop and just feeling oh. up these best practices. And in my yeah. mind, like, like feng shui, like yeah. that's kind of an example of human evolution, trial and error, and they build up this best practice. It has uh, been happening for 350,000 years. And unfortunately, it's, it's overmatching. So it's it's a typical example of I'm in Neanderthal, I'm walking through the prairie, here's some rattling in the bushes, right? So, uh, and now I'm thinking, okay, that might be a saber tooth, I run away. So I run away, I get to survive. The next Neanderthal is walking along, he's rattling in the bush, thinks, oh, it's probably a bunny rabbit. Oh, guess what? I don't run away. It's a saber tooth, I get eaten. So long story short is, that's the, the kind of um, uh, lizard brain activity that these things are optimized for. And so it all goes back to, to this part of human evolution. So that's where all belief stems from. So once you reverse this paradigm, one, once you actually put out a thesis and then try to disprove the thesis, it's about disproving the thesis, not, not proving. That's, that, that's, that's the wrong idea. So, if and when and where we start educating people again, it's like, hey, you need to put out a thesis, be willing to be disproven. Guess what? You you actually get to learn. You're going to get better and better off. And programmers know this intuitively, right? Programmers do this already. 
So if they actually implement this into every single system, so you just get a little bit better, just like you're playing a game. That's why I love the space and what's happening right now. But I look at this as really this multi huge multi massive online player game, the whole crypto space, which I don't make it mean this derogative. I think this should have happened before we ever created these kind of um, economic systems because they, they are clearly not working right. They're clearly failing. They all started out with good intentions and they all ended up being kind of this diversion of some some form of Ponzi scheme at the end of the day. That's why all fiat currencies at the end of the day fail, right? Because they're all a perpetuation of some form of Ponzi scheme rather than measuring value in the world. But one, I think the one, moral of the story is, is if you're walking through the prairie and you hear rustling in the brush, you run. No, you, you have a thesis and then you look back and prove the thesis. Right? I, I'm, I'm testing your German sense of humor, Christian. <laughs> I don't have one. I used to be German, remember? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Yeah. So, sorry, sorry Ivan. The... Ivan sitting there. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think I was like, good. okay, shut up. All right. See, I want to go home. Flying along, just listening to this entire take. I mean, obviously, there's so many different ways, and the philosophical implications of crypto are massive. There's so many things that uh, can happen as a result of this technology. I mean, for me, I guess I'm, I'm always thinking, I guess, really real world every single day when I'm waking up uh, around kind of the problem that I'm trying to solve. Uh, is you know getting more people into crypto period right and i think the only way uh to a large extent if you're trying to bring mainstream you know what we say at MoonPay is we want to bring a billion people into the space by 2030 which we think is a realistic goal you know you have three and a half billion people with uh mobile you know access to to mobile phones today um you know i think the 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 problems you're going to be able to solve that i guess are fascinating to me is just around global money movement and the analogy that i use is you know, we had uh, telecoms, right? Telecoms, you had all these different uh, disparate systems that didn't communicate with one another, crazy to make long distance phone calls. Like this call that we're having today, you know, it would be crazy expensive or not even feasible to have happened, you know, uh, a decade ago. You know, we had Skype, that was that first kind of application that enabled it to take make it the stream. And then we've seen Zoom and we've seen tons of innovation and we don't even think about uh, voice over IP as kind of this technology anymore. And for most people, they don't have to think about the philosophical implications of what voice over IP did to the world, right? Uh, they just, it works, right? And they're able to go on their lives and they take advantage of this great technology advancement. And I, I have that kind of same view uh, with financial services and crypto. Um, essentially, we have all of these banking systems around the world that uh, these legacy systems that are really disadvantaging everyone, right? It's almost like implicit tax on every single transaction, whether it's domestic, whether you're using Visa, MasterCard, American Express, any of these existing payment methods, whether you're moving money internationally from cross-border one country to another, uh, there's crazy percentage-based fees, which isn't fair for anyone, right? And it doesn't make any sense. We're just moving data around, right? And we should be able to move that data around securely uh, over the blockchain. And so my thesis is eventually crypto transaction costs 10 to zero, and my role right now is, okay, we're going to need to connect every single payment method, give it the very best conversion shop that we possibly can, because some banks don't like crypto. So there's a whole science. My, my whole job is this optimization function of trying to route all the different components to get people into crypto and then vice versa, get them out. And, you know, for a lot of people, you know, it'd be great if they could stay just in crypto, but in some cases they need to feed their family. They need to cash out their crypto into their local currency and be able to spend on their goods and services. And so, you know, for me, that that is kind of step one. And I feel like we haven't even fixed it. We haven't gotten step one right, which is, you know, very simple, easy access to crypto uh, from the existing legacy financial system. Obviously, there are going to be frictions along the way. You have certain governments that are going to want to impose uh, certain rules. Unfortunately, we, we want to be around for the long term. We think in the long term, bringing more people into crypto is a good thing. Uh, so we play by the rules so we can, can, can obviously stay and operate. And it's unfortunate when certain countries want to censor this technology or, you know, China doesn't want to have financial service providers or payment service providers, even foreign ones. Uh, you know, operate in their country. So unfortunately, you know, that's just the world we live in. We just try to, you know, work with the the, the reality that we have and, and try to bring uh, more people in the crypto economy because we think in the long term, uh, you know, it's a better system. It's not a perfect system, you know, but it's a, it's a better system than the one we have today. So that's, that's what I, I would close on. You threw me a lot of softballs. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you could, you could take away all the arguments. <laughs> 
Well, well, I, 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 I wrote some of the deregulation papers for the European, for some of the laws for the deregulation of the European telecommunication markets. We bought one of the first laws of IP companies. So, yeah, the, I, can, uh, I, I hear a lot of what you're saying, and I've been thinking about the, the same lines for, uh, uh, for a long time. That's why I talk about least cost routing, right? So, you need to, the, the, at the end of the day, we will least cost route around anybody who's still kind of being a friction within the system because yeah that, like the, this old metaphor of money or ip that should already exist for for like a decade right and everything comes down to conversion right and and bringing people into this new system and so for me i'm just trying to take like the real real world example of how do we actually make this happen within the constraints that we have right now uh but yes i do agree you know there, there is some potential uh for you know the the legacy system to be disrupted uh, by this technology and all, but you know, we could go for hours talking about all, all of the, the different implications there. And right now it's a uh, nice 12, 20 AM over in Miami. I'm sure it's late for you. Uh, so I'm going to uh, probably head to bed. So I just want to say thank you to, to crowd for putting this together. Christian would love to have an off the record chat. Same with Joel, uh, but uh, no, great meeting you guys. And, and thanks for putting this together. Yeah. Likewise. Best way to close out the, the day, everyone. Ivan, Joel. All right, guys. Joel, we talk. Email me. Sounds good. Christian and Ivan, I'd like to talk to you both. Send uh, badcryptopodcast at gmail.com. Send me a message. Awesome, awesome podcast name, Bad Crypto. I love it. Thanks. Appreciate <laughs> nice. that. All right. Have a Bye good night, guys. everybody. Good right. day, everyone. See ya. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. That wraps up our crypto and, and blockchain conference tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll definitely be sharing the recorded video. Thank you all for staying. <laughs> Jimmy says, uh, where's the happy hour? Happy hour starts tomorrow. It's pretty late for many of the attendees, but really we dove into a lot of philosophical thinking and, and thoughts. And um, I want to thank all the speakers, all the attendees for joining and making it a great event. We'll definitely stay tuned. We'll be hosting another one in about three months, September time. So if you have any speakers or anybody you want to bring on to the uh, next conference, let us know. You can follow us at our Telegram, uh, CrowdCrate, or our Twitter, um, and we'll share that in a follow-up email as well, as well. But thank you so much, everyone, for staying the entire time with us. It was really, really insightful, and uh, thank you so much. All right. Bye, everybody.